Uh, my name is Michael Imperiali. I'm co-chair of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Committee on Assessing and Navigating Biosecurity Concerns and Benefits of Artificial Intelligence Use in the Life Sciences. Along with my co-chair, Linda Stewart, I'd like to welcome you to our first in-person information gathering meeting and our seventh committee meeting. The task being undertaken by this committee is to understand the convergence of AI and life sciences an emerging area of research and development with promising benefits and applications, but also security implications. This committee will consider the ways in which AI-enabled biological design tools and biological data sets for training AI can increase and mitigate biosecurity risks, specifically on concerns of transmissible biological threats that could pose significant epidemic and pandemic scale consequences. You can read the full statement of task for this study, as well as a list of the members of the study committee at the website nationalacademies.org. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few notes about today's meeting. This open session is open to the public and on the record and is being recorded. This is an information gathering session. That is, the committee is in the process of assembling information that it will examine and discuss in the course of making its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Therefore, I ask everyone here today to be extremely mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions and that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave here thinking otherwise. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the academies. In addition, committee members typically ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. The committee will deliberate thoroughly before writing its draft report. Moreover, once the draft report is written, it must go through a rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee, and the committee then must respond to this review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the Academy's Report Review Committee and the National Academy of Sciences President before it is considered an official Academy's report. Okay, so with that in mind, we're gonna um, start our first session, which is on um, AI um, and bioconvergence. And so um, the format of this session is that we've allocated 30 minutes for each speaker. We've asked each speaker to give about a 10 minute um, overview of um, their topic, and we'll follow that up with um, 20 minutes of questions from the committee. And so we'll just um, then go through um, each of the five speakers. And uh, it's going to be really important that, that we keep on time for, for each speaker. So um, our first speaker today is going to be uh, John Jumper from Google DeepMind. John. Thank you so much. And it's an honor to be here. Let me uh, share my slides. And I saw I was the, uh, the first speaker, so I thought I would begin by talking really about um, what's been happening in, in deep learning and protein biology. What are some of the discoveries driving this? Um, some idea, I think, of where what this might mean or how it's going to uh, evolve for protein design, especially. Um, and happy to get into maybe more of the more direct biosecurity possible implications. Um, as we, you know, into in the discussion, but I'll, I think I'll start by trying to maybe, you know, level set on what the capabilities are, what they're becoming. So, when we talk about really biology, and I think as we as we think about this in a in an understanding in a biological discovery context, it's becoming increasingly clear that biology needs AI to accomplish its goals. And as we think about things like um, how we address disease, how we understand the cell. And it, I think it needs it in a, in a somewhat unique way among the sciences, or at least biology itself is extraordinarily broad. It's extraordinarily complex with what might be considered from an engineering point of view, accidental complexity, that these are evolved systems. And because they're evolved systems, we have uh, lots of, um, we have lots of components that have overlapping and kind of similar methods of action, but they're all somewhat distinct. There's a lot of duplication in biology. There's a lot of random elements. And but the study of biology itself 
is extremely complex to study even one system, that you can make entire careers on the function and the mechanism of one protein. And so you get this enormously valuable information uh, that's created an enormous effort by the community for individual pathways, for individual proteins. And what we're really looking to in AI is to generalize this, that if you've studied instance A and B and C, well, can you tell me about instance D and instance E without having to do the same painstaking work in the lab? And because it's kind of a broad subject, this generalization tends to work really well with the types of AI systems that we have today. And the example that I've spent uh, enormous amounts of time on is this question of protein structure. Proteins are, and I apologize for people in the audience for whom this is, this is uh, readily available knowledge, proteins are genetically encoded um, peptides. They are made of building blocks assembled within the cell that fold into a particular 3D shape. That 3D shape gives us a lot of information about their function, is really important for the interpretation of experiments, and is extraordinarily hard to measure. So measuring a protein structure requires a series of laborious steps. If you want to think of it in more direct terms, it re often requires a year or more of a PhD student's time to get a single structure. In economic terms, estimates of around $100,000 are typical for the cost of one protein structure. And yet it's extremely valuable to biology. And in fact, about 200,000 structures are known and publicly available and deposited in the protein data bank. But this doesn't cover how much we want to know structure to understand even the human proteome, where only a quarter of it has been studied, or the set of all, say, organisms for which we know the protein sequence, of which billions of protein sequences have been determined, and yet we only have 200,000 structures. So we've got this enormous gap. And what we want to do is relatively simple in computational terms. We want to take what is on the left, this is a protein sequence where each letter is one of those uh, genetically encoded amino acids. So this can be quite readily obtained um, from genome sequencing. And we want some type of computational function that will tell us about the protein structure. And on the right, you can see this was a prediction that we made blind. We did not know. Green is the experimental structure, but we did not know that at the time we made the prediction. And blue is our predicted structure. So we have developed and really made essential use of deep learning in order to get some really, really valuable piece of information, in this case, the 3D protein structure on the right. And we're able to produce it from something much easier to obtain the protein sequence on the left. And we've done this through deep learning and really a lot of really hard work into how do we take AI and how do we adapt the ideas of AI systems and how do we build new ideas in order to teach it about biology, in order to be able to learn this from the 200,000 structures that are available. And a big distinction that we have is that you know, when you think about some of the other successes of deep learning, for example, large language models or chatbots, we're looking at being able to learn from internet scale data, really, really enormous data. But when we talk about uh, more specific biological predictions like protein structure predictions, um, we really have to learn from this extremely difficult to obtain experimental data, which has been made available in the protein data bank. And to do that, we have to use new types of machine learning ideas and basically try to use cleverness in machine learning to make up for the limits in data. And in the case of protein structure prediction and the system that we've built that we call AlphaFold, we've been successful in doing so. And I think the ideas have been really influential in the field. And both, I guess both the ideas and the success, the ideas in that these are some of the ideas that you may need in order to understand proteins with deep learning. And we've pushed that forward. And the second is really, this is possible. It's possible to have transformative impacts on scientific problems, do things that we couldn't do before, not, or at least let's say we can do them many, many orders of magnitude cheaper and take something from a year's time to 10 minutes or five minutes. Um, and this has been really important. In fact, in the deep learning and the kind of deep learning research has been essential. One uh, external lab estimated that the ideas in our system AlphaFold 2, if that's trained on only 1% of the PDB is as accurate as our earlier system AlphaFold 1 trained on the entire PDB, the, the data set of proteins. So 
we can say that the deep learning ideas were the effect of maybe a hundred times more data for this. Now, the second thing that uh, has really been important is that we can that we need to control, you know, when deep learning models know and don't know, or we need to understand that. And um, what we found is that actually these models are able to predict their own accuracy. So we have what we would call confidence, which is really a prediction of how much error you would get if you had gone and experimentally determined the structure. We do this with two measures, one called PLDDT and the other called PAE, which predicts slightly different measures of error. But what we find is that these work really, really robustly well. So we're able to make predictions and we're able to express that we think it's you know, this prediction has a 70% chance of being true and seven out of 10 times uh, it will be true, for example, not exactly how the metrics work, but very similar. So we have these calibrated confidences that people use to interpret this. And in fact, we're extending this methodology. The first one was the study of proteins, but of course, proteins are machines in the body that do lots of stuff. You know, they're used to read our DNA. They're used to perform chemical reactions. They interact with drugs and other small molecules. There are many, many functions of proteins. And so we've started, we've extended this methodology in what we call our AlphaFold3 system out to predicting all these new interactions. And we've had success. This has been more challenging because the data are more limited for protein interactions with other cellular components. But we've really made quite a lot of progress there as well. Uh, we've made this work available within both as a peer-reviewed publication and available in server form currently, and then we're gonna have a commitment to release a model for academic use. And this has been really, really helpful. We've had enormous uptake in the community and understanding a great many biological systems uh, using these tools. But really, I think, and, and more directly to the, the, the point of this meeting, you know, what has this meant and what will this mean for protein design? And we can start with something, you know, very, very direct, that AlphaFold, the piece of software, has been influential in protein design to a surprising degree in that our ability to predict the structure of proteins or predict how proteins come together and interact has been very, very helpful in people designing proteins who perform the in silico experiment of saying, well, I've designed these two proteins to come together. Now, does AlphaFold also predict that this sequence will stick or this protein from this sequence will stick to this other protein. And uh, some of the early measurements have found that using AlphaFold as a filtering step is about 10 times more effective at predicting which proteins will bind uh, than the previous kind of physically inspired filters that had been done before. Uh, you can see uh, one of the figures from their paper on the right, and this has been very influential in the community. But I think the bigger impacts have been indirect showing that the deep learning ideas and taking some of the maybe direct ideas and innovations from AlphaFold can be really effective. And it should be said that AlphaFold, other than this application to trying to improve success rates with some degree of filtering, but really AlphaFold isn't a design tool directly. It's really though that this has inspired design work and some really great work. I think uh, David Baker, for example, is talking later in this session has done some really, his lab has done some really incredible work. And the ideas appear transferable, that ideas that are a good idea for prediction are probably have some influence on what are the good ideas for protein design. But there are additional challenges. In fact, many other challenges from solubility to immunogenicity to others that are really outside of this paradigm and have to be solved in other ways. But I think what it, we're really gonna see is that as we get better at more and more, say, prediction tasks and structure and other fields, that that will be a leading indicator that you can kind of expect design successes um, to come. You know, people are starting to say, well, if we can predict how small molecules bind to proteins, can we design for it? In fact, there's been some really great work on that recently. Does that mean that we can get out to designing enzymes? I think this will all be a leading indicator and you can start to look at the predictive successes as telling you what will come in the design successes in a year or two or three. And I think that's probably going to have relatively strong implications when we think about how are we going to predict what are going to be the design capabilities? How are we going to think about the security implications of those? So I'm starting to think that we should think in this lens um, as we interpret it. And with that, I'll briefly you know, thank, I, I'm here representing the work of a large team, but I think in the discussion happened to get 
have, happy to get more into how do I think these will intersect and where I think this is going. But I wanted to keep it short. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. Um, so we'll open it up for questions now. Marta? Hi, um, this is Amarda, a member of the committee. Uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, very informative. Um, my my question relates to, is connected to some of the statements you made that um, there are remaining challenges, clever machine learning ideas have addressed some of these challenges, um, say primarily uh, data. So I wonder if I could in some way uh, challenge you to to think out loud with us to the extent that you can you can talk about those things, even if confined within PSP structure prediction, or you can broaden it if you want to implications for design. What would you think could be accomplished with these clever or cleverer uh, deep learning ideas, say in the near future? What do you think you could, this is what I think we can do in the next five years. This is what I think then we can do in the next 10 years. And then the flip side of that coin, is there something that you think you cannot do because it's completely outside of the paradigm of, of computation as a paradigm? Thank you. So it's a great question. I think some of the things that I expect we will be able to do, or if you look at kind of where there's been enormous success, first of all, is things like design for binding. And this started as designed to make one protein bind to another protein. I think that the success in structure prediction, also the recent work on Rosetta Fold All Atom, which uh, and some other work suggests in a similar direction that some of the other, say, binding problems, how do we get proteins to stick to small molecules, to DNA, to RNA, which has been a harder structure prediction problem, but it's not impossible. I think all of these will get a lot better. So I think we'll get... I think design for binding will go very, very well is my expectation. Maybe, maybe, and I think this is uncertain, maybe this implies that things like design for enzymes will start to get better. Um, I think that where one thing that is an unknown challenge and probably something good for uh, to ask uh, additional speakers is whether we will get good at making multi-state machines. For example, we have nothing you know, of the complexity of many of these multi-state machines, you think about, you know, like all the functionality of even say the, the COVID spike as a, as a relevant biosecurity example, we're not nearly designing things that complex at the moment, the kind of delicate balance of energies will be very difficult. I think though, the maybe larger point, if you think about this as kind of one fundamental function that we'll, we'll get and we'll get reasonably good. First of all, I don't see it as being zero shot. I think we'll still iterate through a lot of experiments. There's still a lot of laborious work. So it's not just the machine spits out something that immediately works. But I think the second point is that we don't, there's a lot of other functions that you may want or that, and especially relevant from a biosecurity context, you know, we're not designing entire um, kind of, we're not, we're not, I think it will be hard to predict, you know, things like, what do I want to say, you know, more complex or organismal features like, a, you know, there's been discussion of, if you're designing something viral, I think prediction of something like pathogenicity will be extraordinarily difficult. And I don't see that. I see these more complex, like, I think one of the things that has really benefited the alpha fold story is we're near the atoms. We're near something very, very causal. And as you get out to larger and more complex functions, I think that will be extraordinarily complex. I don't see us predicting, say, the effects of mutations on um, kind of whole organism behavior. And this really came up during the COVID pandemic of, you know, how do you predict that D, I think it was D614G or one of these mutations will have this effect ultimately on transmissibility. I think those will stay extraordinarily difficult to predict for a long time because they're very, very complex. We have very little data. We actually have, in a certain sense, you can think of PDB as 200,000 structures or tens of millions of protein residues. There's actually quite a lot of data in there. And for a lot of other problems, we have maybe thousands of numbers or hundreds of numbers. And I think it will stay hard to predict. And if it stays hard to predict, I think it will stay hard to design for the most part. I don't know about some of these inter intermediate problems like, say, immunogenicity or others. Maybe we can learn to predict those and ultimately learn to design. But it, to me, it's kind of 
these rich and maybe near physical properties like structure, binding, et cetera, I expect to get a lot better. These whole organism or like what's the effect on a person? How might that change with mutation? I think those will stay extraordinarily. I don't have a way to solve them. And I think they could be difficult even in the five or 10 year range. I just want to remind members of the committee, if you want to get in the queue to ask a question, please flip your card up on its side. Gigi. Hi, thank you for your talk. This, this is Gigi Gronfall from Hopkins and member of the committee. Um, I have a question about, or questions about skills. Um, what kinds of, uh, for your intended user, what kind of skills do they need? Um, maybe you could describe what your intended user is. And then to develop the next versions of, of AlphaFold, what kind of skills are, are needed? So in terms of skills, and especially with the AlphaFold server, but even before that, really, I think the skills that we're aiming at are or the skills that I believe you would need is certainly from a running point of view is, is very simple, right? We have an interface in which you put in protein sequences or other sequences and you receive back structures. So the actual act of running is, is quite easy. The, the questions are really, or the skill we expect is really structural biology, molecular biology. What do you do with these data? Uh, an untrained individual doesn't know what to do with a protein structure, can't tell you, you know, all right, I, I know a fair amount about protein structure, but even I can't, I, even I may not recognize the implications of this particular prediction. And someone will say, oh, well, this, this particular part goes in this groove and that explains this bit of molecular biology data. And now I want to do that experiment. So I think the user skills are really, you know, a sophisticated understanding of how we go from protein structure to biological hypothesis um, as being kind of, a not extremely rare skill, right? We teach it uh, in in college and graduate coursework, but I think that's that's essential is how you derive information from it. The skills for developing this are quite different, and the kind of the background of uh, many people on the team has been coming from often a computer science or physics with a deep machine learning understanding, and then learning enough about proteins in order to kind of build the right systems. But the skills have been much more mathematical and machine learning and iteration driven and computational and much, much less experts in terms of how do you interpret this? So that's, that's it's really actually quite a disjoint set of skills. So can I, I just wanna ask a follow-up before I give it to Patrick. Um, that first skill, you know, the ability to take that structure and kind of figure out what's the implications. At, at what point can AI do that? So I think there's two versions, or there's there's a general and there's a specific version of that same skill. So the specific version is um, sometimes you have a property that you want to predict. Uh, you know, will this mutation have an effect? Um, and maybe you could, if you have a data set, then you might find an alpha fold structure as a useful additional input to training an AI system in order to predict the effects of mutation, right? So this structure is a good proxy for the experimental structure. If the experimental structure would have been useful for this predictor, the alpha fold structure is probably also useful for this predictor. That still requires a data set. It's still kind of an auxiliary, an accuracy improvement to a model you could probably train anyway. The more general skill, I think, is hard for a couple of reasons. So there's, you would have to think even what is the input? So there's one of, well, I can't probably, for example, humans can't take a list of protein coordinates as numbers as, oh, this atom is at position 43.27 angstroms, comma, comma, whatever. So you normally humans even consume this structure by operating a molecular viewer like PyMol, or you see images in papers that are carefully uh, carefully designed, what actually are really images from a software like PyMol or VMD or Chimera in order to interpret uh, currently, models are not very good at this. Um, you know, I've I've tried a couple, and they they are not very good at this. It, they may get 
okay at this, but even that is interpreting images carefully chosen to show exactly what you want to show with a lot of skill. So it zooms in and it shows only the four residues that they need to make their point. So I think, I don't know how long, because it's difficult to predict the success of LLMs, but I think that they would need to be operating computer systems and then know what they're looking for at kind of the level of a trained biologist, of which there's very little kind of written training data for this online. So I think it's I, you know, very hard to bet against the progress of LLMs, but I think we're at least a little ways away from, uh, from those kinds of capabilities. So I think the output of this, okay, so you could train a specialty LLM in order to receive these as an additional modality, and that, that could be useful, but none of the general purpose systems do it. So you would have to go do it. And even then, I think the training would be difficult. So all of this together, I would say, I don't think Think, I think that the structure interpretation will still be human for some time. You know, obviously, if LLMs get exponentially better in the next, it's hard to say what the capabilities of LLMs are in five years. But at the moment, I don't think it's that useful to take the alpha fold structure and put it in. If anything, you'd probably have to interact and it would say, well, go look and see if they're close. And then the human would go look. So I think it would at least have to be a cooperation. But anyway, I'm, I'm guessing a little bit, but that's my. My current view is they're not very useful at interpreting structures at all, or at least images of structures. Patrick and then Jens. Uh, hi, John. This is uh, uh, Patrick Boyle from from Ginkgo Bioworks. Uh, just a question around you. You alluded to this a bit, talking about the advancements between AlphaFold two and three. Um, but for example, some of the challenges you highlighted for for future tools like enzyme design. Do you think the uh, kind of advances to enable improved enzyme design um, are going to come largely from collecting new data sets or from architecture advances? And you know, how do you um, uh, how do you kind of compare the pace of change in, in model architectures to the pace of collection of data, and especially data that can be helpful in terms of model design? It's a good question. I don't. It's a hard question. We don't know. There's we. You know, people are still at a very kind of incipient level in, say, enzyme design. Um, and I think that collection of data sets will require kind of very large, very diverse data sets that are very difficult to do for gen general enzyme functions. So I think it will be difficult, you know, for specific functions maybe, but it'll be difficult to collect our way out of this uh, in general. I think that. Um, at the same time, pace of model architecture. Model architecture is worth, you should think of it as worth a multiplier on data. It makes your data a bit bigger. If you do really well, maybe it makes your data two orders of magnitude bigger. And even that may not be enough. So I think it's it's very hard to say. I think we'll need a new set of design ideas. It won't come purely from deep learning. Thank you. Jens? Hi, uh, Jens Kuhn from Nyad. Uh, I have a naive question probably. Um, so. If we look at um, uh, virus discovery uh, in just nucleotide sequence space, there's this whole big dark matter thing where we don't find any um, any homologs or anything. And AlphaFold has been great to find structures for those things, and then suddenly we we see what they really are. Is there a percentage of, or do you have a feeling for how many um, protein sequencing AlphaFold is completely failing at predicting? Is there or is there something where it's just completely craps out and says like, well, I don't know what it is, make something up. Um, and, and and can you fool AlphaFold by creating sequences, by putting things together that will rip it up? So I think uh, two quick, uh, two, I guess there's there's two or three points to make. One is that AlphaFold is, AlphaFold is quite good at generalizing if related protein sequences are known. So the, the kind of, um, intuition we have is maybe 30 to 100 related protein sequences uh, is enough to off typically get a very good prediction. So um, what we uh, what we find and what we kind of say is that if you have a, a newly discovered family that has no related sequences, you'll probably do badly. If you have a, a family that has no related structures, but many related sequences you'll probably do really well. And so that depends really on the collection and the particular family uh, for viruses. Viruses can be complex because of very fast evolution. Uh, some proteins are very difficult. But the um, 
what was the second point that I wanted to make? The other thing that we find is that proteins that strongly interact with other proteins, where most of the contacts or interactions are with other non, uh, non-homomeric proteins, are much harder to predict unless you put them in with the interacting partner. And it's really, you need to give it enough biological context, which you don't always know. But I don't see a really strong, if you meet this kind of sequence threshold, I don't see any really strong obstacles uh, to these predictions. It seems to generalize well um, because proteins kind of, it's it's local. Proteins look similar. A histidine is a histidine. Thank you. Can I just ask if, if you graph accuracy over sort of time, is that like exponential? Is it linear? What, how's that working? Uh, what we're actually, find, I mean, what we found is that alpha fold two to alpha fold three had for most categories, a small improvement in protein accuracy. It had a, a large improvement actually in antibodies, which are proteins uh, binding. That was a surprise. But for the most part, the accuracy, accuracy improvements have been small in proteins. And the big change has been we can do, we have a wider domain, not that we're that much more accurate in questions you could already ask. You can add more modulators. You can talk about the effects of you can ask questions you couldn't even ask in alpha fold two, but I would say the pace of improvement in protein structure prediction has been far from exponential. It's relatively saturated, I think, in single chain. We're seeing improvements in protein protein interaction, but I, I wouldn't say any of this has been absolutely exponential, certainly from two to three, and that's with a lot of hard work. Great, thank you. Gigi, you get the last question. Thank you. So how does this translate to the ability to predict something that is completely novel, that is that is not um, something that, that you have lots of data for? What do you mean by, in what dimension is it completely novel is the question. Um, why don't I just kick back to you? What do you, what, how does that mean to you? <laughs> so something that is not completely novel is if you, if you as like, if you have many sequences of a protein that has never been studied before, we know nothing about it, maybe it even has a novel fold relative to all other proteins, that's fine. That's not really novel. If you have a protein that has some very, very unusual features to it, so there's, for example, this snowflea antifreeze protein is one of my favorite examples. It's a protein that um, helps snow fleas that bind polar bears uh, break up ice so they don't freeze before they bite the polar bear. That has a very, very unusual core for the protein biologists in the room. It has no buried hydrophobic area. That's a difficult protein for alpha fold because it's such an unusual physics of how the protein works. So that kind of novelty is not really an issue within the domain of alpha fold protein structure prediction. The um, novel in terms of function or there's no real data, in a certain sense, alpha fold is gonna do well in something you could imagine being a part of its training set, except it wasn't, right? So if you, yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole range of protein structures are coming from different organisms within the protein data bank. A new structure from a new organism isn't a surprising member of the PDB. Um, something totally engineered may be very surprising. And so engineering, I, the success on engineered proteins has been probably good because of the way that protein engineering algorithms are designed to learn from the same PDB data. So they're kind of in distribution but something really odd or having a really, really weird type of structure in terms of exact of like the local interactions, I think would be much, much harder to predict. And then I think the other part is really we predict structure, which is an aspect of proteins, but we don't predict, you know, lots of important functional information. So we can't tell you, you know, is, is this a successful enzyme, you know, or what is its catalytic rate? That's, that's not even a question you can ask the system and so it's unclear how much information we would have toward it. So really novel kind of questions. You also can't answer novel in the sense of there, you couldn't answer them from the protein data bank either. Great. Thank you, John. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next speaker now. And that's gonna be Eric Horvitz from Microsoft who's also joining us virtually. Well, thanks, it's an honor to be here. I have a few slides to share and I'm gonna to try to see if it, it all works nicely here. Can folks see my slides? Yes. Oh, great, fabulous. 
I'd like to to start by uh, first reflecting about recent progress in AI that, uh, you know, we're clearly at an inflection point with AI methods. We've been riding on top of a fast wave of innovation with, with deep neural uh, models uh, for 15 years or so now. Uh, the wave has included reaching parity on a number of, of challenging benchmarks in visual and, and language tasks. Um, but, you know, but now I think we're, we're, we're getting to the point of being at an inflection upon an inflection. With It's another burst of velocity. I see this uh, um, as coming with qualitative and quantitative capabilities with generative AI that show what I view as unexpected powers of generation, synthesis and composition. Um, these methods are now being applied to advances in the sciences. Um, the possibilities for leveraging AI across the sciences to meet global challenges was, was the focus of a report from the AI working group that I serve on uh, with the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. This is the PCAST. Just relate, this report was just released this past spring. Uh, I'd like to refer to the audience to that report on directions uh, in the biosciences as well. So even though we're still in the early days of seeing AI leverage to help scientists with modeling and reasoning, um, there's work going on at applying these models at multiple spatial and temporal scales. Exciting work going on at, you know, at inference and generation ranging from atoms to compounds and gene expression and protein interactions to cellular networks and from cells uh, to human physiology and individuals to populations. So there's promise with developing a constellation of neural models to use in larger pipelines that can help with core aspects of, of discovery. And these pipelines are being used in the biosciences as well as material science and other areas in chemistry. Um, and they typically employ combinations of neural network models um, with sets of other methods, including classical machine learning, decision theoretic inference, uh, traditional high performance computing. Uh, and, and methods are showing promise for for helping researchers to generate and identify candidate solutions, uh, to um, accelerate and enhance um, scientific models and simulations, analyzing te new types of data. Uh, a particularly exciting area that we haven't seen a lot of work in just yet is bridging the in silico with the natural to actually guide experimentation in the wet lab uh, with computations of value of information in the open world. And perhaps most importantly, to elucidate mechanisms and to provide uh, new insights. Um, particularly, it's a it's an exciting time for we just heard from, from John health and life sciences, um, where these AI models have been quite extraordinary. Even if we're still in the early days, um, we're seeing models that predict expert level diagnosis, predict the structure of proteins from sequences, protein interactions, which moves from structure to function. And they're also providing um, design tools for building proteins, new kinds of vaccines and therapies, uh, such as uh, blocking binding regions of viruses. So I see us making um, a significant progress um, in this space over the next decade. Um, and I, and I like to say, like, like I always put up like some, some, some grand challenges on the horizon, uh, custom tailored cancer therapies, disrupting uh, neurodegenerative diseases, blocking autoimmunity, prolonging vibrancy of rejuvenating cells, building a virtual cell model. The, these kinds of directions are not that far off given what we're seeing now in, in possibilities. Now it's great to be sandwiched between several superstars including John and, uh, Dupper and David Baker who've led impressive advances in understanding structure and function uh, with specialized pipelines you know, really impressive uh, real world implications. Like I love the work at DeepMind, like understanding the basis for clinical manifestations of mutations as shown on the left here, like the basis for Wolfram syndrome uh, in the structure of the protein Wolfram in it. You know, and, and the, of course, the, there's an exciting long-term dream to understand, uh, you know, the whole uh, interactome, human interactome of eukaryotic pot podiums, how, wh what, what proteins interact with what, with what proteins and, uh, recent work coming out of the University of Washington lab, for example, that was very exciting um, uh, to see um, uh, new interactions being predicted by uh, uh, modified versions of Rosetta Fold uh, to look at uh, interactions, including identifying functions, uh, interactions that have this 
point at the dark matter, this unknown, it's unknown what, what these interactions do right now. So the idea of having these methods pull science along in interesting new ways is, is uh, very intriguing. And of course, particular excitement now and relevance to this meeting on biosecurity with the generative AI methods that can be designed proteins that fold to specific structures and function. Uh, these design tools such as those uh, pictured here developed by a team under Ava Amini and Kevin Yang at Microsoft Research. They employ methods not so distant to those used in image generation tools like DALI. Um, I don't know that David will call out the work at IPD at UW University of Washington with generative models, using them for protein design, uh, including designing synthetic vaccines for COVID and a, a protein that binds to the receptor of the, uh, um, the receptor domain of the COVID virus. Now, in directions move moving forward beyond um, uh, special neural power tools, specialized pipelines that we're seeing, there's the possibility of building larger foundation models in biology and other areas like material science to achieve uh, valuable, more general uh, compositional and, and generative powers akin to those seen in large language models like uh, GPT-4. Now, um, to date, um, the general language models are not particularly set up to help with scientific discovery. Uh, and, and, and this is because scientific discovery is, is different uh, from many AI applications and brings unique challenges. Um, so language is very flexible, but scientific discovery needs to be rigorous and follow physical laws in many cases. Um, the physical world, especially the microscopic world can be precisely described by differential equations such as Schrodinger's equations, which have to be solved numerically and can't really be solved by a language model. Um, the search space for scientific discovery, uh, such, such as the configuration of atoms in new materials is vast and people know very little about them, uh, very little data in the scientific literature for, for novel compounds, for example, if you're in material science. And while one could have you know, adequate training data for like GPT-4 or Claude based on the public web, scientific data is usually very sparse it's expensive uh, and it's proprietary. You know, for example, generative models in material sciences and their biology could benefit from deeper knowledge about the constraints and interactions defined by the complex interactions uh, in the electron shells of molecules. Um, and it, it, it's um, the best understandings we have of electron locations and interactions and substances comes via Schrodinger's equations, which dictates the probabilistic distribution of positions of electrons, but solving these equations, are exp it's exponential in the number of electrons, which makes its, di its direct use untenable as a tool for searching through massive numbers of possibilities uh, in generative applications. However, as a direction uh, that we're pursuing and other teams as well, um, approximate methods have been developed that are more efficient, um, but they're still challenging and recent AI models have been built to serve what I would say, what I would call uh, Schrodinger simulators of sorts. They're trained via more complex classic computations on samples uh, and, and then um, come to, to approximate uh, uh, the, the, what, what Schrodinger's occasions would tell us. And once they're built, they can be used to make predictions thousands of times faster than base level computations. Now these neural approximation models are, are more powerful when they take into consideration um, going from like just what we've seen language models, laws of physics, foundational principles of invariance and equivariance. Uh, that's very, uh, very, very important in, in some of the work that John's talking about in, in the pipelines we have today. We can use these models in end-to-end -end discovery, scientific discovery pipelines and workflows. And scientific communities are just learning now um, how, how, to, how to use these kinds of, of um, uh, workflows and pipelines in areas like material science. But more generally, there's excitement about building something akin to the large language models, uh, the large science foundation models that are more general models that can be used for multiple tasks within and across scientific disciplines. Uh, the goal is to build scientific foundation models and to press them into service to help with the synthesis um, uh, in various ways and generation, as well as elucidating new, new scientific insights. So different architectures are being explored for this. Uh, some uh, are holistic models trained from multiple forms of data all at once. 
Uh, others are are built um, with separate models that are woven together with what are called adapters of various kinds. And there's still a debate about the best way to go about constructing large scientific foundation models. Now there's the possibility of building rich multimodal neural foundation models that bring together genomic, transcriptomic, proteomic, and phenotypic information. Um, and the models that are being talked about are kind of a promising approach to developing tools that might one day deliver what I've been referred to as ultra personalized medicine that take the aspirations of precision medicine to the next level. As an early glimmer of the possibilities with such multimodal models, um, I'll point out the cross organization project named Gigapath, uh, just published a couple of months ago in Nature, that centered on the training of a multimodal model with over 150,000 pathology slides linked with genomic and cancer staging information. And the model showed how scale can boost performance on doing subtyping and mutation prediction when analyzing new pathology slides. So once you build this model, it'll take a new slide and not just get uh, you know, diagnostic information, but cancer subtyping and mutation prediction from these models. And I've been, been in multiple meetings where there's been actual discussions of, can we build a virtual cell someday, leveraging multimodal data and AI to build a virtual prokaryotic or eukaryotic cell that would serve as a test bed uh, for developing and testing new therapies in silico and get, taking us further in cellular biology. But I wanted to just pause here, uh, given all the excitement, and just talk a little bit about the other topic which is coming up at this meeting and I think motivates this meeting, which is biosecurity. And with all the power, we have to consider the challenge of dual use, that the new powers coming via these advances uh, can be harnessed by malevolent actors or lead to unintentional biosecurity risks. AI certainly, AI methods certainly are lowering um, the bar on creating toxic proteins uh, and virulent novel pathogens, and the threats are going to grow over time with powers of these methods. Um, at Microsoft these days, for AI more generally and AI models that we're fielding, um, we've gone from this concept of red teaming in cybersecurity to AI red teaming uh, for our models to uncover and characterize weaknesses with the safety and reliability of AI systems and to develop mitigations in advance of them coming going public or generally becoming generally available. Um, we've been standing up intense efforts uh, in what I would call AI biosecurity red teaming processes, asking the question about how do you uncover and characterize potential vulnerabilities with AI enabled uh, um, biosecurity challenges. Um, now, one example that's promising for a teaming uh, that we've been looking at is DNA synthesis screening. You know, DNA synthesis is the choke point where digital designs become physical. Uh, and nucleic acid, you know, acid synthesis screening has been aimed at protecting against accidental and intentional generation of harmful proteins. Um, in the uh, president's executive order um, last October on safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of AI, um, the OSTP, the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy, was tasked with establishing a fast-track action subcommittee to develop a framework for nucleic acid synthesis. And just uh, a few months ago, the, the, the response from OSTP was a policy, um, a federal funding uh, a requirement for for for, for group teams um, uh, receiving federal funds uh, that they basically when they do DNA synthesis um, they they um, they must uh, employ companies that are certified that, that are following certain criteria including retaining all screening records for at least three years um, and now screening synth uh, synthetic nucleic acids um, over each two hundred nucleotide window for all what are called sequences of concern. But by October 13th, 2026, as a deadline, the screening window is to be decreased to 50 nucleotides. It's unclear um, how AI resilient these methods will be. I'm using the term AI resilient to basically saying, are these systems, be, will they be able to detect um, uh, designs uh, um, of pathogens and designs for toxic proteins that um, that 
move beyond uh, na native protein uh, or, or, or MSA uh, known protein homologs. Um, so our view is that ongoing study is going to be going to be needed um, on protein synthesis screening, uh, sorry, DNA, DNA synthesis screening, um, as well as developing mitigations where necessary. Um, on top of that, we're going to need more sensitive biosurveillance, fast response capabilities, given these advances. Uh, two directions that come to mind are harnessing AI tools and methods and novel signals, um, metagenomic signals, for example, to enable more advanced biosurveillance and response. And thinking through what it means to have a faster detection and response program via new initiatives, uh, Linda Stewart and I were talking about, for example, what it would take and it, would it be valuable to have a standing biosecurity response reserve that teams set up across the world to understand how to quickly detect, map, and respond to potential uh, observed threats. So in summary, there's great excitement with advances of uses of AI in the biosciences and other areas like material science. We have some very exciting work in that space. We're in the early days, given the possibilities ahead. Uh, I believe strong investment will be needed in the core methods and applications, including the specialized models and pipelines that we saw this morning uh, at, You know that, that led to uh, AlphaFold 2 and 3 and to RosettaFold, but also more general science foundation models. We'll be seeing more of that kind of work going on and the power of composition and generation coming directly from these larger models, including methods for fine tuning them uh, to specific tasks. We also need to keep an eye on the potential misuse of these new powers. I believe we have to be con have continuing processes for red teaming with dedicated teams. An ongoing development of technical and policy mitigations is needed uh, on the concern front. So I'll stop there. We can maybe have some discussion about anything that I've uh, Anything that comes to mind from my conversation, my my my, my com comments uh, so far. So our next speaker then is going to be um, Jana Bromberg from Emory. Oh, Sean's going next. Oh, sorry, you okay? <laughs> yeah, from Emory University. Sorry. No pressure. Paul. Do I need to do it? Are, are we good to go or is the mic on? Okay, great. Um, no pressure. Uh, following these two visionaries in the field, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about all the things that the previous speakers had talked about. And uh, that comes from... How do I switch slides? Let's look. <laughs> okay, excellent. That comes uh, from my history um, in the field. So I'm a bioinformatician by training, probably uh, among the first crop of bioinformaticians that we've had as a world. <laughs> um, I started training in uh, the lab of Dr. Borchard Rost at Columbia University. And Borchard is known for using neural networks in annotating proteins. So he was interested or is interested in protein structure and function. And believe it or not, when I was doing my PhD, I had to prove that using neural networks is actually more informative than, let's say, support vector machines. Right? So people would argue that this is not a really great idea. Uh, but you know, since then, things have changed. Uh, this is sort of uh, the, the metro map of the things that we do at the Bromberg Lab now. So I started out with variant impact prediction and we now do metagenome function annotation, protein structure and function coevolution, and protein function prediction. In, in all of these spaces, machine learning has become a, a really important piece of the work that we do so that we can explore things that are not really accessible directly from experimental work. And remember, experimental work is also an assessment of what's going on in biology in real life, rather than being an exact replicate of what is actually happening. So, 
uh, AI is predicting or machine learning is predicting things that are happening in biology, but so is experimental work. And that's something that, uh, uh, that was taboo to talk about because experiments was the gold standard. Uh, but, but now I can actually say that we are making discovery using machine learning that is not immediately accessible experimentally as well. So um, first things first, uh, the first time I even considered the fact that some of the things that we do may be relevant to biosecurity is when I got this email. Uh, I'm not telling you who I got the email from, but uh, it was a very nice email to get. Basically, the person liked the paper. And the reason they liked the paper is because the paper was... Um, it's not changing slides. Oh, there we go. The paper was critical in helping us determine the current limits of computational tools for introducing substitutions without breaking function, which in turn was vital for planning our new approach of screening DNA synthesis for potential bioweapons. Right? So I've never thought about this before. Here I was looking at variant mutation, uh, at variant impact, mutation impact. Um, and this person said, okay, well, we can use the tools that are available for evaluating variant impact in order to uh, find bioweapons, right? Um, the paper that this is referring to is actually talking about uh, these positions in proteins, which are rheostatic positions, which allow for mutations to do this kind of ladder in terms of how much impact and function they have. So if you think about your um, heating in your house, you don't turn it on or off, you, you actually set a temperature. And the same things happens with uh, biological protein activity, right? So in certain positions, if you introduce a mutation, you can reduce functionality or increase functionality without breaking functionality completely. And so we differentiated between toggle variants and rheostat variants, and we asked how well do protein annotating tools that we had at that time, this is in 2017, do in identifying variant impact in these positions. And what we found is that actually uh, everybody was really good. All the tools that were available were really good at finding these toggle uh, mutations that are on and off, but were really not that great in identifying these rheostat or modulation of function mutations. And this is important because if we stick to the proteins that we actually know, and we want to modulate the activity rather than turning it on and off as we do in case of treatments, but also in case of looking for more toxicity, this is something that the tools of that time were not able to do, right? So we can do the on and off, but we can't do the modulation. So uh, the question then arose recently, this is a 2017 paper again, uh, and this is too far, all right. Um, the question then arose whether the new tools uh, the tools that we currently have, whether with supervised deep learning or the unsupervised deep learning, do better in making these predictions. And I think the take-home message from this particular image uh, is that if you look at the left-hand side where it says classic, these are these tools that we had in 2017, actually even earlier than 2017. And the things on the right of it, supervised deep learning and unsupervised deep learning, this is the performance measure of these methods that we currently have. And there is really not much of a difference in terms of how well the methods can annotate variant impact, right? So the, the takeaway message here is that uh, deep learning models are not better than classical prediction models. And the classical prediction models are not wonderful. So we can get to about 80% uh, performance, right? So we can annotate variants that have an impact, but we're not really good at it. So to me, that was kind of saying, okay, we're not going to take that route in order to look for means of evaluating uh, new, possibly toxic, possibly deleterious proteins, right? So we're not going to try to do that. Um, this was uh, an interesting observation because the next thing that, that happened uh, was this idea that we can actually build a protein anew. And uh, from this... Um, earlier presentations of John and, and Eric, it's it's really, it seems like we can build a protein anew, but we need to have a family. We need to have a history, evolutionary history of this protein. And uh, it, it's interesting. There is people who are trying to do it without the family, right? And uh, directly from sequence. So basically what that looks like is these protein language models where you take a sequence, you feed it to a transformer and you hope that it, you get 
uh, a structure out. Now, another way of thinking about it and how a lot of uh, folks that do biosynthesis uh, think about is, you know, I want this function, this activity. I don't know what sequence give me this activity, but I want to, to create a protein structure with that activity. That's interesting, but from my perspective, not very interesting. What I want to know is how do you go from sequence to function directly, right? So structure is a vehicle. This is a way of getting the activity that you want, but we want the activity. So that's the idea. So a lot of the stuff that we do was built around that. So the first thing you do as a, as a good scientist is you evaluate the field. And so we asked, what do the tools that currently exist do in terms of predicting function? Now, this is definitely not to scale, so don't quote me on the scale of this, but this is a good way to think about protein function. There is known function and unknown function, so known function in the light blue, unknown function in the red. Um, so whatever proteins exist, whether we've seen them or not, carry out functionality. Uh, we have known proteins, and again, this is not to scale, the known proteins in the circle in the middle. Of these known proteins, some section is annotated proteins and their families and their homologs, right? Um, but these proteins that we know, we don't know function for all of them, right? So basically there is a bunch of proteins that we've sequenced, usually from microbiomes, right? From community of microbes living in all of kinds of conditions, particularly in extremophilic conditions, this would be uh, an interesting place to look for new functions. We don't know anything about those functions. So how can we evaluate whether these methods that we have to predict the function from sequence actually can predict function that they've never seen before? It is an exceedingly difficult task. How do you know what you don't know? And so uh, the idea for us had been, okay, well, we can't really predict this, but over the years uh, that we've been doing bioinformatics, we figured out how to look at proteins that have the same function. So. We don't know what function it is, but it's the same function, right? These two proteins. So that's an easier question to answer. And so we asked this question. So these proteins have, we, we extracted orphan proteins, proteins that don't have functional annotations, that don't have families in the, the current space, currently annotated space. We asked how do these proteins interact between themselves and found these siblings. So proteins that have the same function but nothing in the databases that we currently have. And we asked, how well do these methods that we currently have predict this function? And this is the result. Never mind the um, metrics, but the, the y-axis is the evaluation of how well uh, they do. And uh, the, the top blue line is what is the best that we can get if we actually knew the functionality, right? And the bottom black line is random. And if you look at the performance of existing methods, including many of the deep fry, deep go, all of these deep learning methods that are available right now, they're not doing really well. So all of these methods are performing really great for things that we know, but they're not doing really good for things that we don't actually know. And this was a, a factor in us making a decision that we're going to make models to make pr predictions for the functionality that we're not really clear about. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, but I want you to focus on another thing that was important, as, as Eric had mentioned, um, and going back to the microbiome story. So at some point um, in 2017, 2019, we participated in this competition. It's kind of like CASP. It's called uh, CAMDA, so this Critical Assessment of Massive Data uh, Annotation. And this uh, challenge was to try to figure out whether there is functional signatures, sorry, whether there are signatures of microbiomes that come from different subway stations in the world, right? So what you see here is Sacramento, Santiago, uh, Offa, and, and Tokyo, and Oakland, and Hamilton. These were subways that were sampled for microbiomes. And we had to predict whether we can identify where a subway sample comes from internationally. And what we found is that if we converted the metagenomic data, so this is read data, not protein data, DNA data, into functional annotations that we would think would be carried out by the proteins that would be encoded by the genes in these microbiomes, we can actually differentiate between the different cities. So I know you 
can't really see that very well, but um, the the idea is that we can differentiate a sample coming from, let's say, New York subway station from everybody else versus a Tokyo subway station from everybody else. And uh, this was done using the old sort of uh, ways of looking at data. So we looked at alignments and we decided we were going to use deep learning in order to get to the same space. The first thing that we used were uh, LSTMs, these uh, long short term memory um, models. They were pretty good ident at identifying functionality. And the first thing that we found is that we, if we use this data on ocean microbiomes, ocean metagenomes, we could identify novel enzymes that carry out known oxidoreductase functionality, right? So if you look at the left-hand side, what we see is that about 20% of the reads in metagenomes collected from the oceans were actually annotated as being oxidoreductase activity, whereas alignment-based methods, which are the standards, uh, were unable to do that. So the bottom line here is we were able to annotate significantly more reads from metagenomic data, but also we figured out novel ways of doing the same functionality that we already knew. Um, it's interesting in the sense that we were also able to confirm this uh, implicitly. So we know that at the surface of the ocean versus the mesopelagic, the middle zone versus the oxygen mi minimum zone, we expect the sort of a, a staircase. There is more, gonna be more oxidoreductases in the oxygen minimum zones and this is what we observed with the LSTM, but not with any of the other methods. Highlighting the fact that what we study is only a small fraction of what can actually exist. Right? And so that, that's the idea here. We updated this uh, uh, method that we had to a transformer, because everybody does lately, and the transformer method did better. And one of the things that the transform method also showed is that we can track evolution of uh, these uh, genes from metagenomic data using uh, the mapping, the embeddings, the representation of the metagenomic data in this functional space, right? So the way that John talked about the structural space that is mapped by AlphaFold, this thing maps the functional space. And uh, the reason we say that we can track evolution is because if you look the barely visible pink, in the middle of this is these reads that are not annotated with any enzymatic activity. And then the rest of it is enzymatic activity. And what you're seeing is that enzymatic activities are different across spaces, but uh, evolutionarily they're sort of linked in the middle. So why do I talk about this? Why is this important? And I think uh, this was the last point about the tracking of uh, novelly designed genome data, right? Uh, read data. So if we looked at these representations of reads uh, that Rabin is able to capture this transformer model, uh, that's the top line that you're seeing there. The likelihood that those representations arise is higher than all of these, the randomly generated, the shuffled composition reads. And then uh, when there is, um, if you take a part of a read from the same gene versus different genes, right? So this is with across or within the gene. They're still, even though they come from the same gene, they're still unlikely by this model. So I guess the takeaway point here is that uh, we can track newly designed genes or newly designed uh, nucleotide sequences if we wanted to use deep learning. So deep learning here is actually quite beneficial. So I know that was a lot. <laughs> I apologize if that was uh, confusing at any point, but I think that uh, the main point that I wanna make is that we are able to design things, but we're also able to track design things, right? So that's the idea. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll open up for questions. Patrick. Thanks. Uh yeah, very interested to um, learn more about your thoughts on predicting enzyme enzyme function. Um, you're showing how access to more metagenomic data helps you better infer, um, you know, enzyme enzyme function. You know, to give us an idea of the state of the art, um, like 
what fraction of a EC number do you feel like you're able to predict? Like how many digits, um, you know, accuracy do you think we're we're getting there? Um, and maybe follow on to improve that accuracy. What are the types of data that you want to see? Is it more deeper metagenomic sequencing or some other sort of um, uh, data to improve annotation? Right. Great question. <laughs> so uh, I I would argue that it is harder to predict the first EC digit than it is to predict the fourth EC digit, because what you need to do is generalize. And it's not clear that you can generalize all oxidoreductases. I mean, we show we can do it with some level of accuracy, right? But it, it's very hard to do it on that level. We, we can do EC4. I think EC digit three, which is almost the end, is probably the best uh, in terms of making sure that we are on the, on the right track and naming the functionality. And we're able to do that for the sequences where we have the gold standard, right? For the things that we are annotating out there in the depth of the Mariana Trench, for example, nobody knows without doing the experiment whether this is actually going to happen. And um, the idea here is that with metagenomic data, we're doing it from read data. This is a 150 nucleotide uh, stretch of a gene. So it's a fraction of a gene. And uh, we can probably do it better if we had the entire protein or in the entire gene, right? But the goal is to try to see what can we pull out of the depth of the ocean or of the soils, right? Or, or acid drainage mines that would give us novel activity that we've not seen before. I think that's the, the more data we have, the better. But we also need experimental data confirming the findings, not just our annotation. Jens? Yeah, a variation of my previous question about dark matter. So a lot of, um, we have more and more examples of viruses accepting proteins uh, and vice versa. And therefore also more and more examples now of, of proteins that have a particular fold um, that we can recognize immediately as a reductase. And mm -hmm. then it turns out actually that these proteins do not at all function as reductases, but as completely novel functions. So have you ever played with this? Have you ever used like, you know, things that almost look identical to see whether you can predict that it does not have that function? So there, there are, that's a great question. Um, I am very much interested in moonlighting proteins, right? So proteins that carry out one function and another function. So I'm not really sure uh, whether a particular protein that came from the oxidoreductase state has evolved to the point where it's no longer an oxidoreductase at all, or is it just having another functionality? Um, we've been able to predict multiple functions, but we were not able, but I, I actually haven't looked at this, whether something lost the activity and is now a very different activity. Yeah, I mean, the typical example is, um previous enzymatic proteins that turn into capsid proteins, for example. And then like in all likelihood will not work as the enzyme anymore. So I don't have an exact answer for you. That's a great question. I'm gonna go back and look it up. <laughs> but uh, I, I think the, the main point here is that since we're skipping the whole, let's get the structure story, uh, and we're not really relying on evolutionary information, for that particular reason, because we want to track novel developments. There is a good chance that we, we should be able to identify novel functionality in this way. Um, hi, Anna. You, you saw a variation of this question uh, to the other speakers. So I'm going to ask it again. Uh, you, you showed us limitations of even the sort of most powerful architecture right now, such as the uh, encoder-decoder transformer architecture, but then you also give us this kind of more mixed picture that they do better, actually. They're, they're very good for some things. So I'm wondering um, if you have any thoughts on the space of methodology versus data. What is it that you think we are missing right now? What would, what would allow us, for instance, to do variant uh, effect prediction? Is it data or is it methodology? And or, or feel free to speak to any other application settings. That's that's a very hard question, Amarda. <laughs> um, I think the biggest issue we have, at least 
putting on my biologist hat uh, is that we don't have very good definitions, or at least the definitions that we have are following the biology rule, which is, you know, it's not a real rule unless you have 35% exceptions, right? So the idea, the, the problem is that um, machine learning tends to, you know, upregulate the noise a lot, right? So bring the noise up. But for us biologists, uh, I would say noise is just, it's not noise, it's part of life. So the idea is that um, in some cases, uh, the machine learning models will do well if given more data, right? But uh, in some cases, you will need 100% of the data to make sure that the model can gen generalize, right? And we will never have 100% of the data. And also, if we have 100% of the data, why would we need the model, right? So um, I, I would say that in structure world, having family is sufficient and I think AlphaFold demonstrates that really well, as, as had previous studies, right? Um, that, that, you know, you could train a machine learning model to generalize from family data to predict structures. But uh, as John had said, he can't predict mutation effects, so specific residue changes, because that's outside of the family scope. And we see that in, in our paper that... Uh, um, these deep learning models, whether supervised or unsupervised, don't do better than just classical evolutionary models in figuring out the impact of variance. And so I don't think data will be helpful there. I think we need more informed biological principles wise information. Patrick Jens, did you have another question or are you still? If I could ask, you raised this issue of multifunctional proteins and many viral proteins are multifunctional. And a lot of times these proteins have a lot of unstructured regions that carry out these functions. And I guess, how, how good are the current um, methods at kind of predicting those? So this was a question uh, that I had for John. Uh, how can we differentiate in alpha fold predictions? whether the model is unsure about its prediction or this is an unstructured region which shouldn't have a prediction in the first place, right? And um, I don't think there is a very clear answer to it. There is a lot of methods out there that predict disordered regions, right? And these methods don't necessarily have to be deep learning based. They've been good for a while and they're getting somewhat better, right? So uh, the idea that disorder is somehow a limiting factor for structure prediction, I, I don't think that's true. But for function prediction, I, I think the, the thing is that we are not interested in the structure itself, right? So for us, function, whether it comes from structure or not structure, is irrelevant for the models that we are training. Now, this may not be, maybe that's too cavalier. Maybe we should train with structure representations in order to get a better functional representation. But I, I haven't seen the reason to do that. Else questions? Oh. I didn't know we had to do this. Sorry. <laughs> um, so you you mentioned activity modulation, and I've been thinking about where we are with respect to. I'm not even going to go to protein design. I'm going to go to just protein optimization. Just starting with a protein. Um, do you have a sense of? our capabilities right now to do very precise controlled optimization with a goal in mind? Uh, the brief answer is, I don't know. <laughs> um, this this thing happens, uh, you know, at, at a very high speed. So there is a new paper every five seconds on, on protein design and how much better they are than the previous protein design is unclear to me. It, it used to be that peer review was the way to do this. Um, I don't know that we have enough peers to review everything that's coming out to the same um, kind of standard. So I don't know, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. 
So our next speaker then is going to be Sean Eakins from Collaborations Pharmaceutical. All right, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'd just like to say that I've been working in this space of computational drug discovery and toxicology for about 28 years. And I never imagined for one moment that I would be stood here to talk about AI, the good, the bad, and the unknown. Um, so I'm a little bit uh, speculative. And so probably I should set the stage. I'm not a big company. Uh, this is everyone in my company, 12 people or so. Um, we don't have billions of dollars. We're funded essentially by the NIH and DOD and any money that we bring in. So we are the little guy. Um, and so what I'm going to show you today is uh, some of the things that we can do computationally, and we've done, um, that have received a little bit of visibility, uh, perhaps notoriety, depending on whichever perspective you look at. But they don't really reflect what we actually do as a company. We are a drug discovery company. We also develop our own software, and we also use this technology with other companies, whether those are drug companies or consumer product companies to design molecules. Obviously, uh, I'm limited today in uh, what I can present, so I'm just going to try to give you a little bit of an overview. So we use artificial intelligence to design molecules, find molecules, discover, however you want to describe it. Uh, this initially started off repurposing. While we were doing this, we realized we were developing software, obviously based on a lot of open source tools that were available at the time. And the realization from companies that we were talking to that they didn't have those tools, and that could be something that we could license to them or we could do work for them. So we became essentially a three-in-one, a three-for. We became a company with our own pipeline, a company with software to license, and then also contract services. So... It may appear a little bit schizophrenic, but as a small company, you have to try to make ends meet. You don't know which of these sources of funding is going to dry up. So the software tools, obviously, that was a passion I've been building on for 28 years or so using computational approaches for drug discovery and toxicology. So my initial goal was really to build tools that could make uh, machine learning models, uh, multiple types of machine learning models accessible. And then this obviously led off to building, curating data sets around toxicology and drug discovery, relevant data sets, ultimately leading to more generative tools. So where we started off was really this uh, tight cycle of uh, collect data sets from the literature, build machine learning models, use those models to uh, identify new molecules to test, do the testing in vitro, in vivo, et cetera. So pretty much this design, make, test, analyze type cycle. And um, about three or four years ago, talking to lots of companies, the feedback we had was no one was interested in us discovering molecules this way, whether they were novel or repurposed or whatever. They were all interested in generative design. And so that pushed us really to thinking about, well, how could we now go into an area where we'd never gone before? Well, fortunately, there was lots of open source technologies out there for designing new molecules. And so we tapped into that and then a lot of uh, the publications out there and obviously data sets. And we were working in drug space. So we could go off and look at small molecule data sets. And fortunately, there's very large databases out there like Kemble, PubChem, et cetera. So we could train uh, an LSTM uh, type model um, to essentially understand how to build molecules from a smile string, a one dimensional string of uh, basically the structure of the molecule. And then on top of that, we could plug in our models that we've been building, curating data sets on toxicology properties, various target data, et cetera, and put together um, a tool that we call Megasyn for megasynthesis, which essentially designs the molecules with the activities we wanted. And it does this quickly. And we were doing this with pretty meager computational resources at the time, max, and a couple of servers that we had in-house. And so what the tool is doing is allowing us to uh, stack up different models for the targets of interest, the 
bioactivity, et cetera, and goes through these iterative loops of uh, design from the smiles of the molecules. And if you imagine we're starting, say, with a database of 2 million smiles from Kemble, understanding what is a drug. Now, on top of that, we're adding models for activities that we want and want, in some cases, to avoid. And so we go through these uh, thresholds that we try to find molecules that hit the thresholds and move on in the design process. That's my hand-waving overview of how this works. Where it gets interesting is when you try it. Um, and one of the first examples we tried was a, a psychedelic molecule called Ibogaine, um, a publication that come out literally about the same time in early 2021 in Nature, where a group had taken this Ibogaine molecule, uh, which has uh, cardiac toxicity hitting a Herg channel, and ultimately came up with a molecule that didn't have the cardiac toxicity called tabernanthalo. Um, and they maintained the 5-HT2A activity. So we thought this was a great example initially of how we could demonstrate how this technology could work. And lo and behold, literally um, running this in a very short period of time, plugging in all of the models that we desired, like the 5-HT2A, the activities we didn't want, like the HERG and other 5-HT receptors, we were able to generate hundreds of thousands of molecule ideas. And tabernanthalog was in the top 50 of these molecules that were generated computationally. I don't know how long it took the chemists, medicinal chemists in the academic group that published that paper to come up with tabernanthalog, but this did it in a matter of hours. Um, and obviously it came up with thousands of other molecules, many of them with Im impressive activities as well. So this gave us a very good level of confidence that this technology could work. And we've been subsequently using it for generating uh, molecules for opioid use disorder ourselves. Most recently, starting with the psychedelic psilocin and getting to a 5-HT2C uh, agonist with 12 nanomolar activity and having good brain penetration levels. So as an example of how we've used it to design molecules, obviously I'm not showing you the molecule, but to give you the idea that we can actually use this prospectively, design the molecules computationally, or rather it designs them, tests them. But this is really just scratching the surface. We've applied it to designing peptides, polypeptides, protax, very large molecules, and even larger molecules, polymers. But that in itself is really, I think, just a, a small illustration of where these technologies could be used. In 2021, literally months after doing the tabernacle example, we had an uh, invitation um, to participate in the SPEES Convergence Conference, which deals with misuse of technology. And we were asked to look at misuse of AI. Obviously, uh, I'm greatly abbreviating what happened, but I left it till the last minute, um, literally weeks before the conference. I had to come up with an idea of what we could do. This is the email I sent to my colleague, uh, Fabio Urbina. My first idea was really to try to use this technology, Megasyn, to generate VX-like molecules. And the reason we wanted to do that, or I wanted to do that, is because we already had models for RAT LD50 and acetylcholinesterase inhibition, which we've been using. So for me, it seemed like we could really throw it together quickly. We did. We threw it together overnight um, using this approach, exactly as I showed for Tabernantolog, except now we have two models plugged in, acetylcholinesterase, RAT LD50. Both models, I should say, generated with literature data, all freely available. Um, the acetylcholinesterase we'd curated from uh, Kemble. The LD50 data was part of an NIEHS project that we, along with about 20 other groups, had participated in. We just flipped the directionality of one of the models, which was the LD50 model. Instead of avoiding toxicity, we pushed towards it. And overnight, we were able to generate about 40,000 molecules, including VX and numerous precursors. And this was essentially part of the data that we presented to the SPEES Convergence Conference. Uh, got a little bit of interest uh, from them there. Obviously, the ease with which we could do this with the technology, we designed molecules. We didn't actually make VX, right? And we didn't make any of these molecules, but we showed how easy it was to actually do this. And our concern was all of this was readily accessible. There are many tools out there. There are many data sets out there both for design of the molecules, data sets that we used. Um, but then if we wanted to go further, we could inc increase the properties of these molecules. Um, 
And there were tools already available to look at retrosynthesis, how to actually make the molecules. We didn't go there. Um, there are public tools as well as commercial tools to do that. So all of this is within the realm of possibility. Um, and as we presented this, we realized we should probably write this up. And a couple of folks on the side of the SPIES uh, conference, Philip Alensos and Cedric Invenizi, who are experts in this field of technology misuse, uh, agreed to help us do this. And we ultimately put a manuscript together that was published. It took about five or six months before it came out. Um, very small manuscript, and it really looked at what we'd done, the test case, this thought experiment, and then came up with some ideas of how we could potentially regulate these generative AI technologies. I should add that this was early 2022, so the timing historically, et cetera, um, if you put it into uh, context of where chat GPT was, et cetera, this was before all of that came on the scene. So this story got a little bit of interest and almost immediately a couple of uh, correspondents came out from other groups uh, talking about their experiences of dual use of computational technologies and then also uh, countering the claim of ease of which we could come up with killer AI type technologies, how easy these molecules or not were possible to make. So it got a little bit of interest. Um, we had a lot of discussions with various groups, uh, governments, journalists, et cetera. And this led us to realize that we'd actually created a dual use uh, teachable moment, uh, whereas all the previous dual use teachable moments were actually real functional things where people had created viruses generally in all the five examples we have here. Um, we didn't actually create anything physically, but we did uh, computationally create chemical weapons, possibly molecules that were even more potent. So this led to a lot more discussion about what we could do, how we could prevent this kind of thing in the future. This was not an area that I ever imagined I would be writing about, but we did actually come up with 10 recommendations uh, for generative AI across a series of publications that we put out. Obviously, there's a heavy, a heavy influence here of ethics, um, not something that I had traditionally gone through teaching at school. Um, we had humans in the loop. That was me, right? I could stop Fabio from making the molecules. Um, and I told him when to stop uh, once we saw the molecules that it was creating. We could take more computational approaches to limit the access to the technology. And all of these things are you know, pretty well known. Or we could come up with some sort of self-regulation. This obviously got a little bit of visibility. Netflix um, filmed this and it became a part of a documentary called Unknown Killer Robots. You can obviously watch that yourself if you want to learn more about robots. The chemical weapon piece is a very small piece of the documentary. Uh, and then I had another invitation to go back to SPIES in 2022 to give them an update. And in the interim, I'd been looking at some of the tools that have been coming available, like DALI uh, too. And I was interested to see, could I use that to actually render molecules? Is that something within the realm of possibilities? And it could come up with some pretty pictures, whether they're actually useful molecules is debatable. But it did get me thinking, wow, if this technology moves quickly, we could very readily get to the point where these tools become even more accessible than what we had done, where you could just suggest design a toxic molecule and the technology would do that. And then literally after this conference, those tools became available. While we were at the conference, we were seeing some of the uh, groups that were presenting on some of the diffusion models around protein design, et cetera. And it really hit a number of us there that they hadn't been thinking about the misuse of these technologies. And so that got us thinking about how those tools could be used to mask toxins, to come up with literally nightmare scenarios. Once you're in this space, it's hard to get out of it, I think, in some ways. And that led to a couple of other uh, manuscripts thinking about how these tools could be potentially misused. And obviously that's with this team, the same team of uh, scientists. And one example we came up with was the, the rice structure, how these uh, protein design technologies could actually come up with uh, literally a cloaking approach to masking the active site. And then, of course, chat GPT here. And um, the thought here was, could we just ask the chat GPT to design molecules that it shouldn't design? And in some cases, it looked pretty convincing. It could uh, 
come up with uh, chemical syntheses. In others, when we had a medicinal chemist look at the syntheses, they're actually meaningless. So it looks good on paper, but actually doesn't mean anything. We could also uh, ask it uh, to come up with syntheses of molecules that we shouldn't ask it for. And initially, the security would prevent you from doing that, but we found workarounds to be able to then get it to give you the answer. So definitely the security was lacking um, and the meaning was missing. And that probably goes back to the fact that these large language models were not trained really on chemistry data, um, but they tried to do a, a convincing hallucination. That's basically what they came up with. So what's next? Those I think are the unknowns. Um, more recently, we've been looking at what data is missing, what data isn't in databases, um, data that's perhaps presented poorly in publications from the sense of it's not computer readable. And one space that we're obviously interested is in psychedelics and predicting whether a molecule has potential to cause hallucinations. There is very limited data on that. Um, we found one paper in cell on an in vitro assay for 5-HT2A, converted that to a data set, made a machine learning model to predict it. We've done the same with a couple of books, Pickle and Tickle, um, which deal with uh, well-known psychedelic molecules curated all of that human psychedelic data, enabled us to then build machine learning models to predict hallucinogen uh, potential. This could obviously be a model that could be flipped in directionality if you wanted to present, uh, or if you wanted to design more hallucinogenic molecules. That has obviously not escaped our mind. So there's certainly definitely things that we have to think about with these technologies. Um, promoting responsible uh, AI, R&D amongst the scientists using the tools and obviously developing guidelines. Certainly there's many steps that we could take. I believe that we should absolutely be concerned about larger companies and the use of these technologies, but a harder group to regulate are the little guys like us. And there are billions of people out there that have access to a, a Mac or a PC. We used a 2015 Mac to uh, demonstrate the VX example. We didn't use servers. We didn't use complex uh, computing. It was pretty accessible. And so I think that's largely going to be the challenge we face in trying to regulate these technologies. Uh, with that, I'd just like to acknowledge Fabio, Philippa, Cedric, Maximilian, and the SPIES uh, conference. We were not actually funded to do any of this work, um, but we were funded to develop the technologies earlier and subsequently, uh, NIH and DITRA. Um, Thank you to them. Uh, all of the publications we've made accessible. Uh, if anyone needs any of those, I'm happy to send them along. And uh, if anyone wants to ask me any questions, feel free. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sean. Um, that's going to help me sleep tonight. <laughs> Gigi. Thank you for your talk. I have two questions. Um, first is, what is uh, you know flipping it around to look for harmful effects? What to what extent do you think that that translates over to the biological realm, not the chemical realm? That you know your your intent was to create a threat here, so um, it was not to to do another. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't as dual use as that. So did you get any pushback on that? Um. Those, those are actually tough questions to answer. Um, I mean, obviously what we present is more of a, a chemistry than biological use case initially. Um, but some of the applications of these molecules are obviously, they're all biological, right? I mean, um, so what we were doing, I think the example that we came up with was um, uh, something that was accessible. The other examples that I came up with at the same time I hid, obviously. Um, th those were equally, if not more, uh, terrifying, I think, in what we could have designed. Um, really, the, the thinking was how to make molecules that could do something bad, right? Um, I wasn't really necessarily initially thinking about the mechanism with which where they, they could do it. And I just think, in general, the concept of how these technologies can be flipped um, and and that obviously took on um, later on once we realized oh what has this um, exposed us to when I I was on the other side I was at the Spies conference and I was seeing other scientists presenting their work 
and not really understanding their implications or even presenting any of the potential implications of how the technology could go awry, especially in the protein design side and the diffusion work that was being presented. Um, a number of us, you know, they were we were already, I think, attuned to how that could be done. So, I mean, I don't know if there's an easy answer to that. Um, your second question, I could you repeat it, please? How, how to whether that was really malicious or so in all the other cases that you mentioned, do you, yeah, uh, you know, creating the viruses, yeah, trying to understand what patients nature of us, um, and the evolution of H5N1 genome function, um. You know, those kinds of uh, experiments were done with a different purpose in mind, mm -hmm. whereas the kind of purpose that you had was actually to demonstrate a threat. That's correct. So yeah. I'm just wondering if you got any pushback because it wasn't really a scientific discovery that you're doing. Yeah, not really. Um, actually, at the time, I, I um, obviously that was not something that I'd ever intended to do was to use the technologies to do something bad. And, and I think that was the thing for me that was the most surprising, like at, at that time, 25 years of using computational techni technologies for doing good things. And then someone asks you to do something bad, you do hesitate. And I obviously left it till a couple of weeks before I had to do it. Um, and then the realization was, well, how can we do something bad really quickly? Um, and it was, it was actually, well, what do we have available to us that we don't have to go out and curate a new data set? We don't have to, you know, reconfigure the software to develop polymers, for example. Um, it was just so easy for us to do because we'd, we'd done work on Alzheimer's. We had a model for acetyl cholinesterase inhibitors. That's a valid target. Yeah. I don't, I don't know necessarily that, you know, I went into it with, all right, we're going to do some cool science here. It was more quick and dirty. What can we do? It's a thought experiment. Can we design VX or VX like molecules? And it just so happened that we could come up with things that were actually more potent than VX. That we've not disclosed, and we could came, we came up with all precursors for VX and other chemical weapons, um, and the software did that. We didn't have to tell it to do it; it did that literally atom by atom. It figured out how to build these molecules without any training from our side. Right? All we gave it was the Kemble pre-trained two million molecules. Right? <laughs> these are drug-like molecules tested against loads of biological assays. The only thing that we pushed it was with the acetylcholinesterase model and the LD50 rat model. So it now knows what's a bad molecule. Um, so from the point of view of it being an experiment, it was quick and dirty. We, we didn't have like control groups. I mean, you know, if I think about it now, it's like pretty shoddy. The, the reality was that for us, it came up with things that made the hairs on the back of the neck stand up. They were molecules that were toxic. They were in databases. They, the, thing, the things that were novel it came up with were not too far away from things that were very well known. Um, so it did actually make things. It came up with things. Whether those are actually real things, whether they're synthesizable is a whole other question. And we didn't go there for obviously good reason. Thanks. If I could just follow up. I I don't want to put words in Gigi's mouth. I, I think the question wasn't, were you deliberately trying to make something bad, but have you yeah. been accused of doing that? Oh, yeah. I mean, we've had, I've had people call me crazy for doing it. I've had emails uh, basically saying, why would you do that? Um, I've had people abuse me on Twitter. Not that it really matters, but um, LinkedIn, you name it, every social media has gone, you know, to the extreme. But I mean, there's also been cases where people have said, you know, that's pretty interesting, but why would you do that? I mean, I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't been asked. And and then maybe, you know, the realization of if someone asked me to jump off a cliff, would I jump off a cliff? No, I wouldn't. But this was kind of scientifically interesting. Yeah. Jumping so, off a cliff isn't interesting. So similar to some of the other examples you gave. Okay, so I've got Patrick, Jens, Brad... Yana, we really have to focus on questions from the committee, so maybe you could take yours offline because um, we're just not going to have enough time, I think. So, Patrick. Um, yeah, so there, there's been a lot of, um, you know, interest in the applicability of AI models for drug discovery and drug development, and as you mentioned, like a kind of a move from repurposing to, to novel molecule design. But 
you know, what are your thoughts on how quickly, you know, this area is advancing? I see it's kind of the true test of, of these technologies and the drug development space is, um, you know, successful clinical development of, of new drugs. And I think that has been, has been lagging. So, yeah. you know, from your, your standpoint, like, you know, are we five years away, 10 years away from, you know, these types of generative approaches, uh, you know, making clinical trials like more confirmatory um, versus versus necessary? And, and, and how do you think about that? Um, without wanting to fall into the traditional trap of um, this technology is going to change drug discovery, which I've heard for the last 30 years for a laundry list of technologies from comp combinatorial chemistry, CRISPR, you name it. I, I don't know that it's going to revolutionize drug discovery. All I know is it's getting a lot of attention. Um, the technology is moving at pace. And most, if not all, large farmers are trying to address AI. Many of them are 10 to 20 years behind. Um, I mean, I've spoken to companies, large companies, global companies. Some of them are, you know, they they have the technologies, the tools. AstraZeneca is a great example. You know, they're obviously at the forefront of some of this generative molecule design. Um, but it's really a very small number of people doing the work. Uh, when you think about it, you put it into the perspective of a company may have hundreds of chemists or access to thousands of researchers, but the number of people actually doing this work is just a handful. Um, so I, I think that it's, most of it's been driven by companies specifically in the in the space, like in silicon medicine, they get a lot of visibility. More recently, uh, Exientia, Benevolent, and, and there's a whole slew, if not hundreds of these companies and um, so, yes, will we get to molecules that reach the clinic? Yes, I think that's already happening. Some of them are failing, sure, but most drugs fail anyway, so no surprises there. Are the numbers that are reaching the clinic enough? No, we're way, way, way short of, you know, if I had a billion dollars, could I do better than some of these companies? Absolutely, and I wouldn't use generative AI. And I think that's the challenge, you know, the numbers game. It really is a numbers game. And generative AI may do well where you understand the biology, where the target's well known, kinase inhibitors, et cetera, kind of easy, low hanging fruit, where it will become really difficult is in something new. And I think that's the true challenge, right? It's how far away can we go from like the data we already have, the sequences we already have, right? And the chemistries we, we already have and get into truly novel pattern space. I think the bigger opportunity, I think, as was mentioned by Eric, is... Um, really on the consumer product side. It's not getting as much attention. The generative AI isn't really getting that visibility. Drug discovery is where all the heat is, right? And that's where all of the press releases are and you know the companies that are now merging or whatever. So yeah, will we, will we see those billions and billions of dollars of investment that's needed, I think, on the consumer product side really accelerate where this is going? It's much bigger, I think, than pharma. And we have to think in that direction. Thanks. Jens? Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, I understand the red teaming aspect of all of this, that we want to know what is possible. Um, but may, maybe you did it. But um, uh, so did you do in parallel also the same exact experiment with the antidote? <laughs> you know, come up with like 5,000 better atropines and then uh, actually see that maybe the, you get more and better atropines than you get more and better VXs so that is a competition and an algorithm. Yeah, we, did, we didn't do them uh, at the same time. I mean, we've more recently used uh, technology uh, to, to come up with molecules that, um, that could obviously be useful as potential treatments. I, I can't say a lot more than that. Uh, we didn't do it in parallel. I think that would have been kind of interesting. Obviously, the push was really to show the misuse, not the actual real use. We've been really using the technology um, for a few months before we actually misused it. And using it, obviously, the tab and analog example we'd done before, we'd come up with some GLP-1 agonists um, showing how we could use it for polypeptides even before that. So, yeah, we hadn't tried to come up with a treatment for VX. Subsequently, we've accidentally discovered a molecule um, that works very well against VX. Uh, but that was actually, believe it or not, not through AI. So I don't truly think we have to use AI for everything. I think it's more of a supplement for ideas. Um, we actually found that EDTA works really well against uh, VX in, in vitro. That was a recent paper that we put out. So it, if not for nothing else, being in this space um, 
it made us think about other things we can do. So that's a positive thing I think that's come out of it. Yeah, I, I just think you know there's a there's a question on how to present these kind of experiments. So I think I mean especially in this space we are talking about like what is possible, mm -hmm. um, and so of course these kind of things are helping. But then of course you get exactly the criticism that we just talked about. People will say why on earth did you do this and why did you publish it? So I think um, if there's a possibility to demonstrate the benefits of the AI while giving the example of the dangers and then the benefits maybe outweighing the AI that would actually help the discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think I try to do that. Every presentation I try to, as I did here, come in with, well, how can we use the AI to design things that are potentially useful? Uh, you know, there's a massive multi-billion dollar market for new psychoplastogen molecules that could potentially be useful for depression all the way through to opioid use disorder. Um, and that's really what, one example we've been using actively, as I mentioned with the 5-HT2C molecules, where we've been putting a lot of focus around our own in-house in chemistry. As you notice, we're only 12 people, so we can't do everything. But one of those people is a chemist. One of those people is a polymer chemist. We have a number of biologists. So, you know, we don't really need to have a massive team to use these technologies, to build these technologies. Um, it can be pretty small. So if you were thinking about potential bad actors, you don't need a lot of people to do these things and act on them. Thank you, Brad. Okay, so um, so I'm curious about how much you can use these techniques that you've designed to facilitate the process as well. So so you talk about like the end goal and mm -hmm. the creation of a particular molecule, um, but you know lots of things can go wrong in the you know in that entire workflow towards creating it. And so do you think that the technology that you guys have built can help facilitate um, optimization of processes? Yeah, I mean, especially in the, well, this is a chemistry example, right? Chemistry is always fraught with examples of molecules that can't be made, very difficult to make. Um, so these tools could come up with lots of ideas of how to get from A to B, um, how to get around how people might think of getting to a, from A to B. So alternative routes to get to uh, a place and uh, intermediates that you could use to get there that might not be things that we would ordinarily know of. And so those are some of the real uh, issues you need to think about as well. I think it's less of an issue and more as a potential protection model. So mm -hmm. if you know all the ways in which somebody might be able to gather all the ingredients and design the processes to get to the end goal, you might be able to detect when they're going in that direction. Yeah, I'm losing my voice a little bit. So basically what I was saying is that if 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 you know the way in which somebody's going to gather all the ingredients and all the materials that they might need in order to get to a particular molecule, then if you have the ability to enumerate all of these through an artificial intelligence technique, yeah. then you might have a way of having a detection mechanism that's set up that you might not have been able to consider otherwise. So I do I do see this as an opportunity yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we can obviously supplement it with other algorithms to improve synthesizability. Um, we use pretty crude rules in this case, but um, with the example with the 5-HT molecules, we proposed, for example, to make 10 molecules. We made all 10. Nine were pr pretty easy to make. One was difficult. We did make it. It took longer. So it can improve um, you know, selection of molecules with a higher possibility of synthesis. It's not going to always be correct, but I mean, it's science. We learn from the mistakes. And that's the other opportunity, I think, is feeding the information back in. You know, that cycle. If we make 10 molecules, now we could feed that information back into the AI to improve the next design make test cycle. Great. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Our, our last speaker this morning is going to be David Baker from the Institute for Protein Design, and he's joining us virtually. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I hope you can see me. I'm very confused about um, uh, the, the name change on my Zoom, but um, let's see. Yeah, let me uh, share my screen.
Can you see that already? Yes. Okay, right. So I'm going to just give you a brief um, overview of de novo protein design using deep learning and then uh, comment on biosecurity related topics. Um, so <clears throat> de novo protein design is is interesting because uh, nature's only sampled a tiny fraction of the of the possible proteins um, uh, that that um, the proteins that are possible by assembling amino acids in uh, different orders. And um, almost all protein engineering to date has focused on sort of making small variants of naturally occurring proteins. But what we can do now is make up com is design completely new proteins um, that are unrelated to naturally occurring ones. We've developed new methods uh, for um, for doing this. Um, uh, RF diffusion generates new protein uh, backbones, uh, given a problem uh, uh, to um, uh, to solve. Uh, protein MPNN then assigns a sequence to these backbones that will ensure that uh, the, the protein folds to the desired structure and has the desired function. And then we can predict the structure using uh, uh, Rosetta fold or alpha fold and um, and ensure that the just to test that the sequence actually folds to that structure. And then if it does, we make the protein in the lab and uh, we test to see whether it has the um, uh, desired uh, biochemical activity. Uh, so just a brief overview of how RF diffusion works. It's based on um, on uh, uh, image generation methods by diffusion in which you collect a very large number of images um, from the internet and um, or from wherever, and uh, you noise them to different extents. And the network is trained to, um, you train a network to remove that noise to, as, as sort of shown on the bottom. Uh, and we apply, uh, and then basically you can start with completely random noise and progressively denoise it to yield something that looks like, uh, for example, an image of a cat, even though it's not any actual image. In the same way, we can take all the protein structures in the protein structure data bank, noise them to different extents, uh, train a network to remove the noise, and then start with, and then we can start with completely random noise and generate new proteins that look like they could have come from the protein structure data bank, but they're in fact completely new. And we can condition this in various ways to make binders to um, a wide range of, uh, to make proteins that have a wide range of functions. Uh, we've extended this recently uh, to um, antibody-like molecules. So uh, we can, in this case, this is the uh, influenza hemagglutinin. We can prickler, pick a prickler site on the hemagglutinin and then use this diffusion project process to uh, generate um, nanobodies uh, that um, have, uh, where we, they're really built completely from scratch. So the loops and the dock are, are generated by this uh, diffusion um, process. Uh, so we've been, we're now applying these methods to a, a very wide range of problems. I just wanted in the few minutes I have here to talk about the uh, design of, of, of um, antivirals. Uh, so, um, oops, sorry. Um, so there are, um, uh, there's, there are advantages to um, this sort of approach given, given a new threat. Um, we can very rapidly uh, do the calculations and then make the proteins in the lab. Um, in part, that's because they're they're small, so they can they're very easy to synthesize. Um, they're very very stable, so they don't require a, a cold chain. They have very high avidity, and they can be formulated for local delivery. For example, for a respiratory virus in a nasal spray. Um, so we have made um, very high affinity binders to uh, a number of different. Um, uh, viruses of concern. And uh, again, this can be done very rapidly now for any um, new threat. All we all we need is the, the sequence of the target. Um, the one that has um, advanced the furthest is um, a, a coronavirus um, inhibitor that we designed during the pandemic. Uh, so here, this is, um, we uh, we designed a small protein again that, that bind to the receptor binding domain on, on the virus. And then basically trimerized it, sort of structurally matching the trimer. So this is the design. This is the coronavirus down here. And uh, this has extraordinarily high avidity because it engages all three copies of the RBD at the same time. And uh, it turns out to have um, very broad um, uh, neutralization, neutralization effects. So this just shows um, across a, a wide variety of, of escape mutants that this uh, design re retains the ability to neutralize and um, uh, and it's been looked at fairly extens extensively in animals as to, uh, again, delivery via nasal spray, uh, where it's um, quite broadly protective. Um, 
uh, we and just another couple examples. Um, so this has almost gotten to be uh, a routine process now, designing these very, very high affinity inhibitors. And I'm not showing you the neutralization data, but um, all of these designs neutralize their corresponding viruses. Um, we can do the same thing with toxins. Um, so if a new toxin emerged, we can very rapidly design countermeasures. So we've now designed um, antagonists for the major components of snake venom that um, quite dramatically uh, prevent animals from uh, from death when they are exposed to the toxin, um, even when in most administered, um, you know, af after the um, after the the toxin. Uh, so they could be used either prophylactically and therapeutically. Uh, and again, these proteins are, are absolutely rock stable, so um, they don't require a cold chain, so they're very easy to distribute. Um, so my colleague, Neil King, has made a huge progress in de novo design of vaccines. Uh, so we've developed methods for designing these self-assembling particles that look like viruses, but they're in fact completely designed systems. And so the immune system reacts very, very strongly uh, to them. Uh, he designed a, a coronavirus vaccine during the, during the pandemic, which is now approved for use in humans. And um, we uh, expect this to um, uh, get the even faster. Neil's now um, uh, genetically encoding these uh, very high, high potent vaccines. And so I think this will be another very powerful way in which a protein design can combat to biosecurity threats. Um, so recently, we've made a lot of progress in uh, designing um, uh, catalysts. And so, uh, for example, serine hydrolases that not only bind their target, but also degrade it. So we can, in the diffusion process, basically condition it on the presence of a, for example, catalytic triad and create hydrolases in this way. And so, um, so our sort of next, uh, what we're currently working on in terms of more potent countermeasures is um, our proteins that only bind to a virus or toxin, but also have a hydrolytic site to degrade it. So this way you would need, uh, you don't need stoichiometric amounts of the, um, of the countermeasure, you could need, you just need catalytic amounts. And just, um, so in terms of biosecurity generally, um, just one thing I always kind of harp on, I think it's really important to log DNA synthesis. So, because I don't think any, any new engineered pathogen virus or whatever is gonna be very efficacious, but um, because biology is so complex, but you really wanna be able to track uh, track the origin. So if we had a sort of global, global repository of all sequences that have been ordered, then if anything suspicious does happen, it can be rapidly tracked to its uh, origin. Um, and uh, happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. Um, questions, committee? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, Gigi. So what do you see? Thank you for a great talk. Um, what do you see as some of the big barriers that are inhibiting your ability to uh, to use this to create better countermeasures? I could look at the flip side too, but what are some of the things that you're hoping will will be become possible? Yeah, let's see. Well, that's a really good question. Um, one of the, uh, there's obviously sort of further improvements in technology. So um you know, we need to advance the computational methods further. Uh, we need uh, training sets are, are, you know, the PDB is an amazing training set for structure generation, but uh, for catalysis, being able to, like for the these um, catalytic countermeasures, which I think are really the way of the future, uh, there isn't as anywhere near as much high quality data on um, say enzyme activity measurements. Um, and then uh, an, uh, uh, probably the biggest barrier right now is just, Going, we can now do for, for this sort of uh, antagonist class, whether they're uh, small protein binders or um, nanobodies. We we we've sort of we've gotten very close to solving the um, the biochemical design problem. Then what we have is a very potent protein, a very very potent inhibitor that uh, blocks the virus in um, in um, in you know cell neutralization studies, and then. Uh, in 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 mice, but going beyond that, I mean, there's going to be undoubtedly challenges further down the drug development pipeline. And so, what we've had difficulty with, and this I think is a, more of a sociology problem than a science problem, is you know we start we if we design a cancer therapeutic using sort of methods similar to what I've described, we have VCs breathing down our neck to start companies to develop them, and we've done this multiple times. For an antiviral, it's very very hard. Just there's there's not the pull, um, and so I think. You know, I think it basically is a responsibility of the federal government. So programs to actually, you know, te you know, uh, uh, test new modalities um, and take them through at least the early stages of the drug development process 
be really important so that we can, the, since we're completely designing these systems, we can basically incorporate any features that are necessary, but without actually taking things, you know, a little further than, you know, than a mouse, it's, it's really hard to know what, what we still need to do. Thank you. Um, Kirsten? I'm curious about the the validation step in the lab and uh, you know what's the throughput that you get on uh, creating the proteins, expressing and purifying them? How many of those are you able to do? Yeah, well, we have two different scales and we've we've made a, a lot of progress on this in recent years and it's kind of the unsung hero and sort of that, that complements the AI methods development. So we can now um, uh, design um, at, we can design, for example, a 96, 96 designs or several times, several times 96. We can, um, we've worked out methods so that, and I've done this myself, so I know it's correct. You can actually order from a company the DNA fragments that encode these designs and have purified protein to test uh, within three or four days. So we've really streamlined the whole, uh, the whole process. So it's remarkably fast. And generally, um, uh, that's sufficient. Um, and we can also test, um, uh, we can also test much larger numbers of designs and that takes about three weeks. In that case, we encode them in oligo arrays. Can you say a bit more maybe about the failure rate for the, the generation? Yeah, it's, it's very dependent on, on the target. Um, those of, those of you familiar with protein structure won't be surprised that, um, you know, if, if the, if the, if the target site that you want to hit has some as a few hydrophobic residues it's it's quite easy we can test say 96 designs and be clear fairly certain that we're going to get an animal or affinity binder um, if it's quite polar it's much more challenging and in those cases we would opt for testing on the order of you know of thousands and uh, so it's very target dependent we just to give you context we probably we've designed binders now to uh, uh, over 250 uh, protein targets, you know, most of them human uh, physiology related, human disease related targets. And um, so we also are getting a feeling for the specificity of these. Okay, Brad? Yeah, so you, you, um, so you started to touch on an issue that um, I haven't heard anybody else talk about yet, which was that this notion of you might be able to watermark proteins to indicate that the protein was created by a particular lab or at a particular place so that you could indicate either provenance or proof that it came out of a legitimate environment. And so I'm I'm wondering how far that's been pushed and the extent to which it can be done without influencing the viability of the protein itself. Yeah, let's see. So I, I wasn't quite describing watermarking. Uh, the thing which I'm most concerned about is uh, sort of virus gain of function. So, and I don't think this is so much a protein design problem as a synthetic biology recombinant DNA problem. So if you took a virus like the coronavirus and you inserted a couple more uh, human cell surface um, binding domains, they could be natural proteins, they could be nanobodies, it could, they could be a, you know, in the public domain, there are probably thousands of, of, of sequences which have been published that bind to, um, you know, different cell surface receptors. So you could you could expand the, the host range of a virus considerably. Um, to insert that into a virus, you, you would need to include um, uh, flanking sequences. Um, and so uh, that that allow it to, you know, so when you're doing the assembly. So if we had a record, uh, so suppose that, um, you know, there was some strange outbreak and we, and there was a, um, a design, uh, there was a, an isolate of a virus, say a coronavirus with, an EGF receptor binding uh, nanobody inserted into it. So, um, if we had a if we had a record of all the sequences that had been synthesized, um, then we could very quickly track where that came from. Um, and I think that'll be important. I think that's that's really important. Um, so it's not so much watermarking sequences. It's um, it's being able to once um, once a new uh, you know threat agent has been uh, identified, track down where it came from. Yeah, so you're you're talking about um, the potential for catalytic countermeasures. Can you comment on where you feel the state of the art is with regards to reducing uh, immunogenicity um, for novel yeah. proteins in that context? Yeah. 
Yeah, so we've done quite a bit of work um, and the companies that we've started have done this as well. So we have several design proteins that have been human, in human clinical trials. And in those, um, the antibody responses have not been have not been substantial, so they haven't interfered with efficacy. In animals, uh, we've done quite extensive um, uh, immunization experiments, and again, the, the sort of same result. If you give a design protein, um, you know, if you in, in sort of a standard therapeutic regimen, uh, there's not a there's not a large antibody response, and we think that's because the, these proteins are very small and very stable, um, and and you know, fairly, fair, they're very soluble. So. We, we think they're simply not taken up well by dendritic, dendritic cells. Um, and if they are taken up, they're not presented well because they're hard to break down. If you repeatedly administer, um, and this has been done most recently with an IL-21 mimic by um, in collaboration with um, a group at Dana-Farber, um, if you repeatedly administer, really trying to force the elicitation of antibodies, you do get them. But interestingly, there's, interestingly, there's absolutely no decrease in potency. So they're not neutralizing I think that's probably because these these proteins bind very very tightly to their receptors, uh, their intended receptors, um, often with um, picomolar affinity, and so that there is, if there is there can be an antibody response, but but um, uh, uh, but it would be non, but it's at least in the cases we've looked, it's non neutralizing. That said, I think it is an issue, and um, you know that's why we need more of these to to go forward to really um, see what the whether that's a significant problem for um, uh, countermeasure development. Thanks. Great, thank you. Heidi, um, you have a question. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Thanks for your presentation. I'm Heidi Howard from uh, GDM. And just to take everything back, it was, a, you know, we're, we're getting high into the technicalities. Could you give us a very brief idea on the technical level that you think somebody would need to walk through, uh, you know, RF diffusion, um, the, the whole process? Um, protein yep. MPNN and uh, like, would it be grad level? Would it be, are you doing undergrad labs at this stage? Um, you know? Well, I think where the, the thing, the real bottleneck would come in would not be at the computational level. It's at the, it's at the uh, making the proteins in the lab. So first of all, you need to be able to obtain DNA encoding the design. And then you'd need to be able to, you know, clone that DNA into a vector. If you wanted to muck with a virus, then you'd have to be really quite sophisticated and, you know, be able to figure out how to clone it into a virus. And then um, uh, to make it, and then to make it in a lab, you'd need you'd need a lab. So I don't think the computational methods are really. Um, I mean, what, we're, what I, I should say, one thing we're doing is with every new, um, we re we're releasing all our code open source, but we're doing a safety review before each release. So we assemble a committee of experts and send them our code and tell them what we're planning to do. And um, uh, and so far, you know. It, uh, um, yeah, I think so. That that part is working pretty well. But so I think the technical sophistication comes in when um, you need some to do the design. But I think the actual barrier to a bad actor would be uh, making them in a lab and incorporating them into a virus in a way that actually, you know, yeah. if you clone things into a virus, ninety nine times out of hundred, you're going to mess it up. So fair enough. As a molecular geneticist who yeah. failed many months on experiments, I agree a hundred percent. And I yeah. still am wondering though, what where would you assign this? this level of expertise is it because i'm working with engineers we're like yeah. oh any engineer can do this i'm like oh, whatever not this we're talking about yeah. something not me any engineer worth their salt could do this i'm like really if i go outside on the street and ask an engineer to do this they're like oh well maybe not every engineer and then they'll walk it back so i'm just wondering you know what level would you give this is it a master's right. level phd where are we how many I'd years say, of i'd say we're talking month? probably um we're probably talking phd level and um it's be very very different for someone who's you know, a graduate student in my group is going to have a much easier time doing this than a graduate right. student in a different field. So, um, right. yeah. Uh, Great. So again, I think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. No, anything else? Go ahead, please. I was just going to say that, uh, again, I don't feel like the design proteins per se are any more dangerous than uh, lots of proteins that are already out there. It's it's what context you put them in. And that's that's where I think the, um, the logging of DNA synthesis so you can track what people are doing with these is very important. Thanks so much. Can, can you talk a, a bit just about what the current sort of gaps are in ability to design proteins and what, what it's going to take to overcome those? Yeah, let's see. Well, um, as I said, there's a gap in, we, we don't know as much as we should about, um, there's only been um, 
uh, there's only been a couple of proteins that have gone all the way through, um, have gone through into phase one clinical trials. So we need to understand more about how you get from the design protein, you know, through the, you know, through the whole drug development process into humans. So I think that's one gap. As far as the design, um, like I said, the I think one of the attractive things about design proteins as countermeasures is, um, uh, is that you could incorporate uh, additional functionality like catalysis. So you need small far smaller amounts. That's a current research problem that we're working on. So that's currently a gap. So we've gotten good at designing binding. Um, we can design catalysis on model compounds, but combining those, so we, we can design uh, binding proteins that also have um, a catalytic activity. It doesn't have to be proteolysis, you know, it can be covalent modification or something. So I, I kind of see that that's sort of a, a, a problem at the sort of cu current cutting edge of the, of the protein design field. If I could just follow up, can would you more general? Would you generalize that to say you know we were talking a little earlier about multifunctional proteins? So you think that would be a, a more a more difficult task? Yeah. So incorporate. So so exactly. Um. So saying that not only binds its target but also carries out a chemical reaction. I should say that the same countermeasure concept is is actually um, applied even more naturally to small molecule threats. So um. And there, one of the challenges is just working with the compound. So I just, I said, I told you we're making hydrolases. Um, we are testing them out on model compounds, actually designing, say, VX hydrolases, for example. Um, I think that's totally doable. Uh, the kind of collaborative networks that would be needed to actually uh, do this. So so it, one thing that I should just stress in this is that when you make designs, it's not like you make a single design and it works. You need to test a number. And so... Uh, for um, for small molecule, uh, uh, um, you know, like nerve agents, if you want to make countermeasures against those, uh, you really would need to have collaborations between groups like mine and um, you know national labs that can work with these compounds, and they and and that's been pretty hard to um, uh, to set up. So, uh, but yes, I think in general, the next phase of technology development are is is proteins that have multiple functions, say a very specific binding function and a catalytic function. We're also very interested now in in proteins that consume that use a chemical fuel to drive repeated repeated um, cycles, kind of like a you know a chaperone or things to be able to do even more um, sort of protective sorts of things, like things that would dissociate prions, for example. Any other questions from the committee? I don't see anybody on the Zoom. All right, thank you very much, David. Thank you to all of our speakers this morning. This was very, very helpful to the committee. And um, so we're gonna take a lunch break now and reconvene at one o'clock Eastern. Thanks. For the afternoon session. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome back to the in-person information gathering meeting for the Committee on Assessing and Navigating Biosecurity Concerns and the Benefits of Artificial Intelligence Use in the Life Sciences. As a reminder, the task is being undertaken by the committee is to understand the convergence of artificial intelligence in the life sciences, an emerging area of research and development with promising benefits and applications, but also security implications. This committee will consider the ways in which AI enabled biological design tools and the biological data sets for training AI can increase and mitigate biosecurity risks, specifically on concerns of transmissible biological threats that could pose significant epidemic and pandemic scale consequences. Um, for your reference, you can find the full statement of tasks for this study, as well as the list of the members of the study committee um, at the website nationalacademies.org. Um, and before we get started, I'd like to share just a few notes um, about today's meeting. Just for the record, this is an open session. It's open to the public and on the record and is being recorded. This is an information gathering session. That is, the committee is in the process of assembling information that it will examine and discuss um, in the course of making its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. Therefore, I ask everyone here today to be extre extremely mindful of the fact that the committee has made no conclusions and that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave here thinking otherwise. Comments made by individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or of the academies. 
In addition, committee members typically will ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. The committee will deliberate thoroughly before writing its draft report. Moreover, once the draft report is written, it must go through a rigorous review by the experts who are anonymous to the committee, and the committee then must respond to this review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the Academy's Report Review Committee and the um, National Academy of Science President before it is considered an official Academy's report. So this afternoon, um, the first panel will be discussing generative AI techniques for biological design. Since this is a panel discussion, what we will do is we'll be asking our committee members to hold questions until all speakers have presented. And um, what I would like to do now is to just introduce the speakers in the order in which they'll present and uh, then open up to the panel. So uh, we have three speakers today. Kathy Way, who is the CSO and co-founder of 310 AI. Mengdi Wang, Associate Professor of Electrical Computer Engineering at, and the Center of Statistical and Machine Learning at Princeton University. And Dan Hendricks, Director for AI Center, Director of the Center of AI Safety at UC Berkeley. Um, so welcome to the panel and I think we probably can um, ask them to go straight in, uh, Kathy, into the first presentation. Well, can everybody hear me all right? Great. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to come and talk today. Um, as mentioned, I'm Kathy Wei. I have a Stanford PhD in synthetic biology. I designed de novo switches as a postdoc in David Baker's lab and later published and patented some AI work at Amgen. And now I am the scientific co-founder and CSO at 310 AI, which is a Silicon Valley startup building a molecule programming foundation model, which we're calling MPM, and we're on version four. And today I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about this model. So um, most of you have, at this point have probably heard about foundational models, so I'll skip that, but I wanted to define mo molecule programming, which is a, a term that we're coining. So what attracted me to synthetic biology back in the day is this promise of applying engineering principles of you know, modularity, standardization, and rational design, and being able to get predictable and controllable biology. Similarly, I think we can apply machine learning principles like being very data centric, caring about information representation and using AI driven compression. And I think what that will give us is the ability to have advanced molecule creation. And we pick the word molecule specifically because we want to include in the future all types of molecules, not just proteins, but that is what we're starting out with. So the goal of our model, MPM, is to tackle molecule creation as a forward engineering problem. That is given a function, what is the sequence of the protein or RNA or small molecule that will perform that function? And this is in contrast to the reverse engineering problem, which really is aimed more at understanding how something works. So our main concern is about does what is designed do what it's supposed to do, and not so much how does it work. OK, uh, just a little bit of detail about the model. So what it does is it takes a human sentence as a prompt, as an input, and then it processes it, it into a vocabulary that our current model is able to understand. And then that information is basically distributed across multiple uh, sub-models that processes the context. Everything gets uh, compressed into an encoder, and then it gets decoded into various tasks that we ask the model to learn and perform. And then ultimately, it will give out a protein sequence. And so uh, this is an animation of how this might work. So in here, the prompt is a protein involved in the uh, disaccharide metabolic process and belongs to the glycosyl hydrolase 32 family. 
the model is outputting the sequence to one token at a time, and then we visualize it um, as a structure for simplicity's sake, and then we look at metrics to evaluate the quality of the sequence, the quality of the structure, and the quality of the predicted function. So here are six more examples, so you can get an idea of the types of prompts that this model currently takes. So things like ferritin, um, ubiquitin, GTP binding, uh, dehydrogenase. So you can see there's a, a lot of um, enzyme bias in this particular set. So at a basic level, this model is a text-to-protein model, but you can implement it in ways and to answer some more interesting questions. For example, you can ask for things like, is there a peptidase sequence that is no more than 50% sequence identity to any natural protein? And we can get out you know, novel uh, proteins either by sequence or structure or both, which is the four examples shown on the right here. We can also ask, given a particular protein sequence, if I wanted to replace all of the tryptophans, uh, what should I use instead and have the model decide that for you? Or you can give it a starting sequence and then say, what are you know, 100 valid variations on this sequence? Let's say if I want to uh, generate a small starting library. So these are the sorts of things that our current model can tackle. So in our current version, um, we're pretty proud of our model and we think it's pretty powerful and state of the art, but we want to push it much further. Uh, right now it is text to protein and we really want it to be text to molecules, including small molecules, RNA, DNA, lipids, whatever um, other categories are relevant. Right now we take in about a human sentence worth of information and then we have to process it down to a library. Instead, what we really want to do is be able to take an entire paragraph, right? Describing everything you might want in your molecule and then have no limitations to the vocabulary that the underlying model can actually understand. And then what we get out right now are a protein sequence, but in the future, we want to be able to output um, any number of molecules together that will actually capture the, the paragraph that is describing it. So the vocab part is really the, the data limiting part in, in how we think about it. And this is a visual illustration of that problem. So if you look at the image to the left generated by Dolly3, the prompt I gave it was create an image about quote unquote molecule programming in the style of Vermeer. And basically when you look at this image, you can't say that anything is wrong with it, right? And so when our model runs well, this is what we get also, you can't really say that there's anything wrong with the output. Now. In order to move to the right, what you'll see is even things like Dolly 3 have limitations, and this is where it doesn't have enough data. So in the right prompt, I asked for something a lot more detailed. I said, create an image about quote unquote molecule programming that features a protein and DNA and RNA, et cetera, et cetera. And I highlighted and read all the places where it didn't get it correct, right? So it didn't really include an RNA or a lipid or a peptide. And I asked for four scientists but it gave me seven and I asked for a hidden cat, but you know, it has the cat, but it's not hidden. And uh, to me, what this is, is a lack of data. And so our model too suffers from this. We need to feed it more and more interesting data in order to tackle problems like the, the equivalent of the right image. Okay, so one interesting thing about building our model such that it's kind of human text in is it does mean that the input prompts are a great place to flag kind of security concerns. So in ChatGPT, they do this now for things like copyright. So if you ask it for uh, uh, an entity like Pikachu, then it will flag it and say, you know, this is copyright, I will not run it. And so you can imagine that for our model, you can do this as well. So you can have um, the prompt go through some automatic processing to catch things, maybe if somebody is asking to design something deadly or design something infectious or to change specificities. Of course, we would have to be a little bit careful about what things are considered nefarious or not, but it gives an opportunity to kind of flag issues right at the beginning before the model is even run. And then another place to flag for potential security concerns is at the end, so after the model inference has been run. So after the model inference, as I mentioned before, we want to run about a bunch of validation metrics anyways. 
And right now it's mostly focused on how well does it perform, but you can imagine that we can create sets, maybe millions of computational validation metrics, and they can ask very interesting questions like, at what dose would this you know, harm a mouse? Is it maybe oxygen reactive? Um, will it disrupt certain functions or essential receptors in the heart or liver or other organs? And so if you imagine having millions of these sorts of prompts, then you can piece together after you've run the model uh, if there could be intended or unintended issues with the molecule that's created. And that's another point at which you can kind of flag the, the results of the model as being problematic. So uh, one of the things I wanted to comment about is from our view, the, the last point about being able to come up with these sort of filters or metrics, um, as well as just getting better models, creating more powerful models, there's a need for kind of unification in the, the data and unification in how we put these biological information together. So what I mean by this is, uh, no matter how high resolution you get in terms of data in one particular area, it really doesn't help you identify what's in the rest of the image. So in this illustration, even if I give you the highest resolution of the, the portion that you can see here, it's not going to help you necessarily figure out what is to the right of this image. And so if everybody can imagine what you think is on the right of this image. And now if I give you this, right, it's in many ways a much less perfect, much lower resolution image, but it actually gives you more information about the picture as a whole. And so in the, the biological sciences, I think one of the things that we encounter at 310 is there's a lot of divisions between you know, chemists versus biologists versus geneticists versus biochemists. And that lack of unification in all of the data is, I think, harming the, the field in general. And so we think that over specialization is actually very bad for the machine learning and that we need much more and proper generalization. OK, and I just wanted to end on this quick point, which is that uh, just like the invention of you know, microscopes or cryo EMs, those didn't replace scientists. And I also don't think that AI will replace scientists, but that scientists who use AI will definitely replace those who don't. And so with that, I'll just leave a couple of relevant links and hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, um, uh, Kathy. That was a great presentation. And thanks for keeping us to time. Um, so the next speaker will be Mengdi Wang. Um, and uh, we'll take questions from everybody uh, at the end of all of the talks. Mengdi, are you online? Oh, yes. Great, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, hello, sorry. Is it my turn already? Yes, it is. Oh, okay, sorry. Let, let me sync my file. When you're ready, you should just go to share screen. I think. Okay, does this work? Yes, that's great. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. So I'm glad to be here today and share about our work on like AI agent for automating biological research. 
So uh, I'm a faculty member at Princeton University, and before that, I did my PhD at MIT. I'm also, uh, so in Princeton, we have recently launched this Princeton new initiative on AI for accelerated invention, which I am directing. And so this is a very exciting time to do research in the intersection between AI and traditional disciplines. Okay, so uh, the motivation here is that uh, we're thinking about like trying to use uh, large language models to try to see whether it works on scientific research questions. So we actually compile like a list of test questions about experimental design problems or like biological troubleshooting questions related to like uh, genome engineering. And then we discovered that actually none of the available general purpose models work. So the general purpose model, they would like give up some like high level summary of available information, but they are not going to provide point to point answer to a specific troubleshooting question. So this is the gap we're thinking that we, we wanna close. Okay, so in this particular project, we built an LLM powered multi-agent system to automate a range of experimental design tasks in the context of CRISPR gene editing. So, um, so CRISPR is like, a, a, I would say, a class of technologies with different modalities. So we pick four major uh, modalities of CRISPR, including like knockout, prime editing, base editing, and uh, CRISPR activation and CRISPR A. Okay, there are other modalities, but we, we pick the, the four most common ones. So um, for automating research in this, for, for this type of like uh, CRISPR modalities, so usually a human researcher, maybe a PhD student would have to go through a lot of training and a sequence of decision-making process. For example, the first question is going to be like, it has, the student has to select a CRISPR-Cas system. It has to select how to do delivery. It has to design guide RNA. And during this, decision making process there are a lot of things one may need to like go to like search for search on the web for related literatures maybe one has to go to some um, reference data set to look for a particular uh, guide RNA and to check whether it matches a particular I would say genome segment so there are a lot of like uh, individual actions and decision points for a human researcher to work on this and a human researcher has to be able to generate experiment protocols to actually work out all the details. And in the end, so the human researcher would want to um, design the essay and want to like analyze the readouts and finally perform data analysis to figure out what's going on. And so in this process, usually a human researcher would have to really know about the underlying biology to make sense out of like what we want to do. And he has to use external computational tools as well as web search tools during the process. So our goal is to figure out if we can augment a general purpose LLM with an agentic workflow to automate this decision-making process. Okay, so uh, the, the first thing, uh, the, Actually, one important part of this is that we cannot rely on general purpose models like ChatGPT to really know about biology or to really know about a specialized domain of scientific research. So we actually have, we actually, as, as building blocks to our agents, we do use a general purpose LLM, but we also have specialized fine-tuned LLM, which we actually fine tune uh, an open source, the Lama 3 model on expert discussions between real biological experts and which have which we have accumulated for um, actually like 11 years since 2013, which was the beginning year for the CRISPR technology. So we did this fine tuning and it turns out that after fine tuning, so our model actually can be used for brainstorming because the human experts know about like this technology might work in a particular scenario. And a lot of those information are unstructured, but by fine tuning on human expert discussions, our model also learns how to brainstorm and how to make connections between different concepts. Okay, so uh, the framework 
the overall algorithm framework is a multi-agent system because we, we do have to have like individual agents for specific action. For example, we, we are going to have one individual agent for doing Google search, another individual agent for calling a particular uh, design tools. So we have like, a, I would say a range of individual agents for specific individual functions. We can imagine that each agent is a state machine. So the agent has its own internal state and it can interact with other agents in the system to complete, to accomplish its own goal, okay? So on top of that, we have a, a user proxy agent. The user proxy agent is going to be the interface between the rest of the agent system and the user. So the user proxy agent is going to try to communicate with the user and guide the actual human user with minimal interruption. And the user proxy agent is also going to communicate the user's needs with all other agents in the system. Okay, and we also have a, a, a planner agent whose goal is to actually chain together individual tasks. So the planner agent is going to look at this meta overall prompt of the human user and say, hey, to achieve this, we need to do A, B, C, D, E. And the planner is going to chain together individual state machines and to organize all the individual sub agents to work together. So overall, so the system works like, really the system works like a research group with individual agents good at accomplishing specialized goals, but we also have an overall planner which can be used for automating a lot of the decision-making process. Yeah. And so um, we do use like chain of thought reasoning and we have uh, also build the agent based on expert written instructions to make sure that the overall process is robust and uh, and to minimize hallucination. Okay, so to evaluate, so uh, we, we did two types of evaluation. So the first type of evaluation, which is very common in the literature of like natural language processing is we collect a group of like human volunteer experts. So those human volunteers, they are PhD students or postdoc fellows at Stanford University who have uh, a lot of experience with actually working with uh, gene editing experiments. So we have a rubric, try to like rate our agent in terms of whether the provided information is concise, is accurate, whether it provides reasonable reasoning and whether it's able to dedicate action automatically. So we have a number of like criterions and those the aggregated human evaluation results show that our agent is, is just substantially more useful than other general purpose uh, LMs for um, gene editing related question and answers as well as experimental design tasks. Okay, so finally, so because uh, we, we have this, uh, so our agent has actually multiple modes. So we have a mode in which we allow fully automated design from the beginning to the end. So we actually, applied our agent in a web lab setting. And so we have our agent to order, we, we use our agent to design every single detail in the experimental protocols and to, to do data analysis as well. So uh, we were able to demonstrate the world's first AI, fully AI guided gene editing experiment. So this is a knockout experiment. So it's like a very standard experiment. So many research labs knows how to do that. But what we can achieve is like, instead of having a student, I mean, take one or two years of courses, this is like an autopilot pilot that can help a researcher who has never done this type of experiment before to quickly catch up and know what's going on. And this fully guided experiment, so cause we, 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 we use our agent to design the guide RNA to do a bunch of things. So the first trial of the agent design experiment, we were able to achieve right, more than 80% editing efficiency, which is actually quite good if we think about like a junior year PhD student who might easily like fail the first one or two experiments. But here we got um, very high efficiency editing in the first time of our trial. Yeah. So, so lastly, I want to mention that, so we, we understand like LM biosecurity and gene editing, they're all like, I mean, I mean, ethical concerns and safety concerns are, are really, really critical here. So in our agent, we actually implemented a, a range of safety measures in the form of filter agents. For example, so we added a number of filters try to mitigate the risk of dual, dual, uh, dual usages. For example, if 
some user want to ask our agent about, for example, how to like added a virus to increase its, um, I don't know, mutation rate or something like that. Our agent is not going to answer that. So we have a filter to identify this kind of risk and we are going to just not respond to this kind of inquiries. And we have a number of like test cases here. And also, um, and also like we understand that sometimes the user might ask us to um, do design or to find information about a user provided genome sequence. But however, any long genome sequence could potentially, re I would say like review user private information. So we also have a filter to make sure that we do not submit any long genome information to external tools. So we'll keep all the genome information outside the agent. We're not going to process those requests. We also have a warning system for, uh, I would say posting warnings when the user uh, request could could be risky. Anyway, so this is a the set of things where we have done. And also I wanna say that so um, in the future, so actually like multi-agent systems are, are also very good at defense. So this is a paper called multi, uh, sorry, it's called auto defense. So the idea is like, when we think about, we have an AI system, right? So the, in order to make it robust, to make it, to, to defend it against jailbreaking, to defend it against other risk, it's actually important to have an independent layer of defense. And this independent layer of defense can be also a multi-agent system. So for example, we could have like an analyzer, a user intent analyzer, try to analyze whether this user request poses any potential threat. And there can be a, a judge, a judge agent in the defense layer to have to evaluate the outcome of the analyzer. And also we can have one analyzer for every single type of potential jailbreak attack. And all together, by putting together individual expertise into a multi-agent system, actually, so in this paper, one can see that the overall uh, attack success rate has been like substantially reduced to nearly zero. So uh, anyway, so, I think there's a lot we can do, we can do in terms of like building the scientific research agent as well as to defend it. Okay, so lastly, so like Princeton, in Princeton, we recently launched this Princeton AI lab and we're actively actually building AI tools for accelerating invention, not only invention in biology, but also invention in robotics, in fusion control, invention in general engineering uh, discipline. So I'm really, Glad to be here today to share about our initiative and our work with the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lindy, for that presentation. And we should just move straight, I think, to our next presenter, who is Dan Hendricks, and then we can take questions off. Great. OK. All right, I'll start. Um, so for context, um, I was under the assumption that this wasn't recording going to be public. So as a consequence of the, I'll speak less about um, very specific uh, or more specific uh, uh, bio threat models. Um, uh, and instead in the uh, later half of this, we'll just give general remarks on the, uh, uh, on the landscape of uh, LLMs as virologists. So um, <clears throat> I'm Dan. I'm the uh, I'm the director of the Center for AI Safety. Uh, I've I've done a lot of work in evaluation. Uh, some of the main benchmarks that people use to evaluate the quality of large language models. I mean, it's just NMLU and the uh, uh, math data sets, which are uh, uh, the most downloaded math data set and the most downloaded general LLM evaluation. Um, I'm interested in. Uh, also measuring safety properties of these systems, uh, not just their capabilities. So what is their potential for weaponization? So earlier this year, we made a um, data set of how can these systems be used? How much knowledge do they have for uh, weaponization? This is because in the White House executive order, it um, uh, demands AI companies to uh, evaluate the potential of malicious use uh, of their AI systems, um, uh, uh, in, in particular, them being maliciously used to create chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapons or cyber weapons. <clears throat> so we created a data set basically to do that, uh, to, uh, where we estimated um, the knowledge that it has um, about various hacking APIs for cyber attacks 
whether it knows a lot about more dual use areas of virology, such as uh, re uh, reverse genetics, um, uh, and also um, uh, things associated, and also knowledge associated with with chemical weapons. So we put together a lot of professors from a lot of different um, universities and, and PhD students, um, uh, and we. Um, uh, about 60 or so people are on the paper. So it was a, a fairly large collaboration. And um, it looks like they have a lot of the knowledge um, uh, associated, a lot of the theoretical, academized, or codified, explicit knowledge uh, associated with advanced virology, um, including um, knowledge about more dual use areas. Now, Although it has that knowledge, it doesn't necessarily know how to put that together for uh, to cause harm, fortunately. And, and an additional bottleneck is that they don't have the uh, know-how, however. So they don't know how to instruct people to um, accomplish the various goals in a wet lab step by step. Uh, and or or and they're not particularly good for troubleshooting. So although they could be possibly very useful for ideation and thinking of um, uh, uh, novel ways to uh, uh, create things like bioweapons, uh, they would not. They can't instruct people to implement them uh, particularly well. So right now we're doing an evaluation, a multimodal evaluation. Uh, so the previous paper I mentioned, by the way, is WMDP. So if you go to WMDP.ai, that's the paper site associated with that paper, uh, um, uh, which is published at uh, the, uh, the International Conference on Machine Learning. And um, the, uh, the current paper we're working on then is trying to assess that know-how. Do they have the um, uh, ability to um, assist people in a, in a wet labs um, to create viruses? So what we're doing is we're having a lot of Harvard Virology PhD students. They go to their wet lab, they're doing their daily experiments, and then you're taking a picture of, of what they're doing in the middle of their lab. And there's a, there's a picture of the Petri dish and everything like that. And then uh, we prompt them with the context of what their goal is. And then we ask the LM, what is the next immediate step that they should do? And if they're able to fill in arbitrary steps in arbitrary virology routines that Harvard PhD students are doing day to day, then I think we have some reason to worry. So currently we've collected a reasonable number of questions for it and GPT-40 out of the box is getting around 20%. So it's not like 90%. Um, and uh, if it ends up getting uh, a lot higher, then I think that that's more cause for concern. Um, it's very unclear uh, what the performance will be in the future. I should note that last year around, um, uh, or a little more than a year ago, the LLMs could barely do um, uh, single digit and double digit arithmetic. Now they're getting a silver medal at the IMO or at the International Mathematical Olympiad. So although they're getting something like 20% um, uh, accuracy for filling in arbitrary steps of virology PhD students in the wet lab, um, uh, I don't know, it seems uh, plausible that maybe it will be um, uh, at, a, at a getting high performance sometime next year. So what that would prompt us um, to do is we need to try and get ahead of this. Um, uh, we need to make sure that the, the labs are incentivized to actually think about uh, uh, weaponization risks of their systems. So although the executive order demands that they do some sort of evaluations uh, for this, they're not necessarily good. Um, and the people involved do not necessarily have good threat models. Um, <clears throat> so that's probably, that's one of my um, larger concerns. We did find that they still are doing, they still are doing some sensible things. For instance, um, uh, last week, OpenAI had out their um, uh, uh, model card for GPT-40, their latest model, and found that um, for non-expert people, there was some lift in um, coming up with ideas for bioweapons relative to uh, them using Google search. Uh, so we, we are exiting the era where these are just about as good as Google search, but are providing some extra boost that can't be found elsewhere. Um, but I imagine that gap will just grow as the models 
um, get uh, are, are, are uh, trained with 10x uh, more compute or uh, uh, later this year. <clears throat> so for safeguards, um, I think um, we, we in the WMDP paper, we proposed a safeguard, which is to unlearn some specific hazardous knowledge, for in particular, very dual use knowledge. So we're not deleting biology knowledge. We're not deleting all um, PhD level biology knowledge. Instead, we're deleting some knowledge in the model associated with more dual use topics, such as some concepts in advanced virology. This would make it less capable of assisting um, uh, in ideation and later on when they get more um, skills and know-how um, uh, and tacit knowledge um, uh, 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 virology wet lab procedures. Uh, so um, I think unlearning um, um, and adding trip wires inside of the models is, is a promising uh, avenue. It, it works. Um, uh, one can um, uh, uh, basically reduce the effectiveness on those sorts of topics while preserving the whole rest of its knowledge. One could imagine in the future that for scientists, they get access to the models that don't have those sorts of safeguards in place so that they can ask those um, questions about reverse genetics, for instance, and how to make influenza more, more uh, virulent. Um, um, uh, they could ask that, but the rest of the public for general everyday people uh, doesn't seem that crucial that we that the LLMs um, give them a lot of details on how to make viruses more dangerous um, uh, or walk them through how to do that. So that's a safeguard, um, making that the models are less jailbreakable um, uh, is another important line of research. Uh, uh, another um, another intervention for reducing these risks would be better know your customer regimes uh, so that um, they aren't um, uh, uh, telling a lot of this weaponization relevant knowledge to any customer who just signed up a few seconds ago. Um, uh, instead, um, primarily giving access to those more uh, that more uh, dual use uh, uh, information. Uh, to people who are um, uh, who have reason to use it, such as uh, researchers, um, uh, I, I think there's also uh, right now there's it's very common to open source or make models open weight, um, uh, and that seems good. I think when they cross the sort of expert level virologist threshold, though, uh, then it becomes a much more questionable practice um, uh, because of risks of uh, risks of weaponization. So. Um, uh, in short, um, the models don't have all of the requisite capabilities for um, facilitating people making a bioweapon. They're certainly better than, or they're in many ways better than Google, but there are substantial bottlenecks, um, such as um, uh, 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 specific uh, wet lab, uh, virology wet lab um, uh, know-how. That may change though, we're just now measuring it and that may change in a year's time, very unclear. So we ought to be uh, prepared. And there are many safeguards such as unlearning, improving the jailbreak robustness of these systems, know your customer, as well as doing um, uh, more cost benefit analysis in the future, um, uh, but before making models open weight. So uh, 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 thank you for the, the invitation and hopefully that gives a, a sense of uh, LLM and, and bio risks. Great, thank you very much, um, Dan. So I'm now gonna open up for questions from the committee. I think we have uh, 40 or 45 minutes for those questions. So um, please, uh, please start, Amada. Um, hello, everyone. This is Amarda, one of the committee members. Um, this is a question specifically for Wei, but um, um, other members of the panel, uh, feel free to chime in. Um, I wonder, as I hear you talk about the development of new models, whether um, you are obtaining a good understanding about the problem space in which these models are quite effective and what, um, what specific Sub problems remain outside of their reach. To instantiate this for way, for instance, you showed beautiful examples of prompts uh, that um, specified certain properties that the user wanted, and a a protein sequence and a structure was 
sort of shown to the user and the assumption is that it satisfied the, you know, what was obtained in the prompt. Is there something um, simplistic enough in the prompt that allows the model uh, to generate uh, a good response? Are there specific cases that it cannot currently handle? What would those be? And is that just because the data is not there, as I think you hinted at one point, or is it that the model is not smart enough to capture uh, all the information or to do something useful with the, with the information, the context in the prompt? Uh, great question. So I think you, you already alluded to the answers and I think it is mostly data, but it is also the kind of size and scale of the model. So right now, the, our, our model is not as big as we would like it to be because, you know, compute is expensive. So that's relatively easily fixable. The data is more of a concern. So when you start looking at these results, it becomes actually very intuitive and very clear where the model works better versus not as well. So when you think about the, the data that we're currently feeding it, a lot of it is sequences of known proteins, right? And what sorts of proteins do we have the most sequences on? Well, it's going to be proteins that are kind of central to life. So things that go across all species, things like enzymes in central metabolism, for example, right? Things that everybody needs just because we have a lot of sequences on those. And there's high conservation in a lot of those because of evolutionary constraints. And so therefore, in those sorts of regions, you can imagine that the model does better because we are feeding it more data on that kind of subject versus now if you're looking for a very specialized um, immune molecule signaling peptide that only exists in a handful of species, now it's going to really struggle, right? Because even as humans, we only know about say a handful of examples of those. And so you, you just can't crunch as much data on that because the data doesn't really exist out there. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, Heidi, and then we'll come in back into the room. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, so my question, well, I have a few, but I'll start with Mindy. I, I'm not sure if you're allowed to share this, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on your filters, how they, what they were based on. Uh, you know, for example, did, were they created based on restricted um, um, agents or Anything you could share about your filters? <laughs> yeah, so so that's the, the very simple thing, the very simple thing is to just have a, like a list of, I mean, a white list of keywords, right? So I think that's something very simple. I think like a more advanced and more intelligent way to do this is to actually build individual single agents who are analyzing each specific particular like type of threat. Okay, so j just to under make sure I understand. So you used a list of keywords based on restricted agents. So, for example, we can't ask about certain viruses or bacteria, or how does it work? Yeah, this is this is what we did in the first version, yes. Mm. Okay. Is there any more information on the second version? I'll stop asking after this, I promise. Uh, the second version is to have like an intention analyzer, right, to, to look at this. And yes. Uh, we ask the, yes. if, if there's, it looks like risky in, 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 like in certain ways, yeah. So intention analyzer, and so that's part of your, of your agents, of your multi-agent system. Right. And is it working well? Uh, I think it's working more robustly. Oh, excellent, thanks. I'd love to talk more uh, about this with you later. Thanks. Did you have a second question, Heidi, or was that? Um, I have it for other people. Let's go through the room and then I, I'll just uh, I'll come back on. Okay. Um, I'll come back into the room then. Uh, Patrick and then Michael. Uh, thanks. So a uh, question for, for the whole panel, but I think everyone kind of discussed that today, like these tools are, are best in the hands of an expert user, somebody who understands, you know, protein engineering and biology, the kind of relevant biology to be able to use them, you know, effectively. Um, where do you see advances coming um, that would lower that that skill barrier? Is that more on the development of improved large language models um, or in the availability of, of, of data, or is there some other um, 
uh, some other advancement needed to be able to reduce the skill set needed to uh, leverage a biodesign model? I can jump in here. So at 310, we build actually two things. Um, one is the MPM4 model that I mostly talked about today. The other thing that we build is our 310 co-pilot, and that really is aimed at the accessibility aspect. So it is, if you imagine something like a chat GPT, but it has a built-in visualizer and it's meant really for kind of uh, biological entity designers. So ultimately we want people to be able to go into it and say things like, I need a binder for her to that is specific to this subtype, but also is not cross-reactive for these other things because I want to like tackle a particular type of cancer and have underneath a model or a set of models that come together that processes that prompt and actually recommends things that make sense there. The hope there is that then they don't necessarily need to know about structural biology. They don't necessarily need to ask for something very specific like the CDR H3 loop. Maybe they don't know anything about that loop, right? Uh, to, to make it at a high enough level that people can design um, biological tools. Of course, in the context of this committee, right, there is a double-edged sword here because the, the safety will now become more of an issue. And I think there, the things that other people have talked about too, filters, um, intent analysis, all of these things will, will come in heavily at that side to try and make sure that the, the user is doing something reasonable and with good intent. Any other question, um, answers from the rest of the panel on that question? Um, uh, agents that are multimodal that can take visual inputs um, uh, uh, could potentially help quite a bit. So we uh, we're tried assessing um, whether models such as GPT-40 can use biological design tools by taking screenshots of the interfaces with them. And if it can um, uh, discern, you know, what should it click next? Um, and uh, of course it's not extraordinarily capable though, but um, uh, when its performance improves that could substantially reduce the barrier for people interfacing with these systems because they could give more vague requests and then it can go off and uh, 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 click and select and enter the appropriate commands um, uh, that the user themselves would not be able to do. Thank you. Okay. Um, over to you, Michael. And then we'll go to Gigi. Hi, this is Mike Imperiali. Um, this question is for Kathy. So you, you talked about a couple of safety things. So one being sort of, you know, um, you know, examining the prompts for potential concerns. And then I think you talked about kind of on the back end, having like a million validation questions or something like that. And I guess I'm, I'm just curious, like, how does that work? Like who gets to figure out what those questions are? Who decides those questions are valid. How, how do you implement something like that? That's an excellent question. So the, the validation part will, will have to happen anyways. And uh, people are already building all sorts of predictors that uh, are, are the same in my mind as validation things such as um, predict the thermal stability of this protein sequence, right? Predict the uh, reactivity of this small molecule, pre predict the toxicity or the PK or the PD. So any of these things, hopefully the, the community at large is building them. And once they get good enough, we'll obviously integrate those just because we, we want those as properties anyways, right? And then the layer on top of that you can build is, okay, given these uh, kind of concrete predictors, can you put them together in a way to predict something more uh, possibly nefarious or, or undesirable, such as, let's say you can predict that it hits all of these receptors in the heart, but maybe you also know from uh, you know expert knowledge that if you hit A, B, and C, that that's really deadly for people, right? Then you would want to build in something like that that says, oh, okay, now I've detected that it hits A, B, and C putatively, and that's actually dangerous to the heart. So we should fly that. And then the layer on top of that is, okay, that might be true, but is that actually a threat or is that actually something um, that is intentional because this combination also hits 
a therapeutic target, right? Like there's a population where this is actually good for the heart. It, it's actually going to be um, a drug. So I think it has to be built in layers. And I'm not saying that we would build all of these things, right? So certain things probably we will build, but as we get to the higher and higher level layers, um, we're gonna need other people who are more experts in those areas to be building. And then I think the final layer really will be up to kind of the government and legislation to sort of put the standards around, right? Like what things are the most important that you absolutely have to flag for versus what are things where you just kind of raise a red flag and say like, okay, maybe uh, a person has to go back and look at this person, the, this user's account and verify who they are and what they're doing. Right. Yes. Who gets to determine who the experts are? <laughs> who are, you know, determining that, you know, something above a certain KD you know, in the heart should be a flag. You know what I'm saying? Who who, who makes those decisions? I so, think that comes from data, right? For for experts for some for legislation. So for instance, and uh, we are co-sponsoring a bill in the California uh, 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 State Senate. And um, uh, for that, there's basically a, often it's committee members who appoint various people uh, to to oversee these sorts of things to create incentives for companies to make sure that they actually select experts appropriately, which is currently a, a big problem. Um, I think they have very little actual expertise on these issues. Uh, they do have a lot of professors who have computer science professors who are think they know about these sorts of issues when they don't. Um, uh, uh, creating some actual incentives for them to get it right. That is, if you get it wrong, you get in trouble. Um, uh, if people are misusing your AI systems because you're not appropriately mapping out the threats, then you get in trouble. Uh, that, I think, creates some actual incentives for um, getting experts as opposed to them um, uh, uh, hiring, you know, some people inside of their network who are computer science professors or something like that to, to oversee uh, bio risks, as is currently the case. Okay. Um, Gigi and then Sue, so I'm really curious about um, the whole process of one of the controls that you talked about um, and unlearning certain aspects. And I'm wondering, I guess this dovetails along with uh, what Dr. Imperiali just described, like how how effective is that? Um, and what, per, what harms to the beneficial uses of these technologies are you going to see given that many of the people who are going to be using this are, are you know, relying on the accuracy of the data. And also has that, uh, I have to also ask about the California law um, because, you know, having just recently, we see a lot of people who are COVID experts over the last uh, several years and um, even physicians, have, it's been a little bit challenging to get uh, physicians to lose their licenses, even if they prescribe or do things that are considered not medical standards. So I'm wondering like how effective that could be could be when it's much more subjective than than even the standards of clinical care. Ah, yeah. Um, yeah, so for the first question, right now, um, if you apply the unlearning techniques for targeting some specific, uh, more esoteric areas in um, uh, advanced virology, you can test it on its performance in college biology subjects and other related, um, uh, other related subjects, and then there's no performance hit. Um, uh, however, it is reducing performance on some introductory virology subjects, so I still think there is um, uh, room for getting for improvement. Um, but it does, um, on the um, uh, very advanced topics, make them have about random chance accuracy, um, and can preserve surrounding subjects like biology, but um, undermines performance in more introductory virology concepts, which you might be more okay with the models having. So there, there's still there's still improvements to be had. Um, that said, the safeguard is in place for models behind an API for these closed weight models. For open weight models, it's very easy to take out these safeguards and cause them to relearn this content um, just by fine tuning them. So the safeguard is relevant for, you know, organizations like OpenAI, but models such as like LAM 3.1, this would not be a good safeguard for it because it can be, it can only cost a few cents or so to, to remove the safeguard. And separately, um, the for the bill, um, uh, uh, there they would pr the primary incentive would be 
if there is some type of um, catastrophe, then they wind up in court and being liable. Um, uh, there's already liability and to some extent because there's a standard of reasonable care, of course, um, but uh, this sort of fleshes it out that um, uh, that uh, they will uh, wind up in court um, uh, if there is some catastrophe uh, that their model was a uh, was the primary contributing factor to. Um, uh, so how exactly, you know, chief legal officers and, or general counsel and um, others take these um, uh, uh, legal pressures and translate it to appropriate hiring is a, an organizational competence uh, question. Um, hopefully they'll be prudent to actually um, uh, get those, but there's nothing like a licensing regime um, or uh, anything like that uh, imposed by the um, regulation so if, uh, or by the legislation. So if uh, they are proceeding incompetently, they can still keep developing the models. But if they do end up causing um, mass casualties um, or $500 million of damage or more, then they do wind up in court. So it's, it's not even as far as a, a licensing regime. Thank you. Um, um, Suman and then Amada. Hi. Uh, so I just um, have, have a question, or, or rather more of a comment, uh, going back to the, the kind of uh, filtering and um, intent analysis uh, that you were, you know, we were, we were talking about. And this question is uh, mostly for the entire panel. Um, you know, I, I come from mostly from the security background and in my experience and in the security world, this filtering, even though they are, you know, reasonably good defenses for naive attackers, I think it has been shown time and again, right, with all the jailbreaking attacks and with all the other attacks that this doesn't work very well against any sort of, you know, somewhat sophisticated attacker, right? So if there is an attacker who's, you know, willing to find the, the error profile of these models, the understanding and kind of you know, tailor the, the, the query. Is uh, this this don't seem to work, and uh, you know, uh, in other contexts of security too, uh, that has been shown time and again, right? So, my question is, uh, what kind of other potential defenses, uh, you know, you know, people are thinking of? Uh, because one thing, uh, again, from a security uh, perspective, it seems is if you don't want a functionality, it's better to do data curation and remove that data out, right? As far as you can, of course, it's expensive; it has a lot of other issues. Uh, but I was just curious about, um, you know, uh, what uh, your thoughts are on this. So for removing data, that is one line of defense. It's not clear whether that's ultimately best. So I also advise for um, uh, Elon Musk's AGI company, XAI, um, uh, uh, which uh, will enter the scene, you know, more soon as it uh, recently constructed the world's largest supercomputer. Um, and um, more expensive than CERN. It's amazing the budgets for these things. But um, uh, one, one uh, thing we are looking into is um, curating the sort of top 1% of the most dual use virology papers, and then just making sure that those are not in the uh, pre training set um, uh, with consultation from uh, uh, scientists from MIT. Um, uh, that's, but I'm not sure that will ultimately be the best solution compared to actually training it in and then identifying the hazardous concepts and then adding tripwires associated with those. I think that on a security front, you, you know, you're, you're mentioning that jailbreaks have been persistent. I think a defense in depth approach will be helpful. Um, so one line of defense would be know your customer. Um, uh, so that if we find that they're jailbreaking, you can terminate the, uh, and they're trying to maliciously use it, you can terminate their account. Another line of defense would be input filtering. Another line of defense would be the sort of, um, uh, 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 these sort of tripwires such that if the model starts thinking about some of these more uh, hazardous concepts, then it, uh, the, the model sort of has some circuit breakers, so to speak. Um, uh, uh, there is also uh, output filtering um, would be another useful uh, line of defense. And even though each individually will have holes, they still can collectively improve the reliability of the overall system. And um, I think that uh, uh, can make it, it, can create some sufficient deterrence for people to try and jailbreak them, um, especially if their like account will be terminated. Uh, so um, uh, although each individual line of defense does have vulnerabilities, maybe there can be defense in depth um, that, uh, don't remove all theoretical 
um, uh, lines of attack, but um, increase the adversary cost uh, substantially uh, so as to um, prevent, you know, random, resentful, rogue individuals who are wanting to use it. Maybe it just is sufficiently inconvenient um, uh, for them to even try. And then I think that would be a success. I'll jump in here with a quick comment. I think that this would be very difficult to do until the models are much, much better on the design aspect. But one potential thing to do is to always build in a safety mechanism for any molecule that comes out. So in the synthetic biology world and in uh, you know like T cell therapies, there have been thoughts of uh, designing an experiment explicit kill switches or things like that so that if you know your your t cells that you reimplanted are, are going rogue there's something that you can add that will trigger them to or at least most of them to to die off and you can mitigate your risk that way uh, again this would be very difficult until we have very very advanced models but it would allow on the modeling side to, for whatever the function is that is designed intentional unintentional malicious or not to build in some sort of kill switch by adding a, a small molecule or, or something so that you might have that line of defense. Can Thank I you. just follow up with a question to Dan on, you said something about output filters. Could you just be a, go explain that a little bit further, please? Yeah. So for example, um, you could have a, a separate large language model after the output has been generated, read the output. And if it says something like, um, sure, here's some step-by-step -step instructions for a bioweapon. Then it sort of uh, prevents the user from seeing that. The main practical cost of this is that this harms the user experience because it induces a delay be before they can see the output. Um, so that's a, um, uh, it, it's a very strong line of defense, but that does harm the competitiveness of the product because there are more delays in user output. This might be more sensible though when it, you know, it may be um, if the, uh, maybe it could be triggered by their, it seems that the input is asking for something more um, advanced. Um, and so then it's only applied if it's, um, you know, you uh, asking about things in the subject area uh, so that for, you know, summarize this essay or your um, fix my code, you know, it's, it's, it's not being applied in those cases, but it's, it, 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 it's a strong line of defense, but there are some user uh, usability issues uh, with it. But in all of these cases, these are really um, looking at the interface before you apply a by design tool, not to the output of the design itself. So I'm largely speaking about if it's getting some consultation from a large multimodal model and less for a biological design tool. So um, if it's asking, how do I make a bioweapon? Give me some steps. Give me a cookbook or something like that. Or here's my Petri dish. I'm trying to grow a virus. What should I do next? Um, should it help me troubleshoot. These are things that the large multimodal models, such as GPT-40, um, could be able to do, um, but are uh, not, um, you know, um, implementing some of the specific functions that biological design tools are doing. So I think in the risk surface for, um, or the two risk sources for uh, bioweapons, I think would be, you know, potentially biological design tools and potentially these uh, some, these large multimodal models when they get more expertise in these domains, when they get both knowledge and um, know-how um, and that tacit knowledge and know-how. Um, uh, so that's largely what I'm speaking to there. And that's what most of my experiences uh, are from. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for just that clarification. Um, so Amarda and then back to Heidi. Yeah, probably my Parts of my question have been answered. I was going to ask about, again, the unlearning. Um, I didn't get quite a good sense whether it is pretty much a wish in the wish list or whether it has been implemented and shown successfully in some narrow form. Uh, you clarified that there are two ways to address it. You can censor input or you can censor out. Uh, but there's potentially a third one that I think you hinted when you mentioned concepts. Maybe you don't explicitly censor uh, response or sensor input, but you sensor concepts. However, is my understanding correct that these LLMs are large beasts? We don't know yet whether they have learned concepts. They ha there is some work that suggests they do, but we don't know where knowledge is stored. So we wouldn't even know where to go and tinker with them. 
So um, the great question. So uh, the results in the WMDP paper, we showed the results and it basically works um, pretty well. Um, uh, and I'm not just saying that because of course I have like a, you know, longer term reputation making, you know, security claims. Um, uh, um, the, the, it has limitations, for instance, or, or well, actually, I'll, I'll speak about a limitation of the deleting from the pre-training distribution. One issue is that for these closed models, like the open AI models, people can fine tune them. So they might try and give it some of this um, uh, advanced virology dual use knowledge during fine tuning through that API. So even if you remove from the pre-trained distribution, some people might try and smuggle it in um, during fine tuning. So that's why it's useful to have some other lines of defense as well beyond just deleting during pre-training. Um, the as far as identifying concepts in the model, um, we uh, I, things have basically changed in the past year. We don't have full interpretability, but we can find directions um, uh, inside of the network that strongly correlate with specific concepts, such as truth, such as harm, um, and such as uh, various advanced virology concepts. So although we don't know what mechanisms give rise to those concepts, we can find we can find representations that correlate strongly with those individual concepts. And so um, uh, what um, the method does is it um, uh, tries to stimulate those representations and get the model thinking in that way by prompting it and looking at those representations and then trying to make those representations just become something random. And then it is no longer, um, uh, then it uh, has those, uh, a lot of the, that, uh, uh, the um, function critical uh, bits of information in the model are then destroyed. Um, uh, so um, there has been um, fortunately a lot of progress in this past year on identifying some concepts at the high level representations. You're not understanding what the individual neurons are doing. That is not a thing we're doing. But you can find through the collection of neurons um, uh, representations that correlate strongly with some human interpretable concepts. And then you can intervene on those and uh, uh, censor those or add tripwires for those. Great, thank you. Um, Heidi? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, question is for Kathy. I was wondering if you could um, share with us if and how you red teamed um, your models or this mo the model that you spoke of the most. I, I can't remember the name now. The, it was in your title. <laughs> Sorry. Apologies. Yeah, the question again. Um, if, you, if you can share how you either red teamed or evaluated your model to check to see if it was you know, if, if somebody said, okay, could you give me a, um, uh, this is not an easy question, but like a risk estimate of a malicious user using your model and what they could get from it. Uh, we have not had a chance to do any kind of security assessments on our okay. model. Um, okay. The evaluations we've mostly doing are on the scientific side, right? Like, course. does course. it give you the thing that you're supposed to even get? Right. And um Will it work in the Absolutely web? Absolutely makes sense. Like that first. Yeah. And I'm just going to make a statement now, and we can discuss it later in the committee. Just that, um, so Dan has been talking about large language models, um, and Kathy's talking about a, a bio specific tool. And then uh, Mengdi's work really kind of brings <laughs> them together in the middle. Um, so uh, let's just remember that it's hard. Like we have a lot of evals for the LLMs, but the evals or the red teaming for bio specific models is you know, even more nascent than for the LLM. So let's just note that from this session. Uh, and then my last question, if I may, uh, is there another person who has a, a question? Go for it. I'm going to ask one question at the end, but go for it, Heidi, you're on a roll. Okay, I, I, let's do it easy. Let's do it easy, Dan, like like two sentence answer. For the weapons of mass destruction, I keep forgetting what the P is for. Uh, proxy. Benchmark. Proxy, good, okay. Um, What's your evaluation? Like, what's the percentage that will worry you? And what is that based on? Um, yeah, well, so um, uh, I think it's um, individually, even if they get very high performance, um, it's just getting at knowledge and it's not getting at know-how for it. 
So it's not getting at some of the wet lab virology skills. So this is, um, so I think that even if it, I think a low score is indicative of, you know, we, there's a lot of hazards removed, but a high score is not necessarily indicative of there, you know, some risk is eminent. Cause I think you also need another capability um, some of these multimodal wet, uh, um, skills to analyze what to do in a mm -hmm. wet lab, which we're not testing for. So sure. it's great. It's, Thanks so much. It's, it's it's an indicative. It's it's an indicator at when the performance is low, when performance is high. It's concerning, but it's not doesn't necessarily imply high risk. Thanks so much. Um, so maybe I'll take the chair's prerogative and just ask the last question, and it's kind of following up on that um, to Mingdi, and then maybe also to Dan. Um, you know, a lot of what we've heard about has been in the upstream, right, has been, you know, the intent of a question and, you know, how you define a prompt that's concerning and so on. But what I'm trying to get at with this question is how do you see AI impacting the downstream execution of a design? So are we there yet with either having enough information from large language models to enable a wet lab scientist who's not really an expert or to interface with an automated laboratory system um, to kind of reduce the barrier to actual executing upon a, a, um, a problematic design? Um, and so maybe Mingdi, that's a good question for you and then maybe Dan, but. I think for uh, thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I think for anyone to actually apply this, then this person needs a wet lab. So so fundamentally, this is more like I would say like a more intelligent and uh, easy to use AI handbook for our students and for like junior researchers, because those researchers they would they will have to go through the training process anyway. So what we're providing is more like a co-pilot, just like a co-pilot for coding. We are providing a co-pilot for, I would say, doing experiment and for designing experiment. But fundamentally, this person has to be like trained. And has to, he has to have basic training in biology. He has to have access to a wet well lab to actually put to put everything together. So that's my two cents. So you still think there's a there's a necessary level of expertise that would be required to actually you know implement any of these. And a, and a wet lab. Uh, I think it's not possible if, if we just just pull anyone from the street. It's not possible for this person to just do the experiment. The, the, there is a clear barrier in terms of like what are needed, what are the the facility. We need facilities to to run things. Yeah. Dan, do you have any comment on that? Or? That seemed good. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right, any last burning questions? And if not, I think we're one minute over. I will call it close to this session. Would very much like to thank the panelists for both excellent presentations and answering um, what are uh, sort of wide ranging and probing questions. I greatly appreciate both your openness and your expertise. So thank you very much. And I think we take 15 minute break and come back at half past the hour. Thank you. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, everybody. And this is the second of the afternoon sessions. Welcome back. Um, the next panel will be discussing how AI can be used in the context of pathogens with pandemic potential. Um, we have four speakers, hopefully, one of which is um, we're currently trying to track down. Um, so be um, Craig Willen from Yale University, uh, Sarah Richardson from the Industrial Biotechnologists, Andrew Pekeski from Johns Hopkins, and Pardis Sabeti from Harvard. Andy is not in the room, and we thought he was joining us in person. Oh, oh Andy, you're missed. You... He is here. Okay, we have everybody. Fantastic. So I would propose that we... Um, uh, we start with uh, Craig, go to Sarah, go to Andy, and then Pardis. And uh, I think everybody has 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so over to Craig. Thank you. And thank you so much for the, in the invitation. Um, so I, I come at this with a, a different perspective than most of the speakers so far today. So I'm a, a virologist. I'm also a, a clinical pathologist. 
And um, my lab studies emerging viruses and viral pathogenesis and viral immunity. And we often use AI as a tool for our work, but um, I'm certainly not a computer scientist or, or bioinformatics or AI expert, but uh, I would say an end user. So we're really interested in which viruses to focus on for pandemic preparedness. So there's millions, if not trillions of viruses circulating in the wild. Uh, many of these are starting to be sequenced. And right now, there's really the, the major bottleneck is there's this huge amount of viral genetic space, and we actually don't know which viruses to prioritize. We care about viruses that can infect human cells. Um, of those that can infect human cells and people, we really care most about those that can cause disease or pathogenesis. Um, and of those that can make people sick, we care most about those that can transmit either between people or th through common vectors such as mosquitoes to really cause pandemics. And we've had pandemics every five or 10 years, and this will continue from Zika, Ebola, HIV, COVID, SARS. Um, and it's going to keep happening and more and more frequently. And I think we need to stay ahead of it. Um, so the major bottleneck that we have in the field of virology is, or in the field of pandemic preparedness as a virology, is to identify which of these viral genomes encode viruses that have pandemic potential. And I think this is an area where AI can really help um, filter down and help us concentrate our efforts. So um, we've been using coronaviruses among other systems as kind of a model for this. Um, and what's really interesting about coronaviruses, we now have seven uh, human coronaviruses, four cause the common cold, and then we have three that are highly pathogenic. And, and amongst the highly pathogenic coronaviruses, they vary wildly in terms of their disease uh, and mortality. So one in 200 people die from COVID, one in 10 from SARS, and one in three from MERS. And frankly, we, we know the host response to these viruses quite well, but we don't know the viral genetic basis for why there's a 20 difference in 20 fold difference in mortality between SARS and COVID. Um, and, th and this is an important factor to identify future emerging viruses that are uh, of particular concern. So we wanted to get at this question by looking at, at bat coronaviruses and, and asking, um, can we predict their pandemic potential? First from sequencing, but then doing functional studies. So we focused initially on a cluster of bat coronaviruses called banal viruses, and these stand for bat anal swab. And they were isolated uh, in Laos and Southeast Asia from bat anal swabs. And these are the closest known relatives to SARS-CoV-2. Most of these viruses were just sequenced. One of them was actually cultured from a bat anal swab. And we, we chose this family of viruses to study because they're the closest known relatives to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they're 97% identical. And this is in comparison to SARS-1, which is about 90% identical. So really, really close, but yet distinct. And really, we knew nothing about their pathogenesis um, uh, or susceptibility to drugs and vaccines. So the challenge when studying these, these viruses that have been sequenced, um, but not isolated, um, is that you can't really do phenotypic studies. And many of the properties that we care about can't be predicted from, from sequences or protein structures. So we use reverse genetics. And um, here we synthesize the full length genomes that were sequenced previously from two of these bat coronaviruses. You uh, can synthesize the entire 30 KB genome onto seven different fragments. Uh, you could then assemble this 30,000 KB DNA molecule, make a 30,000 nucleotide RNA molecule, put into cells, and then launch your virus. Um, and this has only really been done for maybe half a dozen to maybe 10 uh, of these bat coronaviruses um, amongst hundreds and hundreds that exist in nature. And this really highlights the major knowledge gap and our understanding about which of these viruses uh, we should worry about and which we even have tools to study for vaccines and drugs. So the first thing we did when we got these viruses and we launched them from these reverse genetics platforms is we, we tested, can you infect human airway cells? And these viruses replicate identically to SARS-CoV-2 and, and primary human bronchial epithelial cells. Next, we ask, can these viruses evade human interferon? And, and interferon is a key antiviral cytokine that helps control early infection. And much to our surprise, these viruses are actually quite resistant to human interferon. Uh, and this is true both in primary human cells and in animals. And this is something we completely did not predict. We actually hypothesized the opposite. Um, but this really highlights the importance of these functional studies to identify uh, key properties of viruses that you can't identify by other means. We then wanted to ask if these viruses 
um, are, are more pathogenic or similarly pathogenic to SARS-CoV-2 in animal models. Um, we were concerned that based upon the, the resistance to interferon that they would be more pathogenic. However, we, we see the opposite. So in a mouse model where SARS-CoV-2 kills the vast majority of mice, um, the two banal viruses, one causes about 20% death and the other doesn't cause any death. And if you look at weight loss, this really mirrors the pathogenesis or mirrors the mortality where one of these viruses is intermediate, the other doesn't cause any weight loss and SARS-CoV-2 uh, causes weight loss until the animals die. And once again, we could not predict this and it's e even more unclear why these two viruses, which are very similar to each other, are quite distinct phenotypically. Then we wanted to ask, can these viruses, they could, they could infect animals, they could uh, infect human airway cells, they could evade human innate immunity. Can they actually efficiently transmit? And for this, we use a hamster model. So if you infect a hamster with SARS-CoV-2, and then two days later, you put into a cage for a couple hours with a, a, a naive hamster, almost 100% of the hamsters that you put into contact with will get infected. So we infected some hamsters with the bat coronaviruses. They do get infected. But when you collapse them, they don't efficiently transmit. Uh, and that's just shown here. Since we've done this again, and we can actually see transmission uh, at a low level for one of the two viruses. So it is a relative difference in transmissibility. It's not absolute. And once again, we would not have predicted this transmission barrier uh, based upon any of the sequence or protein structures. So to just highlight this work, um, wild type viruses from nature can be resurrected from sequences using synthetic biology, and AI is not needed for this. Um, and this is really important because it unexpectedly reveals novel properties of the viruses that you otherwise wouldn't predict that are important for our understanding about how these viruses can uh, be become important pathogens. Um, so specifically, they show that these viruses are resistant to interferon. It showed that these viruses poorly transmit, and, and we think this is due to uh, decreased replication in the upper airway. And it really highlights that we can't predict pandemic potential from coronaviruses or other viruses, even though they have 97% genetic identity, um, and really highlights the need for functional studies for, for pandemic preparedness. And the problem is there aren't enough virologists. We have hundreds and hundreds of coronaviruses and thousands and thousands of other viruses that, that are risk, and there's just not enough of us to do this. So, you know, can AI help us at least in a filtering step or possibly uh, even, even more uh, downstream processes? And we've heard about this earlier today, but AI tools are really important for us as virologists um, and for pandemic preparedness efforts, everything from drug design to vaccine design, antigen selection, um, and more recently for prediction of either emerging viral variants or disease signatures of different viruses that, that, that we are worried about. But as we've also heard today, there are potential risks of AI um, in virology, and this is something as virologists we think about a lot, and I'm really glad this panel is put together to further tackle this question. So the first and kind of the low hanging fruit is, can we use AI uh, to generate drug or antibody resistant viruses? And, and this probably isn't too difficult for AI to do, um, the, the, especially oftentimes a single amino acid could do this. Um, but I would argue that although AI could do this, it's much faster to just do it experimentally in the lab using techniques that we in virology have used for decades. Uh, or you could just passage the virus in the presence of increasing concentrations of drug much faster than you could do an AI model, then resurrect the virus, then make the mutation, and then test it. Um, viruses are their own little AI machine. And if you take HIV as an example, and one human with HIV who is not on treatment, every one of the 10,000 nucleotides will mutate to each of the other res each of the other nucleotides every single at every single site every day. Um, that's like the ultimate AI machine. Um, so as virologists, we just use that uh, and viral replication to make mutations into sample space. The second level, which is a little bit more difficult, um, would be, can we use AI to generate more transmissible or pathogenic viruses? And I think this is, a, of course, a theoretical concern. Um, this idea of gain-of-function research really came around when the Fouché and Calioca papers um, came out in Science and Nature uh, over a decade ago, where they were passaging uh, avian influenza, H5N1, between ferrets to make it more transmissible. And while this was a gain of function, the really key aspect that often gets lost is that even though they made these viruses more transmissible and that quote unquote gave them a gain of function, they actually result in a loss of function, which is the more important function, which is now they become non-pathogenic or less pathogenic. 
So by changing a property of a virus, whether it be from increasing transmissibility, you're often reducing pathogenesis. Or for HIV, if you change the receptor use from CD4, you could change the virus's cell tropism, but now you make it much more sensitive to neutralizing antibodies and to protection. So um, there are very few of any of examples where you could really enhance the pathogenesis and disease and pandemic potential of a virus without having some unintended negative effect on viral replication, transmission, or pathogenesis. And I think as virologists, we don't understand this. And I think it would be hard for AI to, to do this based upon the, the, the input that we have. And then the third level, which I think is years away if it happens, um, is generation of completely novel viruses. This, of course, has benefits for gene therapy approaches, but also, you know, if there's a, a malicious or nefarious actor, this this could be done. Um, I think we're, we're, we're quite a bit away from this, um, especially because there's many uh, currently existing viruses and pathogens that basically have already done this from nature. So I, I think it's really important that we continuously evaluate AI and its potential in virology to, to both do good and to cause harm. And I think it's important that we compare it not just to what we think it should be compared to, but to actual standard in the field and what, what knowledge exists already in the public domain, even if it's not something we're at the top of mind. So the example I use in teaching this is if you ask ChatGPT or any of the other LLMs to provide me a protocol to make ricin, none of them, we've never been able to get any of them to give you an answer. But if you just go on a PubMed and you pull up this 1910 paper from Journal of Experimental Medicine, it gives you a beautiful protocol and all of the reagents are available either at the grocery store or at Home Depot. Um, and you don't need any AI. Uh, it's beautifully detailed. And the same is true when trying to do a virology or reverse genetics experiment. All of the methods for, for reverse genetics and virology have been published for decades. And we give detailed uh, materials and methods with primer design and, and everything. And um, you don't really need AI for it. Um, you know, we, we give all the information. Now, if you wanted to express a, a potential toxin or dangerous protein, you just basically can take uh, a reverse genetic system where we express a fluorescent, uh, fluorescent protein or luciferase and just replace it with your toxin. You don't need AI to tell you how to do that. I, I think this knowledge is already in the public domain. Um, so it's really important that we're comparing LLM and AI methods to what's already in PubMed and not to things that sound bad. So just to conclude, Functional pathogenesis studies um, are really important, but they have not kept pace with virus discovery. I would actually argue that these are currently the bottleneck in virology research when it comes to pandemic preparedness. Uh, we're limited in predicting the viral genetic determinants of pathogenesis and spillover. Um, AI served really useful roles in enabling efficient drug and vaccine design and aiding in spillover prediction and response. And I think this will continue to grow and it's, it'll be really valuable to the field. I think there's a relative lack of training data, particularly for pre-emergent and understudied viruses. And this, I think, limits AI to accurately predict the pathogenic potential uh, of any virus, even, even coronaviruses, which are arguably now the best studied viruses of modern times. But I think as AI methods improve, um, we need continued vigilance and to keep having discussions like this and, and um, so that we can make sure that uh, AI does, uh, does good, but doesn't have any adverse um, consequences. Thank you very much, Craig, for that presentation. We're going to take all of the presentations and come back to questions. So I'll maybe move to Sarah next. Um, um, I think you have. You can stay right there. Oh, you can? You just have to press it one piece of all. Okay. Hello. My name is Sarah. I have no affiliation currently. Um, what I am engaged in is creative complaints and coming up with unpopular solutions to, but effective solutions to intractable problems. So I know the title of the session had to do with pathogenesis, but I told the organizers, I'm just here to hate on AI. And they said that was okay. So now, and I say that as someone who was trained in machine learning in data science and in molecular biology of bacteria. My core expertise is um, microbiology and genomics, but I was specifically trained in my years in the periphery of the Department of Energy about supercomputing and machine learning, which is why I have spent the last 12 years yelling about data. 
because I really want AI to work for biology, but it doesn't. It doesn't right now and we're not doing anything about it. So we heard today over and over again from people who are doing chemistry with AI. They have a biology application. And the thing about chemistry and medicine and materials is that the training data has been very carefully curated. And so of course those wins are easier. But what we're finding is when you need to translate it into the biology, when you need to actually instantiate a design, can't do it. Massive bottlenecks. And what drives me nuts is that every other application for AI in Silicon Valley in history has recognized that data is gold and it must be amassed at any cost down to straight up stealing it and then dealing with the fallout for that after you've made a billion dollars. The chat GPT, it stole most, I it's just, they just scraped the internet and uh, that's recognized as necessary and there will be lawsuits because it's very valuable, but they won already, they got their billion dollars. When it comes to biology, we are refusing to confront the fact that none of the algorithms that are revolutionizing Silicon Valley right now are applicable to biology because we just keep saying, and everybody said it, there's not a lot of data. And then we don't do anything about it. We continue to sin by skipping, skimping, and skewing data collection. It's not free like scraping Wikipedia. It's not glamorous because it won't get you a nature publication or the ability to say the first time AI has been applied to X. And it's not necessarily friendly to chemists and computer scientists because it's much slower than just feeding synthetic data back to the model. So this is a shoddy, self-limiting integration of math, computer science, and biology. It's a shame. It's happening on the wrong field's terms and the wrong field speeds. The field that's lagging in collection is biology. And we have legitimate needs in biology that aren't going to be addressed as long as the attention of the computer scientists and the chemists is focused on and rewarded for focusing on being able to get a computer to design something. This is not the synthesis we were promised when we said computer science was going to come help biology. This is not what we were promised. This is a shallow, unproductive exploitation. And as long as we're letting AI researchers steal the air out of the room, making us all kind of euphoric and giddy about what could be, driving the appearance of biological applications instead of catching bio up to where the AI is actually useful, we're stuck here. So we call the easy stuff data collection like genome sequencing, which is useless for where we need to go or actually instantiating designs. Um, and then we're biased because of that about what is actually effective or what is important because that's the only data we have. I was thrilled to hear Craig actually use the word functional data because genome sequence is not functional data. So we hand wave at getting functional data and completely ignore the thousand easily collectible things that would show us the constraints that we need to apply to our models and that actually guide biological relevance and would provide the novel training data that would make our designs applicable and not just pretty and our predictions realistic and not just, you know, potential. So we keep saying the data is sparse. No one is stepping up to say what they could do to help. There is inertia. There's, it, you have metrics. You have to publish papers. Um, you have to be flashy. You, you have to use the newest stuff. I've spoken to so many government committees and national labs. They're like, well, we have to use the LLM, whether or not it's relevant. Uh, we're just being told we have to apply it. And it's such a waste of time and money. It's the same thing with synthetic biology. The same thing happens. Synthetic biology was supposed to come in and make biology predictable and controllable. AI is supposed to be making our biology predictable, engineerable, and controllable. And both are failing. Synthetic biology failed for the same reason that AI is failing, because it's attempting to leap over the fundamental realities and challenges facing the application of algorithm to cells. So the bottleneck is on both sides, right? We don't have, we have sparse data. We do designs. We can't test the designs. I don't care what your computer says. If you can't actually get that enzyme that you designed in a cell purified, you're just, uh, I'm trying to be more polite and work on my euphemisms for self-pleasuring. The, um, uh, it, you can say we have 10 of the 23 possibilities for an enzyme, but you can't even get one expressed in your model organism. You have hard biological constraints on actually applying any of these algorithms to what we need to do. And this is a really fixable problem. It's relatively cheap. And here's the actual biosecurity problem that I see. This is well within the reach of a multinational corporation, a state or a command economy to do. They can just go collect the data. And the threat is not that any of the applications we've seen or imagined today are prototyped here. It's that someone else will actually do the data collection. The very simple, very boring stuff 
It's not even relatively expensive. And they will thereby be able to properly instantiate these designs that we keep throwing up and not following through on. That's the actual biosecurity threat is that this opportunity is to, to see it coming, to control it, to understand it, to actually use it is taken for, from us because we are too unincentivized, unwilling, or unable to see how important the actual raw data collection is. That's all. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that. Um, our next presentation will be um, Andy. I've been an academic for too long, so I need to have a podium and slides to do any kind of talking. Um, so um, um, I took to heart the um, um, understanding the implications of artificial intelligence on biosecurity and the pathogenesis of transmissible diseases, which were part of the session things that we discussed here. And um, really I'm here to sort of give you some perspectives on a number of different questions that I feel are important to answer in the field. Uh, just to give you a sense of who I am, um, like Craig, I am a hardcore virologist. Uh, we study respiratory viruses primarily, influenza, SARS-CoV-2, and enteroviruses. Importantly, all the respiratory viruses that we study have infectious clone technologies behind them. So we can generate any virus that we want containing any mutation in any gene in those viruses. So the technology is there for us to do work. We tend to work more in the area of viruses that continuously transmit in the human population um, and trying to understand how variations in those sequences sort of um, impact the year in, year out uh, fitness of these viruses to replicate in the, in the human population. I'm gonna hit on three general points. Um, some general comments about AI applied to virology, uh, research areas of significance and importance where AI also falls under the biosecurity blanket, and then talk a lot about the gray zone, the gray zone and unintended consequences and the implications of, sorry, my slide was cut out, of AI. Um, I'm gonna talk about the gray zone, not because it's the primary color of my beard, but because I think it represents the place where most of our biological questions really do sit. Biosecurity issues are not easy to identify. And when we start going after them, we have to understand the implications of what we're missing versus what we might be unintentionally be capturing. So AI applications to virology. I think that methods of development for infectious clone technology is a great place where AI can eventually contribute to. We have systems that require a lot of expertise that are a little bit finicky, oftentimes difficult to get functioning unless you have the appropriate expertise in place. Simplifying those methods, optimizing them, utilizing new types of enzymes, new types of approaches to modernize those systems seems like an AI specific question. But we're also interested in understanding viral determinants of replication, of species jumping, of evasion of pre-existing immunity, antiviral efficacy, increased transmission, increased disease potential, virulence, um, also host responses to infection and how viruses might manipulate them. All of these are essential to our understanding of viral pathogenesis, viral disease potential, whether they be in a virus that's currently in humans or one that we think is gonna be entering the human population. But all of these also have implications in terms of this concept of dual use. Um, we can approach questions with the best intentions, but perhaps end up getting data that can be adversely uh, used by someone um, who has a different approach or different motivation. So research areas of significance. I think it's pretty clear when we talk about extinct viruses with potential to infect humans, that's probably an area we can all agree are dangerous. Uh, smallpox is a great example of that, uh, but I wonder how many here think H2N2 influenza virus falls under that category. I wonder how many of you know what H2N2 influenza virus is. H2N2 influenza virus caused a pandemic in 1957 in humans. Um, it was eliminated from the human population when the next influenza pandemic entered in 1968. 
And now a significant portion of the population has never seen that virus, could be completely sensitive to infection with that virus. And we know that it's in freezers. We know that we have sequences of those viruses. Does that pose a pandemic threat? And what level does that pose a pandemic threat to humans? And how do we consider that in terms of our research on H2N2? I know Craig talked a bit about animal viruses that pose a pandemic threat. He talked more about the viruses that are in bat populations that we don't know about. I'll mention those viruses that we do know about, Nipah virus and H5N1 influenza virus. Both of those have documented abilities to infect people, to kill people, to spread limitedly among people. All of those represent viruses that we really should understand how close they are to posing a pandemic threat. But understanding how close they are to posing a pandemic threat could be viewed as turning those viruses into bioweapons. And therefore, we're stuck in that gray area again of trying to understand what are the benefits, what are the risks of working on these viruses that are clearly um, uh, imminent threats in the population. And then the other thing that's important to understand is current human viruses. I use measles and, and seasonal influenza as examples. Uh, we deal with these on an annual basis. Um, we have good vaccines against one, not so good against the other. Um, what do experiments designed to look at those viruses have to do? We have interventions against them. Do that, does that make them less of a potential in terms of a biosecurity issue? So again, some specific questions. Species jumping, understanding the pandemic potential helps determine risk potential. We want to know if a virus is one mutation or 23 mutations away from being a human threat. But these also provides a blueprint that can eventually make animal viruses easier to overcome more species restrictions, and that could be ap applied to perhaps multiple families of viruses. The issue of evading pre-existing immunity in the population. Well, influenza and SARS-CoV-2 do that on a almost a monthly basis, it seems, these days. Um, understanding how those viruses do that is an important factor to study. But apply that same principle to a virus like measles virus, where we have a great vaccine. Understanding how why that virus is a, why that vaccine is great, why the virus doesn't escape immunity, could tell us how that virus could potentially escape that immunity. And now we're talking about a virus that is incredibly transmissible in the human population, perhaps being able to evade vaccine-induced immunity. Antiviral efficacy is another important thing. We want to understand how easy it is for a virus to escape uh, antiviral resistance because before you roll out a virus or do a phase three trial of, in thousands of people, you want to know if that virus is easily going to obtain, obtain resistance and therefore make your drug useless. But you can phrase that as a very sinister experiment, understanding how quickly a virus can be resistant to antivirals um, is a way of taking a known weapon off the table with a particular virus. And again, that gray zone is something that virologists do deal with. Uh, there are rules in place uh, and ones that are coming down the pipeline try to help us make these decisions about what experiments to do. But I think risk assessment is not easy and AI and some of the solutions for how we apply AI to the problem strike at a different place. They strike at the questions that we're asking and the data that we're using and the information that we're generating and trying to apply to some of these very valid concerns we have, and perhaps taking some of that and categorizing it as um, experiments that, propo that propose some sort of expended risk or dual use concerns. And I think the final thing I'll end with is we also have to think about unintended consequences of some of the restrictions or labelings that we do. If you have an AI program that labels a user as searching for, for DERC related experiments multiple times in a week, that could be very concerning. If those experiments are well-hearted, but the program is calling them Dirk, and that information gets out, you can have really bad implications in terms of a person's career. And that's not making things up because we have currently debates about lab leak theories and other things that have really uh, set up an incredibly toxic environment in certain areas when it comes to discussing issues of virology and virus engineering. So I think those implications are really important in terms of understanding if you do put restrictions in place for things, how are you going to do that in a way that isn't going to um, uh, negatively impact in unintended in ways uh, 
virology research and independent researchers. All right, and with that, I will uh, go back and let wait for the discussion point. Thank you very much, Andy. And um, I think we have one last speaker. Um, and that is Pradeeps, who I think is online. Let me stop. Okay, I am online. <laughs> yep, thank you. And I'm just going to pull up my slides right now. Share. Okay. Oops. Um, sorry. Do you see um, my presenter view yep. or normal view? We do. So then, Great. Okay. Um, great. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about the kind of work my lab does. Um, yeah, and, and I think like Sarah, I'm not exactly like on viral pathogens per se, but I will get to that um, uh, as we go. So it's sort of, uh, but I want to talk a little bit more how we uh, are using genomic data in various ways to track pathogens and how we're using AI in beneficial ways to help, to help support that work and then end with a little bit of um, uh, kind of, you know, uh, like the others talking about where it could go a little sideways. Um, so uh, a lot of the work we do, it kind of is on these three pillars, detect, connect, and empower. And fundamentally, that's this idea that we want to be able to detect known and novel pathogens rapidly wherever they occur um, in with, you know, uh, point of need testing in clinics, uh, a broad differential diagnosis in hospitals, and uh, deep sequencing to discover new things and characterize things in genome centers, connect that information across the piece and empower a reactor in the system to work towards natural infectious diseases, which also, um, but naturally helps um, think about biosecurity risks as well. And so we've been developing a number of technologies across the space and working closely with um, uh, our partners in Africa, including uh, ASCID, uh, the African Center for Genomics of Infectious Disease in this work. So I'm just going to show you a few of the technologies that we've been developing, how those uh, either have already been shown to be using uh, uh, AI in really powerful ways, uh, but also can use it further. So um, <clears throat> over the last few years, um, my group and others, um, Paul, with Paul Blaney and Cameron Mirabold's lab, um, as well as Feng Zhan and Jim Collins, have developed a number of CRISPR-based diagnostics and where we use AI in that. Um, so these are point of um, CRISPR is was de developed as a bacteria's immune system to viruses. So it's designed very well to detect um, viruses. And so we can use a, a version of that uh, for diagnostic capabilities. And because of the extreme um, specificity and sensitivity of the, of the detection, um, it can be used to create point of care or point of need diagnostics that, you know, that can happen in really remote settings. It can be really powerful for developing multiplexed diagnostics. Um, and we, um, because we actually can do so much multiplexing, we're able to generate a lot of that data that Sarah was asking for. We have a ton of data um, in this biological space because we have lots of target sequences that we are able to analyze against lots of guides to really understand the mechanism by which um, binding occurs. Um, and we're able to use both um, uh, machine learning models to better understand, you know, how are these things targeting um, and use those to develop better diagnostics. And more recently, um, have a paper in press at Nature uh, Biotechnology where we use generative AI even uh, for diagnostics. It's a place you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be useful, but it actually is very, very powerful in developing uh, diagnostics that can um, withstand genetic diversity and identify mutations um, uh, uh, as they occur. So it's, it's really powerful technology. And because CRISPR is also used, it was basically a bacteria's immune system to detect and destroy viruses. It also could have good capabilities in developing um, antivirals if uh, the field goes in that direction. So, um, and we're applying the same kind of approaches of massively multiplex testing um, and using uh, ML and generative AI to design better diagnostics for PCR and for LAMP assays. Fundamentally, we are so, um, we are not taking advantage of all of the tools that are tool chest. Uh, PCR design has not changed for 30 years. Um, as a result, diagnostics uh, for COVID were 10,000 very, you know, scale variation in sensitivity and were constantly dropping out or changing and there are issues. So we've got to get much, much better at having this uh, system all work really well. We also have been developing a lot of data ana analysis visualization with our partners at Fathom. This is ways of basically taking the data that we're generating. So our kind of aim is to develop diagnostics at all levels. Um, and I didn't really talk about some of the work we do in metagenomic sequencing, but um, that also we can get much, much better and use um, uh, better algorithms to 
support, improve and support that work. But then once we have it, we want to be able to visualize a lot of different data um, and start to think about things like state level, level monitoring and zoom not a crossover. And so it, with all of these, we use natural language processing and some uh, kind of basic things that can show you a little bit of some of the stuff that we're doing in um, Bayesian phylogenetic analysis is some of the best ways that you can um, really study um, viral spread origins, um, uh, the origin of spread of, of uh, pathogens over time. Uh, one of the issues with the the best Bayesian phylogenetic analysis, the state of the art, is it takes forever. And so when an outbreak happens, you have to wait like a week to two weeks, uh, day, you know, days to weeks to months to analyze a relatively small data set. So how are we going to stay on top of things? Um, so we, we've we recently been developing uh, Delphi, basically reimagining all the Bayesian phylogenetic analysis and, and rebuilding it from scratch, um, and now have it working within minutes so that when outbreaks happen, if we generate the kind of data that Sarah is asking for us to generate, we actually can then really begin to process it and develop um, these phylogenetic models. Um, and we can begin to actually then use AI to sort of train on this and to be able to immediately predict when an outbreak is happening to start looking for, you know, what is uh, the the kind of classic signs of something that's out of control, that's beyond our um, mark and have the uh, sort of an automated way of reporting on that. Um, with Jacob Lemieux, a former postdoc of mine, now faculty at MGH, um, as well as the team, um, it's Obermeyer and the team from Pyro, we're also looking to see whether or not, you know, we could use this genomic information to be able to see um, how, um, you know, which variants are uh, of concern are rising in prevalence um, and to be able to really understand, you know, to be predictive in understanding um, which mutations are emerging and which ones are likely to be sort of spreading out of control. Um, and here is another place where we can use advanced analytics um, and AI to improve that type of work. So there's a lot of places where we're beginning to generate that kind of data that, you know, that is necessary, as Sarah said, to feed the models um, and to really begin to get very good at predictions. Um, other kinds of places where, um, you know, we've been doing work is around multimodal data sets, um, being able to use wastewater. Um, and, and this is a study we did at a, at a, at a college where we were able to get kind of data from Colorado Mesa University, where we were able to get wastewater testing, sequencing data, deep levels of student affiliations, Wi-Fi co-location, uh, you know, contact tracing data, clinical diagnostics, and start to be able to use these kinds of predictions. Um, you know, and we've been doing a lot of work in the Bluetooth as well, where you're generating um, uh, this is going to go, I think, let me see what, what just happened here. But um, we've also developed apps that, like others to develop, um, use Bluetooth for contact tracing as well, but also developed an app that we can test that and look at. Um, this is a, a group of individuals at Colorado Mesa uh, over Halloween weekend um, of 2020. So right when the outbreak hit and we're able to see all of their movements, um, uh, basically an outbreak was declared on November 2nd. But you can start to see all of the places where we can um uh, data sources that we can use to feed models. Um, uh, finally, the other kinds of data um, that uh, you know we are develop we are as one as one member of the group. So I'm just presenting from my own perspective. But um, some of the work we've done is around uh, using CRISPR as antivirals, like I mentioned, and that can be informed by this AI testing of lots and lots of different um, guides and seeing which ones we'll detect and could cl clip more easily. Uh, lots of data that we're generating around host and viral expression in cells um, to really understand, you know, what um, where these the viral the viruses are interacting, and then a, a lot of work around identifying um, what viruses are presenting to our immune cells. So we have a paper um, coming out soon where we we're able to uh, uh, develop massively parallel uh, systems, uh, ribosomal profiling systems to test over 600 viruses known to infect humans and to use information to figure out what are they translating? What kinds of, not just the canonical open reading frames we know about, but what micropeptides, these non-canonical open re reading frames are the viruses also generating? Um, and then here in work that we did on SARS-CoV-2 showed how you can then see what viruses, what of these viruses are presenting to our immune cells and how are they interacting? So, you know, we are getting to the point where we're, biology is actually generating a large amount of information that can tell us a lot about um, uh, you know, pathogens and pathogen interactions with our immune system. So in the last uh, couple of minutes, I'll just say, where can that go sideways? Um, well, you know, there's a lot of interest, obviously, in the lab leak theory. And um, and I've seen my colleagues uh, all really go on opposite sides of this and debate this endlessly. Um, and I've been pretty neutral to the whole argument. But in the way I've kind of 
described it as, you know, it's an important question, but it's really we're missing in the fight of did it, did we, was it, wasn't it? We've missed the existential problem, right? Which is that um, we've moved from uh, a lab leak and engineered pathogen being something that's not possible to possible to probable. And fundamentally that should unite all of us. Um, I don't think, you know, personally, whether it was a lab leak or not, um, I don't think that China wanted this to happen, but we now know how simple it is to shut down all of society this way. And we now know that, you know, these kinds of pathogens can be engineered. I'm actually gonna take a moment. This is not an AI um, event, but it's, I can tell you a little bit about where I'm worried about getting AI involved in what's already a bit of a morass. Um, this is a paper from 2001 by Ronald Jackson and his colleagues at, from, out of Australia. Um, you may remember this paper. It's one that's haunted me for about 20 years. But in essence, um, uh, what um, this group did, they were trying to um, deal with the overpopulation of mice in Australia. They were actually trying to induce sterility in the mice, which even that as a bioweapon is pretty terrifying and in, in some ways more terrifying because that can be insidious. But they what they did is they took um, mouse interleukin-4 um, and they placed it in, into the mouse pox virus. Um, and um, they then basically, um, you know, took that and as mal uh, mouse pox is a large DNA virus, it can, uh, you know, is, is well positioned to do this. But again, this could be done 20 years ago. And uh, they infected uh, mice that were susceptible to mouse pox and all of them died, 10 of 10. Uh, mouse that were genetically fully resistant to mouse pox virus and they all died, 10 of 10. Then they took mice I believe that were genetically resistant and then that were in, inoculated with the normal form of that mouse pox virus. And then they uh, then infected them with the mouse pox virus with the IL-4 and eight of 10 of them died. And I assume the other two did do so well. Um, those odds are not very good. That's telling you that you can basically override all of um, a host's immune defenses um, by incorporating into it a gene from its own immune system. And one reason I talk about this is because I think ultimately one of the things that the biggest um, devastations of the lab leak theory is the way that it is politicized the work in virology so much and gotten you know society to kind of decide that virology is the problem. And ultimately, you know, when I first started talking about this work back in 2001, I was really struck by the fact that this came out, the paper came out the same month as the Human Genome Project. And, you know, and I sort of would say, just as we um, uh, basically put out the book of our, um, you know, our entire, you know, genomes and the information that is embedded within it, we showed how you could use that information to our detriment. So that's something that's coming from the Human Genome Project. And we now know uh, the kind of work that we're doing that we and others are doing, looking at gene expression and understanding um, this interaction with the host will give us a multitude of genes that we know are important in um, protecting from infectious diseases. And all of those become very um, ripe for the picking and developing bioweapons. Um, and we could use AI to support that. Um, another uh, place where AI is directly involved and in really moving a field very, very forward, and again, not from virology, but from the work that, I, that I'm, I'm intimately involved with it because I began as a human geneticist. Um, so this is work on the left of my own lab um, where we were able to use directed evolution and engineering to design AAVs that could target specific tissues. So we were trying to help think about diseases like muscular dystrophy um, that affect muscles and trying to figure out how to help AAVs infect muscle tissue um, much better. And it was incredibly powerful what we could do through multiple rounds of this directed evolution. We were able to find the exact receptor um, uh, that these AAVs were binding to. We were able to evolve it, um, get it to enter the cells much better, um, and to ultimately create something that had incredible therapeutic efficacies. I'm really proud of that work and excited about where it could take us. And I'm excited about where the field is going because AAV technology is moving fast. And I'm without um, one of my favorite companies in the space is you know pioneering the use of ML for AAV design. Um, and you know, one of the things that they talk about, and I won't, like I said, this is a broader thing for the field. So it's not any one group um, that we're concerned about, but just where the field is going. And the fact that, again, we shouldn't take on virology. This is coming from you know really human health and biomedicine work. But basically we're using machine learning um, to understand how to get AAVs to target specific tissues, to evade our immune system so we can deliver our cargo more easily, to package uh, things of any size, um, to be placed into our genomes and to be manufactured at scale. And again, there are many groups that are all, you know, very successful in doing this kind of work. But it does tell us that if you take this 
knowledge that we are uh, you know developing and this understanding that we have and apply that to any pathogen that could infect humans, um, we're in real trouble. Um, I think I will stop there. Um, you know, I had a little something about, you know, the good news is um, uh, and the, the things that we should do, but maybe we can leave that for the panel. I'll just leave you with uh, my acknowledgement slide, which is um, I always use a picture of our lab holiday card to say this work is from a, a rich group of people. This year's past um, holiday card, the theme was um, science, the Eras tour um, based on Taylor Swift's uh, recent tour, but um, in it, we have all the different eras of science and we used mid journey to uh, create uh, the different eras of science and then placed ourselves into it um, uh, with, uh, uh, in a real way. So sort of a real, um, created the images that way and then placed ourselves into it by being in costume and, and designing. But it was essentially last year, uh, our kind of, we decided that was the right theme because AI is transforming society um, and there's a lot of creative, wonderful things you can do with it. Um, but a lot of dangers at hand. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Pradis, and thank you to all of the presenters. I'm now going to open it up for uh, questions um, and uh, from the panel. Questions. Our panel is I guess strangely I'll start. quiet. <laughs> I guess I'll start. Uh, maybe I should be more aggressive with this thing being up, right? I don't know. Um, I just hit that once, sorry. Um, so Pardis, uh, you, you mentioned a couple of times uh, in response to, to Sarah's um, uh, desire for more data and biology and putting resources together that you felt like you were starting to do that. Um, I'm wondering, if you could say more about sort of the generalizability of your approach for data collection, as well as where you put your data and how someone like me, who maybe wants to do something completely different with it would access your data. Sure. Um, yeah. So uh, all of the data we have is publicly available. Um, uh, when we, you know, sequence, so like, like I said, we, um, well, we do a lot of work in just pathogen detection and characterization. So when we sequence new pathogens um, or new, you know, new samples from different pathogens, we'll place it on GenBank. Um, if it's one of the things in GISAID, we'll also place it there. We'll make it accessible in multiple um, at multiple points. And so we have a rich amount of data already. And GenBank is an extraordinary amount of data of just uh, pathogen genomic sequence and not just, um, you know, and it, with metagenomic sequencing, it can also have a lot of other information in, that it's held in those samples. Um, same thing with the other papers that I cited, all of that data is always made available um, with the papers. Um, and so uh, there's you know more and more generating. I feel like in general, um, infectious disease genomics is a little bit uh, behind human genetics. Um, since I work in both fields, I can kind of see the pace uh, that they go out, but there is more and more data. Like we're starting to have more gene expression data from uh, clinical samples as well as non-human primate samples of different infectious uh, pathogens um, in the host. Um, the CRISPR data we have is basically made pub public with the papers that we publish them in. Um, and so I don't think there's like a common repository there, but they are they are accessible from the, from the paper. Um, let me think about others, but I mean, fundamentally, I think, you know, there, there is a lot of data sharing there. There's work that could be done on more repositories for that data, but as far as the genome sequence, that those are pretty standard and um, available on GenBank, but the other kinds of data sets usually are just, you'd have to go like paper by paper and get them from the journals. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, the fundamental challenges that we're talking about when we're discussing data availability. There are lots of brilliant scientists of brilliant laboratories generating data. And when you have a national repository, since you mentioned GenBank or SRA, that becomes an incredible resource for that specific type of data, provided it goes into those repositories with enough contextual information that somebody who wasn't there to generate the data can understand how it was generated and how it might make sense to integrate it with data from their own study. Um, and so, I, and I maybe I'm going to pivot back to Sarah a little bit because I'd like to hear more about your call for uh, data curation, data management. Like, what are you thinking about when you're, you know, sort of making the call to 
I don't know, do the curation you think could be done by anybody that would actually give us the treasure trove of information that could be used for AI? Yeah, there's two problems that we're facing. One is an architecture problem where any data that's already public, it's already in PubMed. If it was useful for AI, it would have been used for AI. It's also not architected properly. And that goes to some of what you were saying about, well, can someone use it? Can someone integrate it with some other data set? So if you're just putting Excel files or FASTA files up somewhere, that they're useless. Um, that's why we ask startup companies when they're like, we're going to use AI on what data set? So you didn't get your own data set. You're using the same algorithms everyone has access to on the same data everyone else has access to. And if it was going to kick, it would have kicked already because we're all smart. Um, the kinds of data we need are functional data. So genome data or even metagenome data is only one layer of this thing that needs to be multimodal. So just function, it would even help, you know, our chemistry model so much. When is the enzyme that you put into the training data, when is it expressed under what circumstances? What is it co-expressed with? What molecules do you see when that enzyme is expressed that you don't see when that enzyme isn't expressed? What other things are going on in the, uh, the context of the cell? Why can't we grow the cell that it came from? Why can't you express that enzyme in the cell you want to express it in? Like, what are the bottlenecks of failure? What enzymes have we never been able to express in yeast or E. coli? What, what bacteria have we never been able to grow? And then what genetic things do they have in common when you start actually looking at other things that you can grow and what they express and which conditions? There's some of this stuff. You don't need to invent new robots, new protocols, nothing. All you have to do is go grow things and use the same analytics that are available everywhere to say what appeared. It's just functional data. When properly architected, that's the other thing the architects need to do. You can't just have Excel. You can't just have MySQL databases or whatever it is. You need to be thinking about which AI algorithms you're actually gonna to wanna to apply to the data. I'm of the opinion that graphs are really where we need to go, where each layer of these data sets gets linked by context and by um, connecting tags to the other things. And that allows you to start using algorithms like graph neural networks where they're walking a path. How do we get from here to there and able to make predictions based on lots of context rather than the sort of autocomplete that large language models are known for. So to, in order to get that autocomplete, you have to have fed it in things that complete that. We don't, we don't have that. So we need the functional data to provide the, the basis for this, it needs to be a graph. It needs to be wide ranging and unbiased. So if you wanna work in cancer cells, that's cool. You should also, of course, have non-cancer cells. That seems to be a no brainer for control. But when it comes to some of the other things we do, we're very, very focused on uh, a couple model organisms that overpopulate all of our databases and skew it. So we have excuses for why we can't do it. We call it dark matter. Oh, there's a bunch of stuff out there. And we just can't get to it. And that's a fallacy that even a little bit of this data, this unglamorous functional data collection would do a lot to dispel this idea that it's dark matter or that we can get by without it. Does that begin to answer your question? Yes, thank you. I'm thinking about this from the perspective of a data generating organization and how we can potentially do better or collect more information and how to get informed on that. So thank you. Mike. I'm going to ask a question on behalf of one of our committee members who couldn't make it today, and I'm going to try to ask the question without showing my own bias. So this is mostly aimed at, at Andy and um, Craig. So, you know, we as virologists often talk about, you know, these trade-offs, right, that, you know, virus can't become more transmissible and more pathogenic at the same time or, or stuff like that. And certainly there's data out there, you know, to support that. But I guess the question, my question to you two is, you know, how hard and fast a rule is that? I think it's a great question. I'd say in virology, there's no hard and fast rule, and I would never say never about anything you would propose. Um, I think the virus is going to do what is best to replicate the viral genome. And um, if there was typically pathogenesis is not directly related to transmission and replication efficiency, it can be. But... Um, the virus just wants to replicate and spread its genome. So if there was a way you can link pathogenesis to genome replication and spread between hosts, I, I think it could happen. Um, 
but classically that is not the default mechanism. Yeah, one of the reasons why transmissibility wasn't on my list of things is because I think it's it's this dirty little secret, particularly in virology. It's the most difficult thing to study um, in any kind of control phenomena. Uh, and so defining transmission models that accurately mirror human transmission is incredibly challenging. Yet everybody thinks it's probably the most important question, right, about at least when it comes to viruses and respiratory viruses in terms of their pandemic potential. So I think that is the other thing. How do we how do we know that the data we're generating is really addressing that direct question of transmissibility? So just to follow up, if I may, then. So is, is this something that you think AI can enhance the ability to do, basically design a virus that in which both those phenotypes you know, are enhanced. I mean, I think that falls into those areas where I think AI could be utilized. Um, multifactorial experiments, multi-gene experiments, things that aren't as linear as we tend to try to be as, as research scientists or areas where I think AI can be applied more effectively than any of the methods that we currently use. Again, I'm not trying to push that particular topic as being an important one to, to to go forward on, right? But I think that those are the kind of questions where AI could come in and make some progress where our experimental systems have not been able to do anything. Yeah, we have a pretty poor understanding about specific mutations for transmission and pathogenesis. But I think if this was the goal of a malicious actor, you could design a fairly simple virology experiment to, to passage the virus to select for both transmissibility and pathogenesis phenotypes and try to find those that converge more easily than doing it computationally and then engineering the viruses and testing them experimentally. The virus mutates enough that it's basically sampling all of the genetic space or most of the genetic space. Hey, um, thanks for that. That's um great answer to that question. So Heidi and then um, Jens. Thanks so much for that clarification. I hope this is going to make sense. It's getting a bit late for me and there's a lot of background noise. I hope you can't hear it. Um, my first question is, is, is a little bit, it's going back to the last session a little bit. Um, and uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but just to get your, your ideas like briefly, on removing um, um, virology, if you will, or specific papers from training data for large language models. What's your, just your feeling about that or your thoughts on that? Do you think that's, that makes sense? Do you think that, you know, it doesn't matter because virologists won't be using large language models? Uh, what's your, or for, for any time soon for legitimate research? What's your, do you have an opinion on that? No? Not too much. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think the devil's in the details, right? What is the what is the information that you're going to re uh, remove from that? If you're removing all the H5N1 data because of the potential for that to be a potential biosecurity hazard, you're eliminating a huge amount of very good, very solid scientific data that allows us to look at this issue of species jumping and what are the mutations that a virus needs to do that. That's the cost of removing mm -hmm. it from the database. So back to my issue of risks, risk assessments are difficult, okay. right? So how do you balance the fact that maybe you feel like you're mitigating risk by not having those papers in there, but there's a cost by not having that data, that knowledge in the system to help inform uh, questions about Nipah virus, about other viruses, right. which maybe people don't think of as a, as, 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 as big of a threat. Right. Excellent. Thanks so much. And then I would I would just say, you know, extrapolating that to the bio specific tools, potentially not removing the data, but then it would be filters that are specific to those to specific viruses. You would say the same thing. Then you would be like, look at the cost benefit uh, analysis of that and and consider it carefully for mitigations. Is that is that how you would see it or? Yeah, and but I think it's I think the questions of concern can't be really just 
put onto a few families of viruses or a few examples of viruses. Um, the experience of concern can come from lots of different places and there's a subtlety, right? in terms of understanding the differences between some of those situations. Mm -hmm. You can remove the smallpox data from the database. Will it help you prevent a next H2N2 database uh, a pandemic? You know, I don't know. Again, the smallpox data and the pox virus data in general is some of the most amazing data, right? For interactions between a pathogen, a virus and the host. If you remove some of that from the system, you, the, the fields of virology suffer because of the lack of that basic data. So mm -hmm. I don't know where those decisions can be made uh, to strictly protect against male malevolent experiments because it's not pathogen specific and it's sometimes not even something like antiviral resistance specific. Mm -hmm. Excellent, I, thanks. I have, oh. Can I just follow up and just probe that a little bit further because I think this notion of of um, you know, removing data in training a large language model is different than removing data and training a um, a biodesign tool. I, I I personally don't think that biodesign tools are not going to be work. I mean, it's not going to have any impact on your ability to make a generative RF diffusion by removing some H5 data, but. Um, so we mustn't conflate these two different AIs and what the impact of removing data is on the two of them. So um, just as a word of so Yes, I, I wanted to compare them with filters. And that was the mitigations that we were talking about with the BTT, uh, with the biodesign tools earlier, right? When, when Kathy was speaking, yeah. she spoke about, but yeah. And then the reason why I asked about the LLMs is because of the LLM and agents that are using the biodesign tools, because that's, because what the LLM can do with the agent is based on, yeah, what the LLM has seen. So that that's my connection there. But you're absolutely right that we shouldn't be uh, confusing, you know, removing loads of bio data from biodesign tools. That's won't make the tool exist, basically. Uh, but there is a link between the LLM and the biodesign tools when you add the agent, which was Mendy's uh, presentation. So that's what I was trying to get at. And I have one last question, if I can, before I leave, which you don't have to answer now, maybe if there's time left at the end, because I feel like everybody touched on it a little bit in their presentation. And it's basically two sides of the same coin. One is, you know, <laughs> if you feel comfortable enough to share what you think um, in the AI space, you think maybe we've been hyping too much? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, if you think it, it can be the, the previous um, uh, speakers too, like anybody who wants to talk about this, like what's been hyped too much in the AI space versus what we've been neglecting in the, from the virology space. Does that make sense? Um, I would love to hear from whoever wants to comment on that. I think that's a very open question, open-ended question. So um, while people ponder that, maybe I will suggest that we go to Jens's question and then... Uh, yeah, so two, two comments to go back to a previous discussion. So the, the one thing that um, I just made a comment internally here, but I will just repeat it. I am much more worried and or interested um, in making things less than, than more. So um, you can equally create something very insidious if you decrease transmission or if you decrease virulence. So if you take Ebola virus, for instance, if you uh, manage to increase the transmission, but you decrease the virulence, um, you could have insidious transmission chains. And so we, are, we are very rarely talk about these kind of things. We always talk about make something worse somehow, and that is always upping the ante somehow rather than going down. And the second thing is, um, I agree that um, in, in a laboratory, we can probably select for all different kinds of things where we have six different traits in a particular way. But the question is not whether we can do that. The question is when you release this or when it is transmitting, how to keep these traits. And I think they will lose these traits immediately. So um, I haven't seen any, I mean, luckily, thank God, um, no strategies actually on how to couple particular traits to other traits so that they will have to stick. Um, and I think that's, I don't know whether AI could be used to this and hopefully not, um, 
but I'm I'm not worried about the the laboratory variant that uh, is very promising and then escapes. Yeah, that's a really key point. I mean, any patching experiment you do in an animal in the laboratory, it's basically how you're going to make a vaccine. Um, you know, so you to to really do this in a terrible way, you'd have to intentionally transmit it between people, which is the only way to do it, I think. Just clarification. I, we've talked about this within the committee, which is that we're we're we've been tasked with not just investigating uh, human transmissibility, but but uh, infectious disease across all possible animals and plants as well. So please keep that in mind. And species jumps, Patrick, and then Mike. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to go back to something that um, uh, Pardis brought up earlier with regards to, um, you know, some of the applications, you know, here specifically, um, you know, with AAV, given the kind of uh, enormous therapeutic potential for figuring out how to alter tropism of AAV viruses and, you know, uh, detarget the liver, target specific tissues like um, muscle for muscular dystrophy. I think, you know, from the perspective of the, the virologist, um, if we were to say, for example, solve organ specific targeting for AAV, would that have implications in your understanding of other viruses or is that going to be very kind of AAV specific? So I'm not the virologist in the group, but I have somebody who thinks about this a lot. I mean, ultimately, um, you know, from what like Yen said as well, this idea of, look, what we're unleashing is that they're getting to this point is that we have the combination of genetic engineering and AI, right? There's making just so much possible and and we have a lot of bad actors out there. I mean, just a lot of bad actors. Um, and we don't, you know, I actually had somebody reaching, reaching out to me, a student who um, saw that I was gonna be presenting here and was like, hey, I want you to know this. Like, this is all these investigations I'm doing and how easy it is to make, you know, H5N1 more transmissible and to do all sorts of things. He's like, I'm testing all this stuff. I don't talk about it. I don't want anyone to... No, I'm exactly doing it, but I, it's just I'm 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 using it partly to like understand pathogenesis, but also to know about what the risks are. Um, and so we have this like weird situation where nobody really wants to talk about. I, I think this is where you talk about where you say polarizing conversations are so problematic because I'm mean, the number of people that told me don't ever talk about the monkeypox example. I'm like that was 20 years ago. Like, like you don't think that they know about that now? You don't. You know, Russia has smallpox. You don't think it's like very easy for them to hop IL-4 into smallpox, um, or, or to put it in a monkeypox, which we know is already doing a really good job of transmitting from human to human. Um, and that one, as a, in, in kind of context of Jens's point, is like they were trying to make something very insidious that was going to basically uh, make all of these mice infertile, um, which, you know, we know that that's the premise of, you know, Child of Man and the recent, you know, edition of Handmaid's Tale. Like we know where that goes. It's not good. Um, Ultimately, I think um, all of these pieces, so we coming back to your AAV question, like, yes, um, it's not exactly, it's not exactly applicable. It's not ex an exact switch over, but the fact that we understand that we can train viruses of any kind to infect specific cells and to evade our immune system, you know, all of that is um, uh, interchangeable. Like we, you know, the, basically all viruses have receptors. We can find out what their receptors are. The more and more we gather this data, the more we'll begin to, put all the pieces together. Um, and so we have to understand and appreciate that these kinds of risks can come out of anywhere and the data we're generating across a wide range of fields can all come into play. So it's not about stopping virology and stopping investigations. It's about really, you know, playing offense and defense or what, you know, be, being very proactive. Um, we, ha we can't basically, like in my own lab, we did a journal club on that paper and I had everyone stop and say, what else could you do? What other circuits might you put in? What, you know, how else could you make it worse? Um, and then, you know, for the first part of the, you know, post journal club and then the second part, what might you do to stop it? I think ultimately a real, I mean, the fact that the DOD budget for bioterrorism is like this small um, is, is, is ludicrous uh, because it, this is where the real risk comes from is a, is places like this there should be a major budget where we think about how do we you know stop pathogens in general because in doing that we actually just stop you know a lot of morbidity that would help i mean what we do to just stop any pathogen can stop a biosecurity risk but then we also should be thinking about every which way from sunday 
um, you could create a bioweapon and then create uh, ways of stopping them. Um, so, and and I, I'm amazed by how often people are like, oh, it's just an AV, so it's not pathogenic, so it's fine. It's like, but you're creating a rule book um, and you're you're putting all these pieces together. Uh, someone's going to use it um, and someone's going to you know benefit from it in ways that we don't want to see. Yeah, and if I could follow up on that, first of all, you know, part of that paper that that AAV paper is part of my advanced virology AAV lecture. It's a fantastic paper from a virology standpoint, right? But um, maybe connecting back to also things that Bradley said um, about animal viruses. Wonderful, ex wonderful, uh, uh, very compelling examples of receptor binding switches mediating cross species jumping in um, in canine parvoviruses and uh, feline coronaviruses. Um, so those principles of not only how does a virus switch receptors, but are there constraints on those proteins that make certain viruses more able to do the switching and other viruses less able to do it, are I think the bigger picture issues that these kind of studies can help us inform. We can do the experiments in, in one way, but we can also sort of look at general factors that we could try to uh, apply to various viruses to try to get a larger sense of these themes that might be able to be pulled out from the data set to say, yeah, this one is interesting because it has the potential to switch receptors more. It's more malleable. It's able to raise immu immunity, give those general principles to allow us to focus in on certain viruses to study. Brad, did you want to respond to that specifically or just a general question? Okay. So um, something that Jens just said brought another question to mind. So he talked about, you know, is there some way to couple the two phenotypes, right? So that you force co-evolution of those. And I guess my question is, do we understand enough about epistatic interactions, particularly in, in influenza, Andy, um, to where there's a big enough data set for AI to learn something from that, that, you know, could be useful or terrible? Yeah, I, I, I don't think we do. And I think one of the, I mean, this also gets to Sarah's point about data. I think one of the things that maybe as virologists we need to do is have a little bit more focus on some of the negative data that we have, because we end up focusing a lot on the phenotypes that penetrate, right? And not as much on the phenotypes that don't. And again, a grad student makes their living off of publications that are usually done on positive observations, right? But train for training data sets, this is where all of that positive and negative data, if it's annotated correctly and, and looked at correctly, can really contribute to our overall knowledge of this. There are some wonderful little examples recently coming out about epistasis um, with a number of different viruses. SARS-CoV-2 is one of them as well. I'm not sure we understand. Right now, it's just, I think it is purely phenomenological, right? We see it happen and we say, oh, it must be something about the genetic background uh, that that either helps or or perhaps hurts this particular mutation from, from emerging. But I don't think we have a real good sense of what that could be. I'm going to take a chair's prerogative to just dive a little bit deeper into this data question, if that's okay. Or do you want to go for? Uh, so we have actually been charged with asking the question around specific data sets that may be both benefit. Well, first of all, I should say everything we've been asked to do is both benefit and risk, right? So we're we're not just thinking always about the risk. Um, but in that context, we've been asked specifically about data sets that may be impactful, be they good or bad, impactful. Um, from um, on the sort of AI bio arena. Um, and so one question I have for the virologist is that clearly you are generating and now much more data, particularly, you know, the sort of sequence data that Pardis is working on or deep mutational scanning. Uh, there's, there's a, you know, there's an enormous amount of data that is going to start emerging. And some of that data may be cha linked with epidemiological changes, information on on spread, information on clinical outcome. Is that data something that you think is 
architected well enough, curated well enough to actually, if AI acts, could access all that data, that it could use it to either inform um, uh, more pathogenic strains or to actually inform how do we do better countermeasure development. So what is the implication of the, what I think will be a sort of emergence of large data, sequence data with uh, epi and uh, transmission data together? I actually think like the, the key, maybe an example or a microcosm, but actually that is maybe the most important argument is, um, about the risk benefit in virologies, do we publish full length genomes of really pathogenic viruses, smallpox, Ebola? And we have. And with, I, I think that the risk in th that conversation should really guide what is happens with AI, I think. Um, because if we just wanted to resurrect a dangerous virus, we can do it for wild type virus sequences for human pathogens that already exist. Um, and I think those rule sets should trickle down. Um, and I think that should frame it. I can't answer the the data formatting or architecture question, but I think we should apply the same standard to synthetic biology and publication of full length genomes as to AI tools to modify viruses. Thank you. Anybody else come, want to comment on the data question or the types of data that would emerge that would be good or bad? If not, so uh, it, it, not my area of expertise, but. But we worked on a recent paper that correlated influenza virus genotypes with disease severity across two seasons. And the the my co my collaborators who were doing that analysis were able to do that correlation because they were really focused on data sets from two institutions, Johns Hopkins University and Chang'an Medical Co uh, University in in um, in Taiwan, where we had put in place parallel systems for capturing all the metadata, the clinical data, the demographic data, and integrating it with the sequencing data. So that's what allowed us to look at that. When, when I asked the silly question of, can we do this with another hospital? The question really was, it would take an awful lot of work for us to generate and deal with their data sets in the same way that we collected ours. So I would say that's my third person sort of way of saying that data may be out there, but whether it's accessible and whether it can be integrated across sites and across different platforms and those kind of things, I think is the really big challenge. Thank you. Okay, Brad and then Jens. No, no, no. Okay, Brad. So I get to take your time too. Um, okay, so I want to, push on the AI aspect for a second, because I, from the perspective of those that are, some of you are AI users, some of you are contributors to AI, some of you are AI critics. I think the question is, um, what do you, well, the question is, what, what do you see AI being used for in a manner that's like capable of creating it, it do, do you view it in your line of work as assisting in creating something new or do you view it as something that is just speeding up the process of general scientific investigation and advancement I, I'm, I'm getting a little confused around where everybody sees it and is using it i see ai as something that we can't take advantage of yet especially the latest greatest baddiest ai is being applied to biology without a foundation but i am a fan of computer science generating algorithms and applied mathematicians bringing those sorts of advances because they've always worked for us when we have the right foundation to use them so that's my criticism where i see it right now is it's helped us in the past we've made big leaps just remember when sequence comparison was a massive problem and the mathematicians and computer scientists came in to help us with smith waterman and made blast that we're grateful for that, but they haven't helped us foundationally to be able to take advantage of their algorithms lately. Does that make sense? So I don't see AI helping actual biologists advance biology problems. And I keep hearing the virologists say, we don't really need it to be nasty. And I would say that right now, all we really utilize it is for very discrete 
we use the alpha fold sort of questions, right? Looking at interfaces of proteins, looking at very specific questions between known known entities and trying to get more detail on it, which I would imagine is a very rudimentary right use of AI right now. But that's where we're stand in my laboratory for that. Clarify, is that is that something that you could have done without AI or is it something that you are doing at a faster rate because of AI? I'm just trying to understand the implications of the AI. Yeah, I think it's faster. I think there are more, the more um, um, options are being shown, more, more, more simulations are being shown, more, uh, more potential pathways are being shown with the AI than we could just staring at an interface and seeing how things could work. So, but again, I think this is rudimentary, generating right? More hypotheses, but that right. doesn't translate it, to actually acting on them. Yeah. From my perspective, I think others might might differ, right? Do you think that also is true for countermeasure development? Though? I mean, do you think we are actually going to be faster with our next vaccine antibody antiviral mm -hmm. than now that we have AI biodesign looking at the upside rather than the downside? Why would it be different from either direction? So why would why would it be different from either direction if your hypothesis is to do ill or your hypothesis is to do good, but the tools just aren't there to instantiate it? Why would it be different? Well, I think I don't necessarily agree with your hypothesis, but um, but I think AI biodesign tools are very powerful, and actually I think their foundational basis is strong so i don't want to get into it right and is yeah that... my position is that genetic engineering is overhyped like we're not doing it well or properly that that's been oversold so yeah so we disagree on that yeah and um i'll maybe i'll just chime in because my, my group is working on um developing better uh you know, it is one of the pieces that we work on is developing better um ai models for um, genomic sequencing data and i'll say that the field is advancing uh pretty well um you know work that's been done on like on state spaces, like um, state spaces, sequence to sequence, the S4 model or um, the hyena model um, at a Chris Ray's group is, are really exciting. Um, and I think that they are, I, I think, you know, the basically like all things you go for the low hanging fruit. And there was a lot of interest in using um, AI, AI models in chemistry. And there was a lot of, like you said, high quality data um, gathered that made people focus there. But I do think that, um, you know, uh, there is going to be a lot of papers that are coming out. We're, we're rushing to kind of get our work out because I think the field's moving that quickly. Um, it's going to, you know, basically before we know it, it's all, we're going to, it's all going to catch up. Um, and, and, and uh, not just the data, but also the, the AI models that are going to be really designed to think about genomic sequencing data um, and all of the very specifics of it. It's a it's a focus. And like I said, if you look at what Chris Ray's group is doing um, and their um, Together AI, it's it's really powerful stuff. Um, and I would say, you know, it is true that data in infectious diseases is, is terrible. My, my group published a paper a few years ago using information theory, um, a, a method we called MINE. And, you know, a powerful method we published in science and, um, uh, we're really excited about it. We originally designed it to help us deal with infectious disease issues, um, basically to, to be able to detect any pattern in, in a large data set, uh, basically re uh, relationships between ver two variables. And we started off by using uh, infectious disease data um, and then data from the WHO. And um, it was kind of garbage. There was lots of missing data. There was lots of noise in it. And in the end, our most powerful examples that we used in the paper was from like finance and, and baseball where the data is perfect and you know, really well curated. Um, and it sort of tells us where uh, our priorities are as a society, um, where we know every single hit, uh, but we don't really know what's causing people to you know die in large parts of the world. It's, it's nuts. Um, that said, I think there is, and I think in chemistry, a lot of it's generated in the lab. And so that it's like, um, it's a lot easier to generate that high quality data, but we are doing, there is more and more data that's coming out um, that can be generated in a lab to help um, us understand infectious diseases. So I think that I get it, Sarah, and I understand your frustration, but we're you, you'll snap your fingers and, and all of it's going to be there. So we might as well start thinking about what happens when we get there and all this unintended consequences, um, you know, that Andrew's talking about uh, kind of come to, to, to fold. Um, so, yeah, so some thoughts. 
Okay. I don't mean to be obtuse, but I'm still having a very hard time understanding what people are saying when they're talking about AI. I, I really, I really don't mean to be obtuse. I'm just trying to understand, like, are you using it to discover new things? Is the AI helping you do or discover new things, or is it just speeding up the process of scientific investigation? Protein engineering and genetic engineering are two different things, right? So what you're finding is a lot of people who are able to use AI to speed up stuff and discover new things or purport to discover new things, like to propose new hypotheses, are chemists and protein engineers. I'm coming from, I'm a genetic engineer. I've spent my entire career trying to get organisms to make all kinds of things, not just proteins, by genetic engineering and um, genetic so, engineering. Yeah, I don't, I, I, Sarah, I mean, I, the, it's true, but I mean, we, we have another paper that's in press in nature where we were able to use generative AI. Um, we So I can give you an example, but the, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, hang on a second, um, parties. Let, let's yeah, hear sure. that statement and then we can- Oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. My experience with a lot of publications and they don't translate into a lot of impact outside of the publication. So we can say we have a lot of proof of purposes. We have a lot of theory. So in protein engineering, what you're seeing is there's bottleneck when you actually get to the genetic engineering, you can use AI to generate many, many, many designs and it goes fast. It feels fast. It iterates fast. You publish fast. When you get to the actual, okay, now I expressed it. I purified it. I took it into something. All that AI driven stuff is not translating to actual microbiology to virology. It's just not translating there. So that's, I think maybe why you're hearing two different things. You're hearing two or three different skill sets talk about how transformational AI has felt to their piece of the problem or how not helpful AI has felt to their piece of the problem. Does that seem to help? Okay. That's my opinion. Parties, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I like I said, I I think I think like I said, I, I agree with Sarah on some you know pieces, but I would say I just think that that we're on the cusp of it. There's a, multiple papers that were published recently that show that you could you know use generative AI to create tissue specific enhancers. So first model exactly how enhancers are working and how they're entering specific tissues, and then use generative AI to enter those tissues. Um, and in our case, in our paper, we did translate that. We have. Ex Examples where we did it in vivo and mouse and in uh, zebrafish, and we showed that effect takes place. So we're getting there. I think we're we're getting there um, as a field. Um, and in the work that we did using diagnostics, we were able to get down to the mechanism of how the CRISPR-Cas9 binds that allowed us to basically be able to predict these so well. So as we generate more data, and we have to generate that data and in biology, and as we create models that are better designed for genomic data. Uh, we're going to get there. But I, I would imagine in the next year, a lot of the uh, concerns that you have about our ability to do it will be addressed. And the bigger concern is what do we do with all that information we just got? Um, so I just I so dramatically about the rate of data generation and also the data interoperability and architecture to enable this. Like we do, but I mean, that's my work. So I'm excited. Not coming. It's not yeah, coming yeah. in the next five years. It's not coming. I don't see it on the pipe for the next 10 years. I just see no functional movement on it, despite us saying we're going to do it for 15 years. Okay, yeah. I'm going to pause that conversation because I think it's good conversations always should need to continue and it's always good to have different opinions, but I'm not sure we're going to come to consensus on that. Um, in that last minute we have in this session, I just want to return, sorry, Lizzie, I'm just going to return to Heidi's question, if I can close this on that, from the panel. Are there any um, specific areas you feel have been hyped or or under rep, under appreciated for the pur purposes of virology and pathogens? I would say, you know, our example, we're we're not generating new models, but we're heavy users. Um, it it has been an incredibly useful tool that I would say has been like the advent of PCR or advent of CRISPR, where things that used to take us nine months, we can now do in one month. Um, I would say that we have not found a use for that it's making something possible that was previously impossible, but enables us to tackle more projects, test new hypotheses, um, and, and also enter new fields. I mean, the LLMs have been really nice. If I, I have a crazy question that used to take me hours and hours to get up to speed, I can get up to speed much faster. So it's, it's an amplifier for us, but it has not been... I would say we haven't used it to answer a question that with brute force, we couldn't have answered in a much longer period of time previously. 
but it, it may get there. So I'm a little skeptic that it will do that, although I'm optimistic it will. But right now, it's it's been a big multiplier on on, on a daily basis. Okay. Any other comments on that? Yeah, I think um, I think predicting disease severity, uh, particularly in settings like emergency rooms, is someplace that we're seeing some tremendous project progress going forward when you can provide a little bit of viral genomics along with a lot of the metadata that's out there as well too. So I think those are kind of approaches that I think might be uh, just also on the cusp of making a, a really important impact in terms of our ability to deal with uh, disease severity and infectious diseases. Okay. Gigi, do you want to ask your question quickly and a quick answer? You've got a minute or two. So my question was about the original 2001 um, mousepox paper and how uh, at that time the, the, that work came out and then like pretty soon after a lab that was also in that same institution wrote a paper that basically said that that work could have been predicted. And then another paper came out also saying that, you know, that it wouldn't have had the, the effect on humans. And I think it's amazing that 20 something years later, we still have this function problem. And I was wondering what you would like to see to address some of this, you know, some of these functional problems that are really important problems to have, what you would like to see the U.S. government, for example, do, or what kind of information you'd like to see curated to be able to handle these kinds of more policy relevant questions. Um, well, firstly, I think you know more about the papers than I do, and it's nice actually to have someone uh, know about them well, because I'm always surprised. Um, that few people do. I don't know necessarily about the details of the follow-up papers that you're describing, but I mean, it's true that it wouldn't work on, that specific thing wouldn't work on humans, but a monkeypox or smallpox version would. Um, and fundamentally, I think that what you would want to do is, um, again, I, I basically, even the, even the kind of simple exercise we did in our lab, which is just go through and be like, what other genes? So the way that interleukin-4 works, right, is it signals for you to go chase down a bacterial infection or some other kind of intracellular infection. And yeah, like more broadly thinking about like the future for your work, not not about that specific paper. About the future of, uh, sorry, maybe I misunderstood the question, uh, about, about the future of our work in, in the context like of that. The, the, the data that you'd like to see, the curation you'd like to see, what would help be helpful to have your, to, to reduce barriers to beneficial work that you're, that you would like to do. Um, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and reduce the bottleneck, what would that be? Um, gosh, I, I, um, I mean, I, like an example of a place, you know, we have to get really, really thoughtful about how we share data. Well, one, you know, generally we should share data in a better way, but be more thoughtful about, you know, how we protect against unintended consequences and don't uh, uh, inhibit the work we do. Like, for example, because of the fact that we have some simple ways of saying that we're stopping bioterrorism. One of them is just anybody who has a sequence of a pathogen can't, you know, uh, uh, things get flagged if it, there's an Ebola sequence. And uh, what's kind of crazy is right now you can't get diagnostics in Africa for Ebola because it has the Ebola sequence. And so I think, you know, we have to really put dedicated effort to think about how do we counter true bioterrorism and how we do we protect against it? It's very funny because a lot of the things that we're worried about causing bioterrorism is actually stopping our ability to act. Um, and so I think fundamentally, uh, this we're already over time, but I would say like the this, obviously this conversation needs to continue because um, there's a lot of fired up people here and there's a lot to discuss on how to do this well. Okay, any other questions? If not, I will propose that we call that session complete and thank the panel very much for their um, presentations and being um, open to diving deeply into some complex uh, questions with us. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everybody.